Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Fake It For Real A Friends to Lovers Second Chance Romance Book 3 in the Accidental Love Series By Jessica Fox Narrated by Google Play Auto Narrated Voice. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Blurb I needed a fake wife with no strings attached. But I knocked her up, and now we are having a baby. I was born rich and loved to be a playboy. I had the looks, the body, and soon all of my family's wealth. Everything was going perfect, until my father threw a stipulation into his testament. Fall in love, get married, or I would be out of his will. After weeks of searching, I remembered beautiful Cecile. The only woman to ever reject me. I reached out to her to help me out, and she agreed. Everything was supposed to be fake, until we spent a wild night together. Now I genuinely want her as my wife, but I need to show her that I can commit to her, and that's going to be a problem. Finn Through the haze of a fading hangover, I felt the presence of someone else in my bed. I knew I was in my bed, because the smell of freshly cleaned linens filled my nostrils as I inhaled deeply. It was one of the things I always did upon waking. Smell the sheets and then try to piece together the events of the night, once I had deciphered if I was home or in someone else's bed. Around three nights each week, I would find myself with the same predicament, wondering who slept soundly beside me, and where I had ended up after a night of drinking way too much, losing all my inhibitions. The person beside me stirred, then draped one long arm over my side. I always went to sleep facing away from the person I had gone to bed with. It made slipping off the bed and getting the hell out of a stranger's bedroom much easier. And many times I'd had to do just that. Of course when I woke up in my own home, slipping away was not an option. But I always had my driver waiting for the woman to walk out the front door, so that he could drive her home or to wherever she wanted to go. Moving slowly out from under the slender arm that laid across my side, I got out of bed without making a sound and headed to the bathroom to clean myself up. The mirror was never my friend on mornings like these, so I avoided my reflection at all costs until I had showered, shaved, and done the rest of my business. An hour later, I emerged from the bathroom looking like myself again, ready to face the world and the young lady who was now sitting up in my bed. I looked at her face and could not recall a thing about her, other than fleeting scenes of a night of intimacy that didn't seem that memorable. Morning. Did you sleep well? She ran a hand through her messy dark locks. I think so. I drank a little too much last night. I don't normally do things like this. Do you? All the time. I threw her my signature charming smile to ease my words. So, let me walk you through the process of one night stand etiquette. We wake up. We get dressed. We exchange pleasant goodbyes, and we don't expect a thing from the other party. She looked a little taken aback. Finn, are you sure you want me to just walk away from you after how much we connected last night? Rats she remembers my name, and I've got no clue what hers is. Oh well. That man you met last night is not the real me. That guy only comes out at night and after a few drinks. I'm actually a total bore most of the time. Do yourself a favor, and don't think too hard about what happened. We had a good time, but now it's over and might not ever happen again. Or it might happen again if we end up at the same place and we both want the same thing. But that's highly unlikely, at least in my case it is. Okay then. She pulled the sheet around her and got up, moving about the room, retrieving her clothes that were scattered about, and then going to the bathroom to put them on. I was glad she wasn't the kind to try to argue that what we had was special. Mostly because it never was. Not to me at least. Waiting patiently, as I had nothing else to get to anyway, 
I sat down on the settee at the end of the bed and checked out my cell phone. There were some random pictures of us dancing and laughing, and then there were some more decadent pictures of our night in bed. Damn, did I really let her do that to me? Drinking makes me do things I wouldn't normally do if I were sober. But boredom leads me to the stuff more often than I should. I let alcohol take the lead, following along as an alternate personality comes out in small amounts until it takes me over completely, and then the hedonist in me comes out. I do whatever I want to, so long as it doesn't involve hurting anyone. What had once been a once-a-week habit had turned to something that happened every other night. I had inherited that from my carefree father. I was his only child, and he'd had me late in his life, though early in my mother's life. She'd been his twenty-year-old maid, and he'd been in his sixties when the two spent a few nights doing the horizontal bop, as my father called it. Of course he'd never married my mother. He'd never married anyone. He preferred freedom over all things. He did take care of me and all I needed though. I was the one person in the whole world that he'd made a commitment to, and he had stuck by it for my entire thirty-two years of life. He'd sent me to college at UCLA, where I got a bachelor's degree in art history. I hadn't cared what I went to school for since I would never have to work. Richard, that's what I called my father, as he didn't like to be labeled in any way, not even in a fatherly way, had chosen my major. He said it would make me more interesting if I knew about art and the history of it all. I supposed he was right. I was popular at his friends' parties because they all had expensive art that they knew next to nothing about, and I could tell them all about their outrageous purchases. People with more money than they could ever spend tend to spend money on things that they believe will add to their fortunes one day. Art was one of those expenditures that anyone worth their salt as a millionaire or billionaire had plenty of. Looking at the painting I'd scored at the last auction my father and I had attended, I took in the priceless piece of art. Well, there eventually was a price put on it, as the auctioneer enticed bidders to start the action at $70 million. And it kept creeping up several hundred thousand dollars at a time. Two hours later, I told my father that I would love to have that painting for my bedroom. So, he upped the ante by a million dollars, and I went home with an Amadeo Modigliani oil painting that he'd done in 1917 titled New Couché. The title was French and it meant nude reclining, and boy was that broad reclining. A hand landed softly on my shoulder as I admired the work of art that hung on the wall facing my bed. She'd emerged from the bathroom without me detecting her movements, which meant she was accustomed to sneaking around. I didn't like sneaky people at all. Did you paint that, Finn? No. I got up to see her out texting my driver to be at the front entrance, ready to go. It's a rather famous painting done by a rather famous French artist. I won't bore you with the details. Oh? A French artist, huh? Explains the woman's hairy armpits. Gross. I thought the hair under the French woman's arms was on the beautiful side. When a woman felt beautiful all on her own, not having to shave every speck of hair from her body, I appreciated that. Not that I'd met any woman who was like the one in the painting. I had the idea those sorts of women no longer existed in today's world, at least not in the world I inhabited. Not interested in getting into the history of the painting, I asked, Are you hungry? Starving, she gushed as she leaned in and took my arm, wrapping herself around it. Are you taking me to breakfast? No. I'll have my driver take you anywhere you want though. You don't want to come with me. No thanks. As we walked down the stairs, I saw her scanning the entrance. I was totally blasted last night. I had no idea you lived in such an amazing home. She batted her false eyelashes at me. I had no idea you've made so much of yourself, Finn. I didn't, I said. And then I heard my father, as he came into the foyer from his office just off it. I did. He held out his hand to the woman on my arm as we paused in front of him. And this young goddess is. She giggled. Oh my gosh, aren't you handsome? She held out her hand and my father took it, kissing the top of it like he did with every woman he met. And so formal too. 
My name's Sydney. Sydney Stone. And I am Finn's father, Richard Murphy. It is a pleasure to meet you, Miss Stone. It's a pleasure to meet you too, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy was my father. I am merely Richard. My father was in his 90s, but he acted like he was still a young pup. I found it funny. She's on her way out, I interrupted their little exchange, for my father could make that idiotic shit last a lifetime if I let him. I'm having my driver take her to breakfast. It's past noon Finn, he let me know. So he'll take her to lunch then. I moved toward the door, ready to say goodbye to last night's woman and move on with my life. Thanks for the good time, Sydney. You too, Finn. Should we exchange phone numbers? I shook my head, I wasn't that type of guy. Not on the first date. Not that it was a date at all, but more like a hookup. So not on the first, second or even third hookup. After that, who knows? Not me. I've never had more than three hookups with anyone, ever. So don't be offended by anything I say. I say it to all the girls. Have there been many, she asked with wide eyes. I suppose you could say that. Should I be worried about anything? She ran her hand in a circle over her nether regions. You know what I'm asking, right? I get tested regularly, and am in excellent physical health. So, you have nothing to worry about from me. Good. She breathed a sigh of relief. Well, I guess this is goodbye then. One last kiss. I settled for pecking her cheek, as that's all anyone got from me before we parted ways. Have a great life. You too. She looked around as she stepped out the door. Seems like you've already got a great life though. I know, right? By now. I closed the door before she could say anything else. When I turned to go and see what the chef could stir up for me to eat, I found my father still standing right there. Oh hey. Patting him on the shoulder, I stepped to the side and tried to walk away. Hang on Finn. He reached out, grasping my arm. We need to talk. Come into my office. Richard, I am famished. Can we talk in the kitchen while Egon makes me something to eat? It won't take long for me to say what I need to say. Then you can get on to the kitchen. He led the way to his office, and I followed. Taking the seat on the other side of his desk as Dad took his chair behind it, I asked, What's on your mind, Richard? You are on my mind, Finn. I have been taking stock of my life recently, and have found that I come up short in certain areas. Areas that you have patterned yourself after your patriarch. Not sure what that means. I looked up at the enormous chandelier that hung high above his desk. Do you never worry that one day, this thing will come crashing down while you're sitting here toiling over whatever work it is that you do, and smash you into bits? I have never worried about that. The men who built this home for me were the finest craftsmen in the entire world. I trust their engineering and laborious work. I wouldn't sit under anything this big. Can we hurry this up, please? I had never liked coming into my father's office. Good things rarely came after being summoned into it. Nodding, he said, since you like to follow so closely in my footsteps, I feel it necessary to counsel you on where a life like mine will lead you. It's not the best place to be, Finn. It's lonely. I have never settled down with one woman. And now I am alone in life, and it's not the best feeling. You probably could get yourself some company, if you wanted. I saw no reason for him to be alone. He had stopped socializing when he'd entered his 80s. The man never exactly said how old he was, preferring to refer to his age by the decade, the 80s, the 90s, etc. Carousing around the party scene to find a suitable woman to spend the night with is no longer an option for me, since I grow tired so easily nowadays. And hiring a woman is out of the question. I don't see why you say that. Terry's father hired a live-in mistress. Terry's father is only in his sixties. In other words, son, he is still a fully functioning man, and I am just the opposite of that. An old person's body can't do what a younger person's body can do. They make pills for that, I recommended. If you're too embarrassed to buy some, I'll get them for you. 
That is not what I am looking for in my life anymore. And one day, you will find yourself feeling the same way that I have for years now. Richard. I could not believe what my father was saying. Might I remind you of the cardinal rule you told me about after I hit pubert? I know what I said but I was wrong. Yes, intimacy is a natural part of life, and no one should be ashamed of expressing the pleasure of it. Especially when that pleasure is found without needing a commitment. That said, there is only a certain window of time for which that is true. If you live life the way I told you was best, then all you have to look forward to are years of being alone. It's not the best. It's the worst way ever to live. I happen to love my life. I loved mine. Up until my body said, no more. Now it would be nice to have a companion to hold hands with. Someone to wake up to each morning instead of an empty pillow. Someone to just talk to and grow old with. So, young women are out for you? I asked. Is that what you're saying? Because we can make a visit to the old folks' home and find you an old woman who would probably love to get to come live here with you and do all that stuff you said you want now. I don't want some old woman who I don't even know. You just aren't understanding me at all, Finn. It's time to find a good woman and settle down with her so that you two can begin living your lives together instead of alone. That way, when the years have aged you both, you will have a bond that can't be broken. Sounds painful. I'd rather not. It's not as if a leopard can change his spots. Cecile Sitting on top of a picnic table, I watched as my class of third graders played with each other during recess. My phone made a soft ding, so I pulled it out from the pocket of my skirt to see who had texted me. Mary, another third grade teacher at the school I worked for, sat next to me. Someone interesting texting you, Cecile? Well, I thought he was interesting but from this text I'm not thinking that way anymore. I rolled my eyes but psyched myself up to tell her everything. So, the backstory on Pete is that he and I were set up by a mutual friend who thought we'd have a lot in common since I'm a school teacher and he's a college professor. We went out to dinner last Friday night. He took me home and asked if he could come inside. When I declined, he nodded and said he understood. He didn't call the next day, and I didn't call him either. I've heard nothing from him the entire week, but now that it's Friday again, he texts. What does the text say? she asked as she leaned over to see it. Oh, I see. A booty call, basically. How'd you like to forego the dating shit and get right to the good stuff? She read off my screen before scoffing. And I suppose that's the address to where he lives? Did that man really write that he hopes you'll show up, wearing something sensual for him? Another man who's after only one thing. I didn't bother to reply to the nasty text. Are there no gentlemen in Los Angeles anymore? You know, I'm not sure if there are any left anywhere. Everyone wants to just play the field and avoid commitment like the plague. The longest I've dated a man in the last few years is 10 dates before he just stopped calling. I eventually saw him out with someone else. The last guy that I first dated wanted to spend more time in bed than he did actually talking to me. He would take me out to eat, and then ask if I wanted to watch a movie at his place. We'd go back to his, and then he wasted no time getting to the making out, followed by carrying me to his bedroom. It sounds romantic, Mary said with a gleam in her eyes. I've never been carried to bed by anyone. As romantic as it sounds, there was no romance there at all, and he most definitely did not want anything long term. The last time I saw him, was when I took a toothbrush and left it in his bathroom so that I would be able to give my teeth a good scrubbing before leaving his apartment the next morning. You left something of yours behind, she asked with wide eyes. Wow. That was a big risk if you didn't talk to him about it before. I found that out the hard way. He changed his number and moved away only a couple of days after I left him the next morning. That's a rookie mistake, Cecile. We had gone out each Saturday night for six months. I thought that was more than long enough for me to be able to leave behind a toothbrush. Guess I was wrong. You were probably his Saturday night girl, 
and he had others for the other nights, she said knowingly. That's how my brother works. He takes Sundays off for family. Other than that, he's got a different girl for each night of the week, and so far none of them have found out about what he's doing. I hadn't even thought of that. Maybe I want an old-school kind of man, the kind that the good Lord no longer makes. Maybe I should start looking for an older man. She snarled her lip. I'm not into old men. I'm not attracted to any. But if I could get to know one, I might like the way he treated me, then the attraction would surely come. I don't know. Maybe I should just wait for guys around my age to grow up a bit. I've just hit my 30-year mark. Surely, men in their 30s start to grow up and look for something that will last. My brother is 36. Well that doesn't bode well for me then, does it? I couldn't deal with the dating scene in Los Angeles any longer. All I know is that I am out of it all. No more games. No more one-night stands. I'm out. No more dating for me. Not for at least a year. Shock filled her face. A year. An entire year. No intimacy for a year. None. I knew I had to stop trying to find the right man when he just didn't exist yet. I can't take another man wanting only one thing from me. At this stage of my life, I need more than intimacy from a partner. I would settle for just a satisfying time. I have a hard time finding even that. That's probably because you have no real connection with the men. Real feelings have to bring on better connections, and better connections have to mean better intimacy, right? It just has to work that way. And I am ready and willing to wait for that to happen for me. So, no more dating until I actually know the man first. And of course, I have to like him. I've been going out with just about anyone, so long as someone thinks I'll hit it off with the guy. So far I've gone along. But not anymore. You sound like you really mean that, Cecile. I do mean it. I'm so tired of all the fake stuff. I mean? I really was done. A year. At least one year. No men. But what if Mr. Wright comes along, and you ignore him because of your little hiatus from men? She had a point. I won't ignore all men. If someone catches my attention, then I will see where that goes. But he's going to have to do a lot of talking, some mental connecting, way before we connect our bodies. But I seriously doubt that will happen just at the moment I've finally sworn off men. She patted my hand, looking concerned. I'm just afraid that a year without a man, a year without being with a man, will change you. I can't imagine that it will affect me that much. I mean being with a stranger or a man who wants nothing from you isn't any good anyway, at least not for me. And you just prove that for yourself with what you said. We deserve more, and we deserve better. I'm tired of acting as if all I want is intimacy as well. It's not true. I want so much more than that. Like a hand to hold as we grow old? She asked with a nod. I do want that. I want someone who will hold my hand when I have our babies. I want someone who will bring me chicken noodle soup when I have a cold. I want someone who will be happy just sitting with me on our worn-out sofa, watching television while we eat takeout food. Yes. Now you see what I'm getting at. I want to be happy with someone for many reasons, not just one. Intimacy is good and all, but it's not everything. We need more than that. We need someone who we can share everything with. And someone who wants to share everything with us. Mary nodded in agreement. You know, I dated this one guy for a few weeks and he refused to tell me what his middle name was. When I finally got him to tell me why he wouldn't, you'll never believe his reason. What could knowing his middle name possibly do for you, Mary? Well, he thought that if I knew his entire name, then I could sign his name to anything I wanted and ruin him financially. The real kicker was that this guy had nothing. He drove his mother's car. He lived at his uncle's house, and he worked the night shift at Panjo Pizzeria. We have certainly found us some real winners, haven't we, Mary? I had stories like hers, too. When I was in my early twenties, there was this guy that I first went out with one time. 
he refused to let me see where he lived. And he said that it was because he didn't want me to try to stay with him. He'd had that happen to him too many times, he said. Apparently, women would come and not want to leave. Or so he said. I thought he was crazy. He sounds crazy. I stopped seeing him after he told me that. And then I got really curious and did something so unlike anything I'd ever done before. What did you do? She asked curiously, a bubble of excited laughter about to escape. I stalked him one night. I put my palm on my face, shaking my head as I laughed. I borrowed a friend's car and followed this guy home. And what I found made me sick. What was it? When he pulled into the drive of a nice suburban home, three kids ran out to greet him. They hugged him and said how much they'd missed him while he was away at work. And then a woman came out with open arms and kissed him on the cheek. Mary's jaw dropped. He was married with children? I nodded. I had never quite gotten over that one. Not just married with children, but happily married with children who adored him. And he'd looked as if he adored them all too. It made me sick. How could he be out on the dating scene when he had this wonderful family waiting for him at home? It made no sense. And what was worse, he'd lied about having to be away for the entire week. He'd worked right here in Los Angeles, with his home less than 30 minutes away. I know because I followed him home from there. What a jerk, Mary said as she snarled her lip. Did you get out of the car and tell the poor woman what he was doing? No. I couldn't have ever done that. She looked so happy. And there were the children to consider as well. Whatever he was doing, that was on him. I was sure that one day, his wife would figure him out. Do you think that she ever did find out about his secret life? I have no idea. My ideal about love were a bit battered and bruised when I drove away that night. Everyone I tried dating after that guy had their own things too. One after another, bad guy after bad guy. You know what, she asked. It sounds like you're attracted to bad boys. I'm not, I said quickly. Well, it sounds like it. Maybe you just like that weird charisma bad boys all seem to have. Or the devilishly good looks that seem to guy with that kind of man. Angels and demons have been known to attract. The demon loves to pretend that he's good for her. But then he thinks he's good for everyone. And breaking an angel doesn't bother a demon one bit. Most times, they actually blame the angel for falling for a man like him in the first place. Ain't that the truth? I asked as I laughed. I am a sucker for attractive guys. Aren't we all? I'm going to have to stop going after the looks that turn me on and start looking deeper than that. Maybe talking to men who are a bit more average in the looks department is the first step I should take in finding a good man. If all you've been seeing are attractive bad boys, that could be your problem. She smiled. I know that's mine. I love those dang rebels. But then I hate them when I get replaced by another girl whose heart they'll surely break as well. You know, the thing is that every single time, I fall for the looks and charm. Well, that's most likely not going to happen if we keep looking at guys like that. I had this friend when I was in college at UCLA. He was the most notorious bad boy on campus. The first time I saw him, he was hitting on this girl, and she was all infatuated with his looks and charm. The next day, I saw him using the same lines and tactics on another girl. And the day after that, it happened again. So when our eyes finally did meet, I just shook my head at him and walked on by without saying a word. We ended up being good friends, with absolutely no benefits. I guess that seeing him in action made my alarm bells go off and stopped me from falling for his lines and charm the way the others had. She nodded her head. You knew better already. I nodded back. Exactly. I knew better than to set my sights on Finn Murphy. I wonder how he's doing nowadays. Finn It had been a year since I'd seen my friend Cohen Nash. I'd met him on a trip to Austin, Texas, and he was the owner of a resort back in the Lone Star State. I stayed at Whispers Resort and Spa, 
any time I was in the state's capital. The nightlife was off the hook in that town. Cohen had been on his way out for a night on the town at the same time as me, and he'd offered to show me around. I'd found my equal in that man. Born to party, we both loved every element of the fast-paced club scene. Austin's famous 6th Street proved to be party central, and we'd gladly partaken. My friend had made some drastic changes in the year that had followed my visit though. He'd found out that he had a secret daughter, and he'd ended up marrying her mother. If anyone would have asked me if that man could ever settle down with one woman, I would have said hell no. Apparently, I just didn't know Cohen well enough to make that assumption though. But I wasn't going to stop being his friend, just because he'd gone and put himself in the ranks of the unhappily married. I saw him sitting at the bar we'd agreed to meet at, a smile on his face. He got up as I approached, holding out his arms. Finn, my party partner. So good to see you. Sharing a bro hug, I patted him on the back. Good to see you too, party partner. You don't look nearly as bad as I thought a married man would look. And one with a child too. I thought you would have dark circles underneath your eyes, and wrinkles running across your forehead, from all the aggravation you must be suffering from. I'm sure it will all catch up to you soon. Your confidence in me is a bit underwhelming, Finn. He sat back down at the bar, and I took the seat next to him. Barkeep, can you bring one of what I'm having to my dear friend here? I watched the bartender nod, and then I looked at the drink that sat on the bar in front of Cohen. And what are we having this evening, Cohen? He ran his hand down the tall glass, which was rimmed with red salt. This is a Michelada with Corona beer and top shelf tequila. Pretty much anything with liquor got my heart pumping. Sounds good. So, how have you been? I know you're expecting me to say that being married is really hard, and that it's not my cup of tea at all. But let me tell you, man, it's honestly fantastic. Stop playing with me. I took a drink of what the bartender placed in front of me. Tasty. Thank you. I slid a hundred dollar bill across the bar to him. Keep us happy tonight and there's more where that came from. Will do, Captain. Gotta tip the bartender right off the bat before the place gets busy, or we'll be waiting forever later on. I hated to wait for more drinks and Cohen used to hate it as well. Yeah, I'm not going to go on a bender tonight, Finn. I've got an early morning meeting with a real estate guy. I was sent out here by my brothers to scout a location for a new resort we're thinking of building here in Los Angeles. Disappointment stabbed me a bit as my old drinking and carousing buddy seemed to be long gone. Oh, I see. I took another drink. Well, I am going to get shit-faced and find someone pretty to take home with me tonight. Sure you won't join me? Your wife isn't around to get mad at you for grabbing a piece of tail from a random stranger. And you know that I won't tell on you, Cohen. With a sigh he said, You know, I just don't want anyone other than Ember. Don't ask me to explain the sudden change because I'll never find the right words. Something just clicked in me when I saw her again. And once that clicked, there was absolutely no going back. She and Maddie are my world. They always will be. Sounds like a small world full of boredom. I took another drink. He laughed good-naturedly. It is anything but boring, Finn. I promise you that each day is full of new experiences that make me feel happier than I ever knew I could be. I'm going to call crap on that too, Cohen. Don't think I don't remember the smiles we had on our faces the whole time we partied up and down 6th Street. Laughing again, he nodded in agreement. And those were fun times. But they were shallow, empty, compared to the happiness that comes from having a wife to wake up to each and every morning and fall asleep with each night. Yeah, but married people have much less intimacy than single people. I knew that I was right about that. Intimacy was my main hobby, and I wasn't about to cut back on it for some silly marriage with anyone. And waking up to the same face each morning seems dull to me. You only feel that way because you haven't the right woman. When you feel whatever it is that clicks inside your heart and soul, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Cohen had known the woman for years, before he eventually married her. If this something clicks when you meet the woman meant for you, 
Then why didn't that happen when you first met the woman who became your wife? Excellent question. He nodded his head, as if he'd spent a lot of time thinking about that exact question. Apparently, he had. The timing has to be right too. I'd liked Ember back then, but my prior relationship with her older sister had Ember keeping me at arm's length. So our relationship couldn't work back then. Even when we ran into each other again, she was dead set against us picking up where we'd left off. But she eventually had no choice but to start listening to her heart. Thank the good Lord above for that. I didn't grow up in a home with a married couple, so I have no idea how that sort of thing even works. There weren't any kids running around our home. I wouldn't even know what to say to a child, much less know how to deal with one. You grew up very different from how I did. Maybe your parents instilled a yearning in you to be the family man you came to be. Mine did not. You said that your mother got married. She did. I never lived with them though. I lived with my father and on occasion, my mother came to see me there. Priscilla Juarez is my mother in the sense that she gave birth to me, but that was about all she has ever done for me. My father hired nannies to take care of me until I no longer needed one. And then there were maids, butlers, cooks, and other staff to do everything else that needed to be done. All I had to do was find some way to entertain myself. Raising my glass, I took another drink. My second favorite hobby, drinking. The life of a man born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I can see how your views on life have been skewed by that. But you should give yourself the opportunity to find out what other things life can give you. I rolled my eyes. It sounds as if you've been speaking with my father. What's he said to you? He picked out some peanuts from the small bowl the bartender slid our way. The other day, I was walking out the nice young woman who'd so generously spent the night with me. Once she'd left, he accosted me. He pulled me into his office and began telling me things he'd never uttered a word of before. Things like how I should find a nice girl who I could settle down with. I grimaced at the thought. He said that he's now a lonely man, but that could have been prevented if he'd married someone he could have grown old with. Yeah. He nodded. Having someone to grow old with is great. You can feel secure and happy that you'll have an old, wrinkled hand holding yours when the golden years come knocking at your door. I want nothing to do with old, wrinkled hands. The thought nearly turned my stomach. When yours is wrinkled, you won't want to hold a hand with the smooth, elastic skin of a young woman. It would only make your wrinkled skin look much worse in contrast. That is so far in the future that it's not even a thought in my mind yet. You know, there's no one better to listen to than your very own father, Finn. You're just like him, and he would never steer you wrong. He only wants what's best for you. If he says he's lonely, you can take that to the bank. If he warns you that you'll end up a sad, lonely old man like he is, then you can count on him to be right about that. Listen to him. I honestly think he's fine. He's in his 90s and only recently began talking this way to me. He's been alone for over a decade, but only now does he think of some old woman who would have been nice to have around for the lamest of reasons. Handholding. Sharing some past full of boring days and even more boring nights. That was not going to be a thing I would ever want. Well maybe you're right Finn. Who knows. You might well drink yourself into an early grave and never have to grow old at all. Laughing. I picked up my drink and gulped down more of the alcohol. Ah. What a way to go. Well, I'm not going to try to convince you that married life is much better than single life. I know that I wouldn't have believed it either before meeting Ember again. An idea occurred to me. You know, anyone I've ever known who partied hard while single always says that marriage is so much better. But I think you guys just all want company in the hell that you've put yourselves in. You know, bring your old friends down to your level. That way, you have someone to pretend to be having fun with when you have family barbecues and meet at the local zoo to watch the kids run amok while your spouses chatter away about what they'll be bringing to the next potluck dinner you all have. You've just described last weekend. He laughed again. It's not as bad as you're making it sound. 
there's a lot of camaraderie in being friends with other married couples. You know, they get the struggles you're going through because they've been there. But they also get why you stay in the marriage and try to move past the struggles. Please explain to me why you would want to overcome a struggle, only to find more of them in your future. I could not understand that concept at all. Life is full of struggles, Finn. I scoffed playfully. Mine isn't. I can't recall a single struggle I have ever had to endure. Mind you, I went to prestigious schools and found academia a walk in the park. I witnessed others struggling and wondered why they would want to continue on with any subject if they couldn't master with ease. Most people have to get through school and earn a diploma at the end if they want to get a job. So they must endure the struggles or end up homeless and penniless. Most people would rather not live that way. And you can thank your father's excellent genetics for your gift of learning. Not everyone is as blessed as you, Finn. I had never seen it from that perspective. I suppose I have been given more than most. He chuckled. Much more than most. Not that it's a bad thing. But not doing more with your life is just a waste. Partying and sleeping around have their time in some people's lives. But then that phase morphs into another, and then more and more after that. That's how you grow and become a well-rounded person with lots of experiences and knowledge about life in general that you can pass on to the younger generations who come after you. I'm not worried about the younger generations who come after me. You should think about what your father said. He has you to leave his fortune to. But who will you have if you never open your eyes to find someone to spend your life with? I had never thought about that. Perhaps I'll leave my fortune to someone who has nothing. That would be a nice thing to do. And what about your father's name, your name? Don't you want to keep your DNA going for as many generations as possible? I shrugged. I highly doubt any dead person cares if they leave their DNA behind. I know that I don't care, even a little, if I leave behind offspring just so they can make more offspring, and their offspring will have more of the same. I see no reason that I should suffer the role of husband and parent, just so that my father can leave a legacy. What about you, Finn? Don't you want to leave a legacy behind that people will remember you for? No. I drank the last sip from my glass, then waved at the bartender. I'll take a scotch neat please. Going for the hard stuff, Cohen asked with a knowing grin. Why not? What is life if not to be lived in the fast lane, my friend? I sipped the scotch that was handed to me, scanning the place for my next nightly conquest, when a familiar face caught my eye. Is that Cecile Walsh I see coming through the door? Cecile. Hi. I'm here to pick up a takeout order for Cecile Welsh, I told the hostess who met me at the door. Let me check if it's ready yet. She tapped on a tablet then shook her head. Not yet. If you would like to have a seat at the bar, and maybe get yourself a drink while you wait, I'll bring it to you as soon as it's ready. Great thanks. I turned and scanned the bar for a free seat when familiar green eyes caught mine. Would you look at that? I was just wondering about him. Finn Murphy waved at me, and I waved back then headed his way. He got up and came to meet me halfway, hugging me tightly. It's been ages, Cecile. You look great. You do too, Finn. Come sit with us. My friend from Austin is here. I'd love to introduce you to. He took my hand, pulling me along with him. Cohen, this is a friend of mine from my college days. Cecile Walsh meet Cohen Nash. Shaking his hand, I smiled. It's a pleasure to meet you, Cohen. Finn moved over one seat to let me sit between them. Please have a seat, Cecile. Let's catch up. Did you become the school teacher you set out to be? I did. I teach a class of 23rd graders. I always knew you'd do it. He smiled. Do you like working with children? Finn asked. I adore kids. So yeah, I love working with children. And what are you doing with that art history degree you earned? With a shrug he said, not much. Mostly letting my father's friends know when they've been ripped off. 
So you must have gotten into something else then. No, I never got into anything else. Oh, I said, a bit taken aback. Well, what do you do with your time? I knew he came from money, but I'd had no idea that he didn't need to work. Whatever I want to do with it. He turned to look at the bartender who'd come over to us. Bring her a Tom Collins, please. You remembered my drink. I smiled, thinking that was something. Of course, I remembered. We went out for drinks every Friday night, and then you would insist that we bowl a few frames. And after bowling, you would ditch the rest of us and go clubbing, I added. Me and Toby Smith were the only ones up for partying back in those days. I couldn't believe I made so many friends at college who were actually there to learn and had no desire to burn up their precious brain cells. That's probably because of your standing as a genius, Finn. Just like time and money, you have an abundance of brain cells that you seem to think you'll never run out of. But I wouldn't be so quick to come to that conclusion if I were you. He looked around me at his friend. Seems like she thinks along the same lines as you, Cohen. His eyes came back to mine. He just recently said that I might die young thanks to the amount of alcohol I consume. I just pulled the glass up to my lips and nearly spilled it as a short burst of laughter flew out of my mouth. Oh my. I looked at Cohen. Did you really say that? Nodding, he said, I'm a rather blunt person at times. We were talking about growing old and how our mutual friend here is against it. I simply stated that drinking too much could leave him in an early grave and that he wouldn't have to worry about getting old. A world without the notorious Finn Murphy. I asked, shaking my head. What a drab world that would be. Smiling at Finn, I went on, maybe slow down a bit so that we can keep you around longer. Slow down? He laughed. It's not in my blood to slow down. That's not what your father said, Cohen added. I looked at Finn with a raised eyebrow. He rolled his eyes and grinned at me, making my stomach flutter. Nothing had ever happened between us, but I was a human woman after all. My father seems to think that one day I'll be lonely like he is now. But I don't mind being alone. Finn took a drink from the short glass he never let leave his hand. Cohen snorted, then said, Um, making sure there's pretty much always someone in your bed to keep you company is the opposite of not minding being alone, buddy. Raising my brows, I had to ask, are you still playing as hard as you did back in college? Why would I be playing any less than that? I don't know. It's just that most people slow down once they hit 30. Not you though, huh? Not me. I don't see the need to slow down. Hum, interesting. I couldn't help but think of how different our lives must be. Just recently, I made the decision to stop dating for at least a year. I watched as both men dropped their jaws. It's not that bad, guys. Cohen was first to speak. What happened? Some guy really screw you over or something? More than one man has screwed me over through the years. But quite honestly, the only guys I ever meet are just playing games with women. None of them have been even the slightest bit interested in making something that will last. Finn raised his glass. To men like me, forever shall we reign free. Yeah, I said, looking at Cohen, see what I mean? I do. He laughed, though he shook his head at our friend. Finn, can't you see that this playboy mentality is wearing thin on women these days? Maybe it is time to put down some roots and stop clipping the flowers from their stems. Finn stared at his friend. What does that even mean, Cohen? You know, you're just taking what you consider is the best part of a woman like flowers that wither and die when they're pulled off the stem. Just like your relationships have done. Cohen, I don't call them relationships. I call them hookups. He took another drink, then put the empty glass on the bar, where the bartender quickly refilled it. Hookups are not meant to last. And roots need dirt to grow in, and you know how much I hate dirt. He thinks the same way as every man I've met in L.A., I said then took a drink, wondering if Finn would ever grow up, if any of the men I knew would ever grow up. Peter Pan syndrome is what I'm going to call it. And I'll just have to wait to see if any of them grow up enough to want a real relationship. 
Until then, I'm not dating, not hooking up, not doing anything even semi-romantic with any man. You sound like you really mean that, Finn said. But you have no idea if you can actually hold out that long. Intimacy is a need, not a want. You are wrong about that, my friend, I let him know. It is not necessary for a person to have intimacy to live, at least not me. I can live very well without it. And I intend to prove that. I think you're going overboard, Cecile. He took another drink. I looked directly at his gorgeous green eyes. I think you are too, Finn. Holding the glass, he asked, are you referring to my drinking? And the women. From the sounds of it, you're indulging too much in both areas. Maybe you should listen to what your father has told you. I remember you telling me that your father was your hero, the one who showed you the way of life and love, or lack thereof. I believe that's how your little rhyme went. It was years ago, so my memory might be a bit rusty. Finn smiled, revealing his pearly white teeth. They were evenly spaced, just as perfect as the rest of him. You remembered. That line was a hard one to forget. Cohen looked back and forth at us. So you two never hooked up. I nearly spit out the drink I barely drank. No. Gosh no. Finn frowned. You don't have to say it like that, Cecile. He looked at Cohen. She caught me making my moves on a few girls before I took notice of her. So she knew what I was up to and wasn't into being another notch on my well-notched bedpost. I never blamed her for being smart about the type of man I was. Anyway, she made a much better friend than a one-night stand. I laughed. Our friendship was the envy of many young women in those days. While I got to spend time with Finn and really got to know him, the girls he played around with didn't get any part of him. Well, they got at least one part of me all right, Finn joked before cocking his head to one side. I never knew you felt that way about our friendship. Shrugging, I said, I guess we just never talked about that. Surely, you knew that most of the girls you spent the night with were jealous of our friendship. I never thought about it that way. I suppose they couldn't understand why I spent time with you, but wouldn't do that with them. He put his glass down on the bar. You and I had fun together. We could laugh. We could talk about anything, too. Once I knew you weren't going to fall for my lines, I could be myself with you. It was nice. Very nice. You know, I'm glad I finally ran into you after all this time, I said, giving him a fond smile. It's good to see old friends. It's good to be reminded of those crazy days. You never got crazy, Cecile, he said with a chuckle. The craziest thing you ever did was accidentally throw the bowling ball the wrong way and hit poor Peter Jenkins right in the sweet spot. My cheeks heated with embarrassment. Gosh, I remember doing that. It was so embarrassing. You bought him a whole pitcher of beer as part of my apology. You owed him more than an I'm sorry, Cecile. Plus, he needed something more than the soda he'd been drinking to numb the pain. Sounds like you two spent a lot of time together back then, Cohen said. Finn reached out brushing my hair back off my face. My little redhead needed some fun in her life, and I was more than happy to be her mentor. Auburn, I told him. My hair is not red, it's auburn. And the fact that we share green eyes, the rarest color in the world, means that we were meant to be friends instead of lovers, I suppose. He teased me with the line I always used whenever he got a little too flirty in the early days of our friendship. You know, I've actually heard that the color gray is the rarest eye color. I placed my glass on the bar as I saw the hostess walking my way with a bag in her hand. And it looks like my food is ready. I need to get going. I've got papers to grade. Deciphering third graders' handwriting can be quite an arduous task. Finn looked past me at the lady bringing my order. Don't go. Stay and have dinner with us. I insist. I can't. But we should exchange numbers. I'd love to get together sometime. Cohen cleared his throat. I thought you weren't going to be doing any dating for a year. I laughed. Finn is not a date. I took the bag from the hostess. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Is there anything else I can get for you? No thank you. I got up and found Finn standing too. His arms wrapped around me instantly, lifting my feet off the floor. Promise me that you'll call. I handed him my phone once he let me out of his arms. I promise. Here, type in your number. Since you're a teacher, I'd better not disturb you during work hours. How late at night can I call? Nothing past nine, I said as I pressed the contact he'd created and heard his cell ring. Nine? That's very early. He swiped the screen then saved my number into his contacts list. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that he'd written Cecile, friend, no calls after nine. You have to write yourself notes? It never hurts. He shoved the phone back into the pocket of his slacks. So weekends. What about after nine on those nights? You know, I don't really like getting calls that late. I'm an early bird. Even on the weekends. He shook his head with an exaggerated frown. Sounds to me that you've forgotten how to have fun. Not to worry. I am free and happy to mentor you in the art of fun once more. And since you won't be dating anyone, that leaves you free to have fun with me. The idea of hanging out with Finn again made me feel warm inside. I left a kiss on his cheek. What do you say to brunch on Sunday? I say that I'll surely be asleep during brunch time. With a smile, I said, tell you what, you let me know when you want to do something. I would hate to interrupt your busy schedule. I can do that. I am terribly busy, you know, he joked. Don't I know it? Turning to Cohen, I extended my hand and he shook it. Lovely to meet you, Cohen. Lovely to meet you too, Cecile. Take care. You too. Turning back to Finn, I ran my hand over his clean-shaven cheek. I look forward to hearing from you, old friend. You won't have to wait long, old friend. He kissed my cheek, and I felt the tingle left behind. There was a connection between us. A real bond of friendship that I was sure would stand the test of time. Finn would never be a lonely old man, as long as I was alive to hang out with him. You should know that your father is wrong about you, Finn. You'll never be a lonely old man like he fears. You have me as a friend, and I would never let you feel that way. His eyes sparkled. You mean that? Of course I mean that. You were always a wonderful friend. Just because you lack the ability to commit to one girlfriend, doesn't make you a bad friend to me. I'll never let you rattle around your mansion alone, feeling sad. You can always come hang out with me, even when we're old. I might have to take you up on that. If I live to a ripe old age like my father has. I'm sure you will. Now, I've really got to get home and start grading papers. Bye boys. I felt his gaze on me as I walked away. When I got to the door, I turned and found Finn still looking at me. With a wave I left him with a smile on his devilishly handsome face. Too bad he's such a bad boy. Finn A set of warm lips upon my cheek pulled me out of the deep slumber I'd fallen into. Candy, I whispered, remembering the girl's name this time. That's my stage name, she giggled. Now that we're in the light of day, would you like to know my real name, Finn? Opening my eyes, I found her sitting up, and her blonde hair pulled into a bun on top of her head. What is your real name? Martha, she said. I was named after my great-grandmother. I see why you decided to go by Candy, rather than Martha. Martha is a terrible name for a dancer. She leaned over, care to spend the day in bed? I don't have to go to work until around 10 tonight. You may find this hard to believe since you're offering me an entire day of intimacy, but I'm going to have to decline your generous offer. I have much to do today, I'm afraid. I literally had nothing to do. But spending the day together would set a precedent that I did not want to set with Candy, or Martha, or whatever her name was. Sorry. You can shower and get dressed, then I'll walk you out to the car that's waiting for you. Your driver will give me a lift home, she asked with a grin. Yes he will. She hopped out of bed. He's cute. I'll hurry. Lying on my back, hands underneath my head, 
I watched her walk away from me, wiggling her butt the whole way. She was obviously eager to see if she could get my driver to give her what she was craving. Women like her made the world an easier place for men like me. They never asked for promises. Mostly because they could make no promises themselves. My mind went back to last week, when I'd run into Cecile Walsh. She'd made me a promise. She was different though. Cecile was real, completely legit, and extremely genuine. If she said that she would never let me become the lonely old man my father thought I would, then I believed her. During the past week, I'd thought a few times about calling her to see how she was doing, but whenever I checked the time, it was always past nine at night. So, I hadn't spoken to her at all. But it was Sunday, and Cecile had said something about brunch. Picking up my cell, I found that the hour for brunching was long gone. Damn, it's nearly three in the afternoon. Swiping the screen, I called Cecile anyway, only to find that it rent a voicemail. I didn't leave a message. With a heavy sigh, I got out of bed, throwing on a robe then padding barefoot out of my bedroom and across the hallway to use another bathroom. My father came out of his bedroom, at the far end of the long hallway. Spotting me, he held up his hand in greeting. Top of the morning to ya, Finn. Haha, I said. I know it's late afternoon. You should ask your lady friend to stay for dinner this evening. The chef is making rack of lamb. I shook my head. I wasn't going to do anything like that. Not this one, Richard. Oh, I see. He looked down, shaking his head slowly. I'll be downstairs. Come and see me in my office once you send the girl on her way. Not again. Richard Murphy was not one to be put off, though. I'll see you in a bit. Good. That plan wasn't good to me at all, though. But I had to at least listen to what he had to say. Even if I didn't take any of it in, I had to listen, at the very least. After using the bathroom, I went back to my room and found Candy dressed. Can you walk me out now? Sure, I said, turning around to show her the way out. The driver is waiting for you in the front. You sure it wouldn't bother you if he and I ended up? I didn't let her finish as I said, not a bit. She giggled as we went down the stairs. You have a lovely home, Finn. Thank you. My father is to thank for all this. Lucky you. Yes, lucky me indeed. I led her to the door and opened it. Well, there you go, Candy. Thanks, Finn. She kissed my cheek. I had fun. Me too. Bye. Bye? She said with a smile on her face as she nearly ran toward the waiting car. A heaviness weighed on me as I closed the door, then turned to go to my father's office once again. Rapping softly on the door, I hoped he had maybe gone to sleep while waiting for me. He often fell asleep when he sat still for more than a few minutes. But I found that I hadn't gotten that lucky as he called out, Come in. Opening the door, I walked in slowly. You said the chef is making rack of lamb? I was starving. Yes he is. And he's training a new chef to replace him. He's retiring in six months. Monty has been with me since you were a baby. I hate to see the man go, but he's getting older. He says he's past his prime, and needs to hand the reins over to the next generation. As long as the new chef can cook, that's all I care about. I took the seat opposite him at his large mahogany desk. You know, Finn, I'm not always going to be here to take care of things. So, you're the one who takes care of things like hiring the staff. I thought someone else handled things like that. There is Joseph, our accountant, who oversees everything that has to do with our finances. Loretta manages the house and works with him on getting our staff paid including setting their wages. But I give the final approval on all new hires. Well, I don't really care who cleans, cooks or takes care of the yard work as long as it's not me. If you sit back and do nothing, you will most certainly get taken advantage of. It's happened to many people when they inherit wealth rather than work for it. They lean too heavily on others to make sure their fortune is kept up. But more often than not, they lose everything because of their own irresponsibility. So, I need to learn what it is that you do, is what you're saying. 
That sounded a lot like work to me. And how are we gonna go about doing that? You will give your weekdays to me, Finn. You will be up and ready to start the day at 8 each morning. And I feel the need to be clear here that that doesn't mean you'll wake up at 8. It means that you'll be dressed and prepared to get to work by that time. That was going to cut into my partying. How about I do that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, instead of all week long? No, he said firmly. I've arranged meetings each day so that you can meet the people who currently work for us. The people I have come to trust. But some of these people plan to retire once I take my last breath. So, it will be up to you to approve the new hires. Why will they retire when you're gone? I didn't understand that at all. They prefer not to work under you. Why not? Because they fear that things will inevitably go wrong and that you will begin blaming others for your shortcomings. They're afraid that you'll fire them and tarnish their stellar reputations. That caught me off guard. Why would I do that? Because when the money starts to dwindle, you'll be terrified of what might happen to you if you run out of it. That will make you reach out to find someone who you can hold accountable. So, you want me to become accountable. Is that it? I didn't like being in charge of things. Can I just find someone who I trust to handle things for me? You know, Finn, I find myself wondering if you ever listen to what I say. I have just explained to you why you should not do that. But you so badly don't want to use your brain for anything that you blatantly ignore what I am saying to you. You aren't without brains. As a matter of fact, you are capable of so much more. Your grades when you were in school were nearly perfect. Academia came easy to me for some reason. But managing business bores me. He leaned his elbows on the desk, steepling his long fingers and resting his chin on them. Do you suppose that being homeless and having no money would be any less boring than learning how to run this place and taking care of the money I have made during my lifetime? I'm only 32, I said in my defense. I was already a millionaire by the time I was your age. Look, I don't know what to tell you. The way I am is mostly due to the way you raised me. Well, I am not done raising you, apparently. I don't want to leave this world until you can be responsible and understand that the way I lived my life, especially as it relates to women, is not the way you should live yours. I have never said this before, but lately I've been thinking that I should have married your mother. At least then you would have been able to see what parents are supposed to do and be like. You would have seen a married couple, and the idea wouldn't seem so foreign to you now. Priscilla is very happily married to Marcos. She married him when I was two, so I've always known him as my stepfather. I saw the marriage they've had. And quite frankly, that relationship never inspired me at all. He pinched the bridge of his nose, and I knew I'd aggravated him. Finn, you must start looking at things from a new perspective. If you keep drinking and carousing with women all the time, just as you always have, then you will never begin to see things differently. So starting tomorrow morning, you will be my shadow, and I will mentor you in the ways of managing a fortune and running a household of this magnitude. I suppose that if I must, then I must. Seemed like weekends would be the only time I would be getting for myself, and that made me unhappy. Do I get holidays off? Huffing, he shook his head. You just don't get it. This isn't some job. This is life. The life you will inherit once I'm gone. It's a busy life with lots to do every day. Holidays included. It sounds hard. I didn't think my father had ever had it hard. He certainly never lived like he'd had a hard life. I think you're expecting too much out of me. You are more than mentally capable of doing what you need to do to take hold of your future. I expect only what I know you are capable of. Of course, you must put down the bottle and get your head where it needs to be. And put the tramps to the side, permanently. I cringed at that. Listen to you, calling the women I spend time with tramps. You have messed around with the same types of women. I think you forget that you already have been my mentor in life, and that I am exactly like you. Well then, you will surely be able to do the things that I've done all my life. 
He looked down, rubbing his temples, frowning. You must listen to me about this, Finn. The women you keep company with will only drag you down. While I could play and work, you seem incapable of doing both. You need a good, steady, stable woman to help you become the man you were born to be. I take the blame for waiting so long before making you responsible for your own life. But I'm doing that now. If I can prove that I can play and work, will you stop bugging me about settling down with some boring woman? Shaking his head, he said with a shaky voice that showed just how tired our conversation had made him, Finn, I don't want you to end up a lonely old man like I've become. I beg of you to listen to me about this. It's of the utmost importance. Please listen to me, Richard. If I can play on the weekends and work during the week with you, if I can learn to manage this home and the money, then can I keep my lifestyle just the way it is? He looked directly into my eyes, ones that matched his. Finn, my son, my only child, I want more than that sort of life for you. I want you to have more than I have. I want you to have it all. The fortune, the fun, but not the same sort of fun that I had and you're having now. I want you to have the fun of being with a person you love and who loves you right back. I haven't found that girl yet. What makes you sure that I ever will? You aren't looking in the right places for a good woman. You won't find the one who will enhance your life at the kind of bars you frequent, or at the strip club. You damn well know that. That's precisely why you seek out company in those sorts of places. You've been looking for women who are eager to do the same sort of self-destructive behavior as you. What's wrong with wanting to spend time with like-minded people? You're better than that. You're smarter than that. It's time to start living up to your full potential. I have no idea how much longer I have on this earth. I feel weaker by the day now. Don't make me do something drastic. Drastic? I asked even though I had a good idea of what he meant by that. I am becoming more and more worried about you. About how your life will go when I'm no longer here to make sure you keep living in the manner that I have kept you in all these years. I've been going over some ideas of how I can make you see what you need to do with your life. Try your best to overcome this behavior with women that will only destroy you. His serious expression actually frightened me. What can he do to me if I don't do what he wants? Cecile Cecile, I sent you a pic of us out at the club last night, one of my neighbors said to me as I floated in the swimming pool. Check your phone for it. I left my phone in my apartments since I knew I was going to be in the water, Charisse. I'll see it later when I go back inside. Drifting in the cool water on my unicorn float, I felt I had accomplished my mission of achieving relaxation with great success. I don't like to have my phone on me while I'm trying to relax. Charisse joined me in the apartment complex's swimming pool. She hopped up on her floating lounge chair, then got comfortable near the spot I floated in. I just wanted you to get a glimpse of what you missed out on last night. There were attractive guys everywhere we looked. It was a stellar night for partying, and you missed the whole thing. I'm taking a year-long break from members of the opposite gender. Going to a nightclub is only asking for trouble. You can still have fun. It was just us girls. I mean sure, we did split up when we found our boyfriends for the night, but you could have come and hung out and had some fun with us until that happened. You can't live like an old maid, Cecile. I can too. I like the time I had by myself. I did some yoga last night, and then read a book on ancient Egypt. Did you know that King Tut might have been killed by a hippopotamus? Peering over her sunglasses at me, she said, Are you kidding me right now? I mean, who in their right mind stays home on a Saturday night to read about what killed King Tut? I'm worried about you. You can give up on men if you want to, but you shouldn't stop socializing with your girlfriends or even some of the guys you call friends, you're not going to stop seeing them, are you? It's just not healthy for anyone to sit in their apartment all day and read about shit that happened a billion years ago. I am a school teacher. I think it's important to know a bit about most things. And I had a nice time last night. 
it was relaxing, entertaining, and mind-improving. If you need a break from life, then I suppose you can take a short one. But try not to make this thing last too long. People who pull away from everyone sometimes end up making that a permanent thing. And you're way too much fun to let that happen to you, Cecile. So what you're saying is that you missed my company last night? I grinned at her. Thank you. That is flattering. And I'm not going to sit home every weekend. To be honest, I was hoping that I would get a phone call this morning to meet someone for brunch. But he never called. I don't know why I felt surprised by that. He did tell me that he probably wouldn't make brunch. But I sort of expected him to call me sometime during the week. He, she asked. Yes. A friend from my college days that I ran into a week ago, Friday to be exact. We used to run with the same group and had a lot of fun together. He called himself my fun mentor. And he really was that. Not that I delved into everything that he thought was fun. But he did manage to get me out of my comfort zone more than anyone else ever has. So he's just a friend and that's all he's ever been to you, she asked. You know, no hanky-panky? None. He's a huge player, and thankfully I spotted him playing different girls before he set his eyes on me. So you were friends with a guy who sleeps with lots of girls? Yes. So when he said he'd like for us to hang out sometime, I sort of thought that he meant sometime soon. But I suppose I read him wrong. I had missed Finn, and hadn't really realized it until I saw him again. Anyway, I had a nice night on my own. And today, I've spent the majority of it floating in this swimming pool. So it's been a good weekend so far. I would have gone to brunch with you, Cecile. Why didn't you ask me to join you? Shaking my head, I said, it's not that I wanted to go to brunch. It was just that I was sort of hoping that Finn would want to spend some time with me, like we used to do in the old days. I guess I was waiting to see if he would call. Sitting around waiting for a phone call is lame. I know that. And I know that I shouldn't even be thinking about him, as much as I have been. But it's just that we had something special that he didn't have with any other woman. And you liked what you two had, the platonic friendship thing. The frown she wore told me she thought I was a huge bore. I did like it. And it wasn't as boring as you might think. I bet. She splashed water at me. So, what did you two do for fun? Lots of things. Bowling was one of them. On campus, we hung out a lot and just enjoyed each other's company. Speculation filled her expression. And this player never hit on you. He tried at first. But I was honest with him about what I had witnessed with my own eyes. He'd said the same lines to at least three other girls. And it worked every time. Not me, though. And what I got from him was even better than anything he could have given me if I'd fallen for his lines, too. So, you didn't find him attractive at all? Oh yeah, I found him attractive. The man oozes Fiscal appeal. And he's as charming a man as I've ever met. He's got it all, great looks, emerald green eyes, dark wavy hair, a fantastic muscular body, and he's rich as sin, too. Her hand flew to remove the sunglasses from her eyes as she stared at me. You mean to tell me that this attractive man is also rich, and you haven't called him up to ask him if he'd like to spend time with you? You think I should call him? I hadn't thought about doing that. I mean, I don't want him to think I'm being pushy about spending time with him. He's got women clambering to have a chunk of his time. And they are all ready and willing to give him all the intimacy he can handle. All I'll give him is witty conversation and maybe share a popcorn while we watch a movie or something. Holy cow, you're lame. I'm not, I said, defending myself. I'm just very tired of the same old thing. Wham bam, thank you, ma'am. No, thank you. I want something with substance. Even though Finn and I never shared anything romantic, our relationship, our friendship, was substantial. At least it was to me. And I'd thought it was the same for him. But now I'm not sure. If he would just call, then I would stop overthinking things where he's concerned. I honestly think that you've got more on your mind than just friendship with this rich hunk. 
Shaking my head, I knew that I still didn't want to be just another notch on Finn's heavily notched bedpost. No. That's not it at all. But I need to stop thinking about him. It's not healthy for me to put so much thought into that man. Or any man, for that matter. I've made a promise to myself to forego romance for a year, and I need to stick by that. No intimacy, for a year? Sounds like a nightmare. She replaced the sunglasses and leaned back to get her hair wet. Anyway, my new roommate Sasha is cooking okrashka. You should come and have some later. And what is okrashka? I wasn't into spicy dishes, and that sounded spicy. Also, what type of food is that? Russian. Sasha's from Moscow. She's here to intern under Wolfgang Puck at Spago. One day she'll be a great chef herself. You should def come by to meet her and get a taste of her food. When I left the apartment, it looked like she was making some sort of soup. There were potatoes boiling and some eggs too. She was cutting up ham and she'd already chopped some fresh veggies. It smelled amazing. And the soup is served cold. It is warm out. Something chilled would be nice. Plus, she might become a famous chef and then I'll kick myself for not meeting her before that. So thank you. I would love to join you girls for dinner this evening. Good. I know you've got to work with a class full of kids tomorrow, but be sure to have some of the strawberry vodka she's made too. It's so yummy. One glass can't hurt, right? I was already looking forward to the meal and meeting this newcomer. Can I bring anything? I don't think so. She's got all the bases covered. Just bring your sweet self and that will be fine. I'm glad you're coming over to do a little socializing. I'm not a shut-in, Charisse. But I have spent this entire weekend alone, so you're right, I do need some socialization. I didn't want to sacrifice my entire social life just because I was trying to protect myself from men who wanted nothing more than intimacy. You're a good friend. I try to be. She kicked some water at me, and I splashed her back. A little girl who we didn't notice swimming in between us shrieked, Hey? You got me wet. Sorry, I said. Charisse looked annoyed. You were already wet, kid. Not my face, the little girl said as she dog paddled in a circle around us. You two need to behave. When did kids start talking like this? Charisse asked me. When I was little, I did not even dare speak to an adult unless they asked me a question. Nowadays these kids act like they're the grown-ups and we're the kids who don't know a thing. The little girl made another round and answered the question that wasn't meant for her. The internet has made us kids much smarter than the adults. Blame technology, not us. Is it against the law to dunk a little kid? Charisse asked me with an evil grin. Probably. I laughed. I deal with these little alphas all week long. I guess that I've learned to accept them as they are. There really is nothing you can do to reel them back in. See she's smart, the little girl said as she jerked her head toward me as she made another lap around us. There's no reeling us back in. Just live with it. We're the smarter generation. Oh my lord, Cherie said with a sigh. I need a drink. Do you need a drink, Cecile? It wouldn't hurt. She jumped off her float making a huge splash as she smirked at the totally drenched kid who stopped swimming and stood on her feet in the shallow pool. Oh my bad. Sorry kid. Hands on her little hips, the girl just shook her head. No manners. None at all. Then she went right back to doggy paddling her way to the other end of the pool. Charisse came back with a couple of small, plastic, disposable globes of red wine. I brought a few of these down. She handed them both to me. Hold mine while I get back on my float. Once she was settled in, she wiggled her fingers at me. Kay, hand mine over. Giving her the wine, I opened mine and took a sip. Wouldn't it be nice to have our own pool? Some complexes have adult-only pools. Too bad we don't make the kind of money it takes to get a cherry apartment in one of those complexes. She took a drink of her wine. Hey, I bet that rich player you were talking about has his own pool. You should totally call him to see if he would want to have a pool party at his place next weekend. 
that wasn't something I wanted to do. Nah. So he doesn't have a pool. Oh, I don't know about that. I just don't want to ask him to have a party. You know a guy who's rich, and you don't want to take advantage of that? No. I don't like to take advantage of people. Well, you took advantage of me having a roommate who's an aspiring chef. I don't see much difference in seeing if this guy would let us have a party at his place. I'm not going to ask him to do anything like that. I'm sure he would say yes, but I just don't want to do that. If I don't want to go to clubs right now, what makes you think that I want to go to a pool party where people will be wearing next to nothing? Oh, I get it now. So this about you and your swearing off men thing. Glad you can understand. And anyway, we haven't seen each other in years. I can't ask him to do anything for me. It wouldn't be right. She's right, the little girl came swimming back to circle us. You can't ask people who you barely know for things. It's impolite. So is listening in on people's private conversations, kid, Cherise quipped. This is a public place, and you two aren't exactly whispering. She paddled off, leaving Cherise with an angry look on her face. You're not a kid person, huh? I asked. I guess not. She took a long drink of the wine. We should get out of this pool and go up to drink some of that strawberry vodka Sasha made. Sounds good to me. I was ready to do anything other than talk about Finn. I've got to put that man out of my mind. Finn. Where am I? The weight of a woman's leg draped over my right thigh told me that I had once again scored. But the smell of lemons on the scratchy sheets told me that I had not made it to my home. Shit. I gotta get out of here. Easing out from under the leg, I sat up on the edge of the bed, finding that it was still dark out. Which was good for me. I used the lack of light to my advantage. This way, if the woman did open her eyes, she might not even see me. Moving about in the room, I looked around the clothes-strewn floor until I found mine. The girl wasn't much of a housekeeper, that much was obvious. The week of me shadowing my father had been unbelievably boring and monotonous. He hadn't allowed me even a sip of liquor. He'd said that it was to keep my mind sharp. And it had worked. I'd gotten the gist of everything and knew I could handle things when he couldn't anymore. But he thought I needed a few more weeks of mentoring, to be absolutely sure. So, I'd spent the entire weekend getting blasted and doing whatever the hell I wanted to do. Which apparently had me going home with some woman who didn't like to clean her house. That assumption was confirmed by the gooey banana I stepped on as I left her room. Pulling my clothes on as I made my way through the tiny apartment and out the front door, I spotted my car and driver in the parking lot and made a beeline for them. Sam dozed behind the steering wheel, bolting upright as I got in the back seat. Oh it's you Finn. Scared me there for a moment. I was resting my eyes. What time is it? I asked as I settled back. Six in the morning. Monday morning. Damn. I would have to work with my father, but I was in no shape to do that. This day is going to suck. I thought about coming to get you around midnight but decided against it, he told me. I'll deal with it. I probably wouldn't have gone with you if you'd done that anyway. I'll hurry. Maybe your father won't be up yet. You can always hope. A half hour later we arrived home and I dashed inside, praying that my father was still in bed. Hurrying up the stairs I heard the slightest creak and looked to one side, finding my father coming out of his bedroom door. Tiptoeing as fast as I could, I tried my best to reach my bedroom before he saw me. I expect you to be at the breakfast table at 8 sharp. No excuses. You knew what you had to do today, but you made the decision to stay out all night. That's on you. We're going to the bank today so that you can meet the president, and we can get your signature on file. That way, you can sign documents and checks as needed. So, I'll need to wear a suit. I asked, knowing what his answer would be. This is a weekday, so what do you think? 
My father wore suits every day of the week. On the weekends, he would wear more casual clothing. But it was suits only during the week. Wear a suit, I muttered before walking into my bedroom. Taking a handful of ibuprofen, I prayed it would take away the headache and help me focus. After a hot shower, I felt a little better, but not by much. Probably because I dreaded the week that lay ahead of me. Taking my seat at the breakfast table at eight on the dot, I found my father wearing a frown. What? I made it on time. I ran my hands over my tie. And I'm dressed appropriately. So why the frown? He took a deep breath then said, You forced my hand is why the frown. And how have I forced your hand? I didn't understand what he was trying to say. I had high hopes that the great week we had would see you continuing to make good decisions throughout the weekend. Instead, you decided to drink and carouse it away. You should have, at the very least, come home before midnight last night so that you would be well rested for today. But you didn't. I'm assuming you woke up in a bed that was not your own. Yeah, I said with a light chuckle. Don't ask me her name because I've got what it was. Funny, he asked. You think what you did is funny, Finn. It's not like you weren't doing the same things up until you turned 80, Richard. I hate to bring this up, but you're being a raging hypocrite right now, a thing you never were before. Well, you can think of me in any way you want. You don't listen to the reasons behind why I am asking you to put a stop to your philandering ways. But you might listen to me now. You see, I asked one of my attorneys to stop by yesterday and he and I added some things to my last will and testament. Things that concern you. Gladys, the kitchen assistant, filled my glass with orange juice. The chef is preparing truffled eggs this morning, and has asked how you would like yours cooked. I've already told him how your father wants his. Tell the chef to make mine just like he's making my father's. I am after all just like him, my terse words had her nodding then leaving the room. No reason to snap at Gladys, Finn. It's not her fault that I've grown tired of waiting for you to come to your senses. I noticed his hand shaking as he lifted his glass of orange juice. My father was most definitely getting older. Lately, it seemed that he was a little worse each day. I loved the man. He'd done the best he could by me. I was the man I was because of him. But it wasn't fair that he expected this leopard to change his spots in a fraction of the time it took him to do it. Look, I know you're worried about me. I know you don't want me to find myself an old man with no one to love me. It's not just that, Finn. It's so much more. This world isn't the same place it was when I was young. I feel that the economy is fragile now. There are so many more unscrupulous individuals out there, seeking to cheat and steal from whomever they can. And the way you've been living makes you an extremely easy target. As you have pointed out, I am not without brains. I hated that he kept thinking I was some stupid drunk who didn't know a thing about the world. I didn't drink a drop all throughout last week. So you know that I am not an alcoholic. I just like to have fun is all. And if the weekends are the only time I have for that, then I can deal with that. Nodding he said, I think you have trouble with drinking too much. Since I also had a problem with that, I'm aware of the fact that we seem to have a certain amount of control over it and haven't ever become addicted. But you have me right now. You have my support. You have me as your safety net. And I am afraid that once I'm no longer here and able to be that for you, then you will spiral out of control on many levels. I'm sure that I will be sad and feel out of it for a while after you pass away. That's normal. You will need someone who you can lean on during that time. I've got my mother Priscilla, who I can lean on if I feel I need that sort of thing. Shaking his head, he warned me, I am giving you a final notice. I don't understand what that means. My stomach nodded, as I didn't like the things my father was saying. I didn't like the tension, I could see radiating through his entire body. I didn't like anything about any of this. You know you stand to inherit everything that I possess. But some stipulations have been added to my will. My skin pebbled as chills ran down my back. What stipulations have you added, Richard? 
I only did this for your sake, son. He rarely called me son. I am your only heir. If I can't meet your stipulations, what will happen then? Who will get everything? He had no one else to whom he could leave his fortune, and all the things he'd accumulated. My Los Angeles estate will go to the Historical Society. The apartment in New York will be given to the city, for diplomats from other countries to stay in while in the city. The condo in Vail, Colorado, will be given to an orphanage there, so that they can rent it out as a vacation rental, and use the money to care for those poor children. My heart had slowed to the pace of a snail's. And the money. He couldn't look me in the eyes as he dropped his head. There are eight charities among whom it will be divided evenly. He pulled his head up, and I saw unshed tears shimmering in his eyes. Don't make me do that, Finn. Gritting my teeth, I asked, will you please tell me what the stipulations are? There are many websites where you can search for someone who is compatible with you, romantically speaking. I suggest you begin checking them out. And I suggest that you stop using the weekends for debauchery. Become respectable. Become the man a good woman would want to be attached to. You haven't answered me, Richard. What are the stipulations? I clenched my jaw so hard, trying not to blow my top that it ached. You have one year to find a suitable woman. A good woman with substance and integrity. Suitable according to who? Me? And what would you have me do with this suitable woman? Ask her to marry you within a year. You can wait right up until the end of the year if you'd like. Just do it before your time runs out. When will my time run out? You have 365 days from today's date. So, I have until August 5th of next year to find this woman who you will have to approve of. I could not believe he was going to make me get married. That's right. He nodded and went on. You will have no more than two years for an engagement period before you must be married. You can certainly get married sooner than that, but no later than two years. What am I to do if I don't find someone? You do have your degree to fall back on, he said. You can make a very decent living with that. But you will need to start trying to find a job now, if you want to go down that route. It can take some time to get a job like that. And then you would need to find a place to live, a car to drive, you know, normal life stuff. So, what you are saying is that if I don't ask someone to marry me, someone that you find suitable before a year is up, then you will throw me out of the house. I won't even get to stay here until you die. That's right. You will take away everything you've ever given me. Is that correct? I see no other way, Finn. Just start looking in the right places for a good woman. I'm sure they really aren't that hard to find. How would you even know? I tried hard not to snarl at him, but it was difficult. You have never found a suitable woman in your entire life. I have found them, Finn. I just didn't want them. Neither do I. But you see, now I know that I should have thought about my future. That is the only reason why I'm doing this. I don't want you to end up like me. So, I am to be punished by having to marry someone that I don't love, just to make you feel better. I'd always known that my father could be a selfish man with a knack for getting exactly what he wanted, but I had no idea that he could go to such great lengths for that to happen. I am holding out hope that you will find love, Finn. You are a loving person, after all. All you need to do is focus all the love that you have in your heart on only one woman. And I am sure she will do the same right back to you. Just because I like to be intimate a lot, does not mean I have a lot of love in my heart. You and I are cut from the same cloth, Finn. You keep forgetting that I know you because you are very much like me. I hadn't realized until recently that I was a very romantic man. I love to wine and dine the ladies, as do you. I love to hear them laugh at the things I said, as do you. I love to watch their faces light up when I made love to them, as I am sure that you do too. Now, Imagine that you get to do all those things and even more with one woman. Love will surely grow between you two if you give it a chance. This is not fair, you know it. My hands fisted under the table. 
You are asking me to stop living the way I've been taught to live. You are only 32. You can still change. But only if you try. If you won't even bother, then you can begin your job search now. That is entirely up to you, Finn. And if you die before the year is up, then what? My attorney will make sure you are living up to the stipulation, and he will deal with things if you don't. Listen to me, son. Leave your old way of life behind and move on to this new and better way. Do it before it's too late. I know it's an enormous change. But I also know that you can do this. You have what it takes to love a woman in a way that not many men could. What the hell am I supposed to do now? So see you. Mom, I'm about to run to the library to see if I can find something to read this weekend. Can I call you later? I stopped at the door, not wanting to be on the phone when I entered the silent space. Sure, honey. I'll be around. Give me a call later. Bye now. With the long call over, I put my cell into the back pocket of my jeans and then went in to see what I could find to entertain myself for the long holiday weekend. Monday was Columbus Day, so we had three days off instead of only two. A long book would be needed, so my search began. As I was not looking for any romance in my life, I went right by that section and headed to the historical fiction section instead. A thick book enticed me, and I pulled it from the shelf. The cover showed a sad-looking woman holding a bouquet of flowers, her head dropped, wearing a simple wedding gown but looking anything but the happy bride she should have been. Intrigued, I read the back cover to find the description was one of woe and despair. The lifetime saga of one woman, back in the 1800s in Ireland, had me wondering what I might find on the many pages inside. Tucking the book under my arm, I went to check it out. Once that was done, I left the library to buy myself some reading snacks for my trip to Old Ireland, where I would lose myself in the pages for three days at least. Next door to the library was a small coffee shop. As I walked past it, I spotted someone walking into it. It was the same person I had hoped to hear from the last couple of months but who had never called. I wasn't going to let the chance go by to see Finn Murphy face to face. He stood in line, looking at the list of drinks and confections written on a blackboard in pink and yellow chalk, as the barista smiled at him, stars dancing in her eyes. Take as long as you need, sir. I'm very patient. Moving up behind Finn, I said, apparently so am I. He turned his head to see who'd made the remark. When he saw me, a smile broke out over his face as his arms spread wide, welcoming me into them. Cecile. Hugging him, I said, you seem happy to see me. I am happy to see you. He kissed my cheek before looking at the girl, who now looked rather crushed that he had found someone else to give his attention to. How about a couple of mocha caramel macchiatos? Sure, she said, then got to work making them. You meeting someone? I asked him. No. You're going to drink two coffees? Shaking my head, I went on, that's an awful lot of caffeine and sugar. One is for you, silly. Taking my hand, he pulled me to sit with him at a tiny table for two as our drinks were prepared. So, why didn't you ever return my call, Cecile? You never called, Finn. I did call you. I remember when I called you. It was around three on a Sunday afternoon in August. If it was a Sunday, then I was most likely at the pool in my apartment complex. I never take my phone with me. You didn't leave a message, though. No, I didn't leave a message. I just hung up once your voicemail took over. If it goes all the way to voicemail, then my phone won't show your call as being missed. That's why you're supposed to leave something on the voicemail. I shook my head at him. Finn, I've been thinking that you just didn't want to hang out with me. Funny, that's what I thought about you, Cecile. The girl brought our drinks to us. That'll be 1480. He handed her his credit card. There you go, honey. Thanks. She slumped away, obviously disappointed that she didn't get to flirt with Finn. The cost was insane. What's in these coffees, Gold? That's a steep price to pay for some water poured over some beans. 
You don't treat yourself to fancy coffee every now and then? he asked as he sipped his. Hot. Don't drink it yet. Ouch. I treat myself to paying rent and having a roof over my head small as it may be. But you're a teacher, he said with curious eyes. Don't you guys make lots of money? I had to laugh. Not at all. But your job is like one of the most important jobs on the planet. I would think that teachers make excellent pay. You would be wrong. I barely make enough to make ends meet. And I have to buy a lot of the things my students use in class too. You'd be surprised at how many people can't afford to send the proper supplies to school. And the donated supplies run out very quickly. No one thinks about donating once the school year begins. So, it falls on us teachers to keep our students set up with everything they need to be able to fulfill their studies. So, any extra money you have goes to them, huh? Pretty much. That is noble of you, Cecile. Most teachers do the same thing for their students. We don't want to see anyone go without. But you go without to give to them, don't you? I do. But that's okay. I'm grown and can understand how things work. The kids can't. I looked him over and suddenly realized he was wearing a suit. You've got a job? Well, sort of. My father has been setting me up to take over. He's in his 90s and certain he's about to expire any day now. I could handle the taking over stuff pretty easily. I mean, I'm not stupid. You certainly are not stupid. I remember that you got excellent grades when we were in college. Yeah. So I got it all down. And I can take care of things now. But he's added something that he not only wants me to do but is demanding that I do, and it's not sitting with me so well. And what would that be? His green eyes seemed to be glued to the table as he nearly whispered, I have to get married sometime in the next three years. And I have to get engaged within the next ten months. And if you don't, then I'll be cut out of his will entirely. Harsh. I didn't think that sounded fair at all. He would really do that to you. I mean, you are his only child, right? I am. So, what would happen to his estate? He'll give everything away to others, which would be a great thing if it didn't mean I'd be penniless and homeless. So, I put on the suit he makes me wear every weekday and learn the things he wants me to learn. Meanwhile, I search for Mrs. Wright. How's the search going? Terrible. I did find this one woman who agreed to marry me if I paid her once I inherited everything. But my father saw right through that sham. How? She was a stripper and couldn't quite hide the fact, telling him that she had a very lucrative career in the dance industry, which she would not give up until we were married. So the woman you marry can't be a stripper? My father demands that I marry a, he moved his fingers into air quotes, good woman with substance and integrity. You don't even like women like that, I said. You know, you told me a lot about your father and how you were just like him. I think he's being very unfair to you, Finn. Me too. But he hasn't changed his mind. I don't think that he ever will. And once he's gone, there won't be a chance in hell that his will can be changed. His attorney will make sure that I do what my father wanted or suffer the consequences. So, there's no way for you to get out of doing this then. I found that sad. There is no possible way for me to get out of it. My entire life has changed too. I have to get up early every morning and work. On the weekends, I have to go do things with people my father thinks will help me in my quest for my future wife. But all I've found so far is that my father's friends are as boring as boring can be. The thought of Finn having to marry someone his father approved of made something inside my heart hurt. Finn, you can't live life that way. It's just not who you are. I mean, given time, you might be able to be happy living life that way. But he can't expect you to change this quickly or because someone else is forcing you to. I know, he agreed as he sat back with a pout on his lips. But I don't know anyone like that who would agree to a fraudulent marriage. Is there a stipulation that says how long you must remain married to be able to keep your inheritance? 
Tapping his chin, he thought about it for a moment before shaking his head. The stipulation only says that I must become engaged within a year's time, with the deadline being August 5th of next year. After that, I have two years to get married. But it says nothing of how long I have to stay married. He smiled. Cecile, you've shown me a loophole. Well, it's something. And something is better than nothing. I sipped the coffee and couldn't believe how tasty it was. Oh my gosh. This is so good. Now you see why I'm willing to pay a small fortune for it. I must admit that I've wondered why people shell out so much for something like this. But now I know. I took another sip, dang. So good. Thanks for buying this for me. I would have never bought it for myself. You are very welcome, Cecile. Leaning his elbows on the table, he put his chin on his hands and gazed at me. I should have called you again instead of thinking you'd ignored my call. I guess I wanted to think that you had better things to do than hang out with me. I loved hanging out together in the old days. If he was going to find a good woman, then hanging out together wasn't going to work out for us. But now that you have this woman to find, you really shouldn't be seen with me. You know, you'll need to look totally available and ready to make a commitment. Nodding he sat back, looking glum. And I had never seen the man look glum before. It made me feel terrible for him, so I reached over to pat him on the shoulder. I'm sure the next three years will fly by. Do you really think that all I need to do is three years of hard time with one woman before I can go back to being me? Well, a year of engagement and then two years to actually get married. An idea hit me. Hang on. What if you didn't wait a whole year to get engaged and even married? What if you got engaged in the near future and married only a couple of months after that? If you're married when he passes away, the divorce could come soon after and then you'll be a free man once again. Do you really think it can work like that? He looked unsure. I'll have to reread my father's stipulations to make sure. Of course the man could live another ten years or more, I said. And that would mean that you would have to stay married until he passes away. Do you honestly think that you can do that? I can honestly say that I have no idea how to live being poor, he said wryly. So what other choice do I have? I laughed at that but knew he was right. You have the arts degree. You could find a pretty good job with that. You know, like something with an art gallery. I could help you look for a job if you want. I can write you a resume too. And just walk away from all the money and everything? Shaking his head he said, I can't do that. Well, what about this idea? You let me help you find a job, but you keep on looking for someone to marry. You really should find something to do with yourself. You look miserable doing whatever it is your father has you doing. Well, it's a complete bore, he said as he threw his hands in the air. I get up, shower, put on a dumb suit and then go down to breakfast at 8 sharp. We eat. Then we go to my father's office, where he makes calls to the same people each day, forcing me to listen in and say things now and then to prove that I'm paying attention. His portfolio manager is first. And then the accountant is next. Then it's time for lunch. We go out and eat with whoever it is he's set up lunch with. So far it's been one old fart after the next. All are equally dull and lifeless. We go back home, and then he looks at the financial section of the newspaper. Never, not even once, do we get on the computer to check this stuff out. It's arcane is what it is. And once he's gone, I will handle that little bit of work within a half hour, and then I'll be able to move on to something worthy of my time. I honestly think you should let me help you find a job, so that you can show him that you're becoming the responsible adult he wants you to be. But I know you're just going to do it your way. And I will help you. If you want. You will? His smile told me he was feeling better about things already, but I knew that I could make him feel much better. You know what, I can do more than just help you get a job. What else can you do for me, Cecile? He asked with a twinkle in his eyes. Wanna marry me, Finn? The smile that took over his entire expression made my heart pound. 
You know what, Cecile? I think that's the best idea I've heard since this whole damn thing began. Oh shit. What did I get myself into? Finn. At UCLA, Richard, I once again reminded my father where I'd met my serious girlfriend, or that's what he thought she was. We ran into each other at a coffee shop last week, and we've been nearly inseparable ever since. You do seem giddy over this one, Finn. He looked up as his nurse ran a rolling thermometer over his forehead. I'm fine. No need for that right now. Can't you see that I'm trying to have a conversation with my son? Sorry, sir. It's just that it's time for me to check your vital signs. You did have that fever last night. It's important to stay on top of this, she argued, then showed him the reading on the thermometer. Your temperature is up by one point. That's nothing, he grumbled. It's something. And left untreated, it can become a real problem, Mr. Murphy. She turned and left the room. It's one lousy degree, my father complained. She's got me taking medication every time I turn around. Perhaps you should hire someone else to see to you, I encouraged him. No, she's the best. I just never liked being told what to do. She does know what's best for me where my health is concerned. I just hate that I have so little control over things now. I used to be in control of every aspect of my life, and now I have none, zero. I thought he needed reminding of something very important. You do have your life though, Richard. Best be thankful of that fact, for now anyway. Nodding, his eyes cut to one side as the nurse walked up to him with a small cup in one hand and a bottle of water in the other. Here you are, Mr. Murphy. After opening his mouth for her, she popped the pill in, and then he took the water from her and swallowed it down. I'm sorry for being a grump, Nurse Peterson. Thank you for the apology, Mr. Murphy. I will leave you two to chat then. Watching her leave us once more, I did notice the care she held for him in her dark eyes. She is a good nurse, I commented. She cares about you. You can see it. She damn well should, he said with a grin. I'm paying her a fortune to take care of me and keep me alive for as long as possible. The longer I live, the more money she'll make. She'd be a fool to do anything but take the best care of me. I had to laugh at him. Well, that's one way to make sure you're taken care of. Now back to this girl you found. Her name is Cecile Walsh, right? I told my father her name at least a hundred times in the last week. You are right. That is her name. I just have to check, he said. I've slept since I last heard you speak her name. It's funny how much happens in my dreams nowadays. It's become hard to separate them from reality. So, when shall I get to meet this young woman? Cecile and I had been discussing when a meeting should occur, and now I had an answer for him. She's coming for dinner on Saturday night. This Saturday? he asked with surprise. Yes, this Saturday. Well, we must make haste, Finn. That's only a few days away. His white brows rose, and he seemed to be fretting about what he needed to do before her arrival, days from now. Have you spoken to the chef about what you want to be served for this special occasion? No. I think she'll be more than happy with whatever he planned. She's not some uppity woman, Richard. She's a down to earth schoolteacher who doesn't have a presumptuous bone in her body. She is special to you, isn't she? He asked with concern. Nodding, I wanted to be sure he knew she was more than that to me. She is the only woman I've ever found special. She's witty. She's charming. And she's unlike anyone I've ever been interested in before. You will adore her. I'm sure of that. What about you? He asked. Do you adore her? Somehow, I had to drum up the appearance of adoration, a thing I'd never actually experienced. Inhaling deeply, I thought the act might make it seem as if I were gushing over her. Adore. I shook my head. It's so much more than that. She's all I think about, I lied. Just listening to her voice gives me comfort, in a way I never knew could happen for a man like me. She's too good for me, that much I know. Now that was the truth. But damn it, I don't care. 
I want her anyway. And as luck would have it, she wants me too. The lines that ran along his forehead tripled as he frowned. Have you and she, you know? No, we have not had you know what, I said as I laughed. She's a very good woman, Richard. I made up. I want to, of course. But she's not into giving in to bad boys like myself. Not until she's sure of my intentions, and I've proven my commitment to her. Commitment, he asked. She's uttered that word to you, Finn. Uttered? I shook my head. She's demanded it. Shrugging, I added, if we are to make something of this connection and mutual affection that we share, she has to see my commitment to her in my eyes, she's told me. She has to be able to feel it in my heart. And she wants to hear it in my words. That's what she needs to believe a man like me could be capable of this magnitude of change. So she's aware of your prowess. Very much. This part was true, so it was much easier to talk about. Back in college she saw me women on campus. When my eyes finally found her and she was in my crosshairs, she laughed at me. She told me she'd seen me in action and would never become just another notch on my bedpost. She's got moxie that one. She does. I couldn't wipe the smile off my face. Not because I was completely duping my elderly father, but because I truly adored the fact that Cecile had never succumbed to my shallow charm. I cannot wait to meet her. But why wait until Saturday? His green eyes brightened. Why not invite her over for dinner tonight? She's a school teacher, remember? She's got loads of papers to grade and other teacher stuff to do on school nights. She's told me not to expect to even get to talk to her after nine on those nights. She needs her sleep so that she can be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for school each morning. She sounds like a hard worker. I suppose she is. I didn't really know a ton about Cecile these days. She and I had spoken once every evening, just to stay in contact so that we both knew that things would indeed be moving forward. But we had a lot of catching up to do. What do you know about her family, Finn? he asked. Walsh is an Irish last name just like Murphy is. Does her family have roots in Ireland as ours does? I had no clue. I'm sure they do. Something like that would send my father over the moon. Two Irish families. He clapped his hands. What a joyous occasion it will be if you two can make this work. You are not easy, Finn. Are you trying to be? I tried to make my eyes look dreamy as I looked up at the ceiling. For her, I would hang the moon, were it a possibility. Which it is not, so there's that. This leopard was still not planning on changing his very attached spots but my father had to believe that I was doing just that. Thankfully Cecile knew and understood the type of man I was and knew I was incapable of that kind of change. Were it not for her empathetic personality, I would still be tormenting myself as I tried in vain to figure out what I could do to stay in my father's good graces and not lose my position as his heir. I envy you Finn, he said with a wavering voice. To be falling in love, it is a thing I have never done. I'm glad you're getting to experience it. I'm sorry it took me threatening you. But I am overjoyed that it is happening for you. Clasping his hands, he settled them on his lap. Is there a chance that I will see a grandchild before I leave this earth? A grandchild? I hadn't thought he would expect that much from me. Really? Oh, I don't want to be too pushy. But of course, I would love to be able to meet at least one of my grandchildren before I pass away. I know it's a lot to ask. Too much. I couldn't ask Cecile to have my baby. I couldn't even ask her to sleep with me. As it was, she was already doing me an enormous favor by marrying me. You must realize that we haven't gotten past the dating stage yet. She's not one to be rushed. Good girls often are not ones to be rushed, he agreed. Hence why I never had one. Then you must understand that seeing a grandchild is highly unlikely. It was an impossibility, but he could never know that. I am always rushing. It's such a bad habit. I doubt I will ever be able to break it. His words had me thinking that I might have found something to use in my case. You are always rushing. Like what you've done with me. 
Maybe you should rethink this whole disinheriting me thing. Narrow eyes found mine and tight lips quivered as his jaw set. I will not change my mind. Do not think that you can make me do it, either. I will see you happily engaged or married before I pass. Or you will see none of what you've become accustomed to. Also, stubbornness is a thing we both harbor. We want things to happen fast for us. And we will stop at nothing to make sure that happens. And you are young enough to curtail that about yourself. I am not, unfortunately. I wish I had the time to change. I really do. Having a familiar hand to hold right now would do me good. I have machines attached to me while I sleep to detect if anything in my body is about to go kaput and send me to my maker. But it would be so much better if a woman lay beside me while I slumbered, trying to wake me if no breath came from my lips. The machines are much more reliable than an old woman who is also sleeping right beside you. My eyes rolled, as I couldn't believe the things he said sometimes. But then I remembered that I was supposed to be falling in love, and changed my tune. But I understand what you're saying. I find myself needing to hear Cecile's voice each night before I can make myself go to sleep. It's the craziest thing. I only knew couples did dumb shit like that because Cecile told me they did. She'd coached me a little on what to say to my father to make him believe I'd found myself a good girl and that I was falling for her. She'd never had a good relationship herself, but she had friends who had them, so she knew what good couples did. The way his eyes sparkled told me I'd struck a nerve within him. How nice that must feel for you, Finn. I cannot even imagine having to hear someone's voice before I could fall asleep. But to have something so simple lull me to sleep would be such a comfort. So you can understand why it would be nicer to have a warm body next to mine to coax me to take my next breath, rather than a machine. I could not understand that at all but nodded anyway. Sure I can. Really Finn, let's try to make Saturday's dinner something special. Let's do that together. Please. His eyes looked almost teary as he seemed to be pleading with me. I'd never seen such an expression on my father's face. If you really want, then sure. I do want to make this special for your girl Finn. We're not men who have done much for women. But it's time we learned how to really please a woman. And not just in the bedroom. Should we ask someone for help? I hadn't a clue how to make a special meal for anyone. That had never been a thing I'd done in my life. Perhaps we should go to the internet for inspiration. While it won't be a romantic meal, as you two will be sharing it with me, we should make something to make her feel at home with us here. A smile lit him up. Oh how nice it would be for her to come and live here with us. A sheepish grin and rosy cheeks had him ducking his head. I mean, come here to live with you. No that's okay. I know you want to witness things. Witness isn't the right word. He thumbed his chin as he pondered. Then his finger shot into the air. Aha. I don't wish to witness anything. I want to see you fall in love is what I want. And I want to see her fall in love with you. Nothing would make me happier than knowing that you have learned how to love and be loved in return. My heart stopped. There was no way I could act as if we were falling in love right in front of his eyes. I didn't know how to, for one thing. And I was certain that Cecile didn't know how to either. Neither of us had ever experienced love or being loved in a romantic sense. So how could we pull that off when neither one of us really knew how something like that worked? This farce will never work. Cecile the full-length mirror in my bedroom became my focal point as I changed clothes at least 20 times while Finn sat in the living room waiting on me. Honestly Cecile, you can wear anything. We're just having burgers and fries. Burgers with foie gras in them. That sounded super fancy to me. And palm frites. Whatever those were. I've got to wear something appropriate for this fancy dinner you and your father slaved over for me. You think we made it? Laughter accompanied his words. Pulling the t-shirt back off, I tossed it on my bed. You said that you two made it. I meant that we came up with the menu. 
Neither my father nor I can cook. We've never had to. I heard him get up, and his footsteps echoing in my nearly empty living room. Do you have anything good to drink in your fridge? Not really. Grabbing a green dress off the hanger, I pulled it over my head then ran my hands along the length of it down to my knees while looking myself over in the mirror. This one will work. The color brought out my eyes and contrasted with my auburn hair, which I'd spent an hour curling. I'm almost ready, Finn. What the hell is fruit juice cocktail, and why is it in such a huge jug? What kind of liquor is in it? he asked. The only semi expensive jewelry I possessed, my grandmother's tiny diamond stud earrings, gave a hint of sophistication to my outfit. I slipped on some tan wedges I'd bought the summer before, and then walked out to Finn. There's no liquor in that. I don't have any in the house. And you shouldn't drink either. You know how you get. How do I get? he asked as he put the jug back in the fridge. You look great by the way. I hate the shoes but everything else is awesome. Looking at my shoes, I thought he was right about them. Give me a minute to change them. No. He came to me and grabbed my hand, pulling me with him toward the door. They're okay. Not nearly as gorgeous as the rest of you, but okay. So you think I look gorgeous? Heat filled my cheeks with the compliment. You always look gorgeous. I wouldn't have agreed to marry you if you weren't a complete knockout. Laughing, I allowed him to take me to the car that waited for us outside my apartment. I didn't realize that you had that many proposals to choose from, Finn. Glad I made the cut. You know what I mean. He waved the driver off as he tried to come and open the door for us. I got it, Sam. Just drive us home, please. Sure thing, Finn. The driver got back into the car as we climbed into the back seat. I got in first, then Finn slid in next to me. With a wink he asked, should we make out a bit to get in the mood to pretend we're on the verge of an engagement? My fist rose between us. If you'd like a black eye, then go for it. No making out, he asked with a sigh. It's like a marriage already, isn't it? Making out would mess up my makeup and hair. I worked for hours on both of those things. And it would wrinkle my dress, too. We can't have that. Plus, there's the fact that you're a huge womanizer, and I'm not about to. He smiled as he finished my sentence, be another notch on my bedpost. Yes, I am aware of that fact. It's for the best that we never share a kiss anyway. Why is that? I asked, purely out of curiosity. Because you would fall madly in love with me, and that would be it. Laughing, he took my hand in his, running his fingertips across the back of it. Is this how couples in love hold hands or is it some other way? A much more boring way? Looking into his eyes, I knew he was joking. I'm sure it's much more boring. But we're not going to be some boring couple. Finn Murphy would never stoop to that level, I teased. You are right about that, Cecile. Letting my hand go, he looked out of the window. He wants a grandchild now. My heart stopped. He wants what? I had not signed up for motherhood. Laughter erupted from him. You should see your eyes right now, Cecile. They are monstrously huge. Jerk, I said as I punched him in the arm. Ouch. He covered the spot where I'd hit. What a wallop you pack, honey. Or do you prefer sweetie? I don't know what to call you. I guess we should have some terms of endearment for each other. I put my mind to it. Guys have usually called me baby. I call most girls baby. Shaking my head, I didn't want him calling me what he called all his randoms. That won't work then. You have to call me something that makes me stand out from the pack. Something unique just for me. He looked me over and then stroked some hair away from my face as his eyes glistened. You know, you've always been the elusive girl I'd wanted but knew I could never have. And eventually, that led to us having a friendship. I've never had a female friend. Would you be opposed to me calling you a Nam Kara? Would you be opposed to telling me what that means? It's Irish Gaelic and the words mean soul friend. 
They were more specifically used for people who were teachers, like yourself, or companions, or even spiritual guides. Cupping my chin in the palm of his hand, he looked deep into my eyes and said, You are my Anamkara. So if I say, Can you hand me that Anamkara, how will you respond? You went pretty deep there, Finn. You'll have to give me a minute to come up with something equally deep. I took to my phone to look for something good on the internet, but didn't find anything that sounded anywhere nearly as pretty. You know, you've got a knack for artistry, Finn. Thank you. Coming up empty, aren't you? He watched as I looked up Irish terms of endearment. You don't have to use a foreign word if you would rather use something else. What am I to you, Cecile? Staring at him blankly, I wasn't sure what he was to me. Well, you are my friend, first and foremost. When you first laid eyes on me, what did you think or feel for me? My body heated. I had been extremely attracted to him at first sight. But only when I first laid eyes on him. Before I caught him handing some girl his best lines. After that, I quickly thought him to be a wolf and nothing more than that. But later, I found him to be charming and a good friend. It's complicated, Finn. You're not hard on the eyes and never have been. So you liked my body is what you're saying, he said with a sly grin. I wasn't going to admit that. Quickly though, you showed yourself to be what you really are. A wolf. Cringing a little, he looked somewhat hurt. Not a very endearing term, I might say. No it's not, I agreed. But then I found you to be charming. Perking up, he said, calling me Prince Charming doesn't sound bad. No, I don't see you as Prince Charming in any way. His chipper smile faded quickly, and that's when the right term hit me. You know what? Every time I saw you, I'd always smile without even meaning to. You are my smile, Finn. I tapped the words into the online translator, and the Irish version came up. I showed it to him. Mogare, my smile. I like it. His hand moved over my shoulder, pushing my hair back as he draped his arm around me. Would you hand me that, Anamkara? I would love to, Mogare. Leaning my head on his shoulder, I sighed. Is it wrong to lead your father into thinking something that's not true, and never will be? Is it right for him to expect me to make a complete change in such a little time, he asked. I honestly didn't think it was. No. Then I have to do whatever I must. Thank you for making this easier than it could be with anyone else. You are very welcome. And I don't care what you say. I will reward you for what you are doing for me. His arm tightened around me. Anyway, the fiancé of a man of my stature can't be seen driving an old car. So I'll get you a new one very soon. Really Finn, don't do that. I honestly want nothing from you. I'm doing this because you are my dear friend, and for no other reason. How are you so good, Cecile? he asked as he leaned in to nuzzle my neck. Gently but firmly, I pushed his face away from my neck. His warm breath washing over my flesh made things happen inside my lower regions that shouldn't have been occurring. How are you so bad, Finn? A little nuzzling is out, too. His deep sigh told me that he felt a bit out of his depth. It's been some time since I've felt lips upon mine. And it will be a good bit longer. My advice is to get used to it. I have. Moving around to sit sideways on the seat, he pulled me to do the same. Facing each other now, he took my hands in his. My father will surely wonder why we aren't affectionate with one another. And I will be sure to let him know why that is, Finn. No worries. I am a good woman and good women don't show displays of affection, neither in public nor in front of other people. We do our naughty stuff behind closed doors. So you do naughty stuff, he asked. Everyone does naughty stuff, Finn. Even a prude like me. But this is only pretend, and we have to remember that. To make this come off as real to your father, we can let him catch us in some nearly kissing acts or something like that. But never anything real. Got it? I'm afraid that I very much got it, Cecile. Messing around is out. Yes. Just like it has always been. There was no way I would let my helping him screw up our friendship, 
or make me forget what I knew about the man. He had always been a womanizer, and always would be. Finn was the only man I knew who could actually break my heart if I gave it to him. He was as careless with the female heart as any man I had ever known. That would never change. I wasn't playing this role with him to gain anything. I was doing this because I knew that I was capable of acting with him, while not actually letting him get to my heart. That might not be true of another woman. It wouldn't be hard for them to eventually fall for his charm, good looks, money, and the physical prowess he seemed incapable of reeling in. The car came to a stop in front of a mansion, the likes of which I had never seen before. We're home, Anam Kara. And what a home it is, Mogare. I'll get lost if left alone. I took his hand. Don't let me go, Finn. Never. He pulled me with him out of the car, and then up the stairs to the double doors, doors made of the heaviest wood I'd ever seen. Here we go. Taking a deep breath, I squared my shoulders and walked side by side with Finn as we stepped into a glamorous scene worthy of any Hollywood movie. Oh my gosh. The ceiling went so far up it stunned me. You must be Cecile, I heard a shaky male voice say from my right. Turning my head, I found an elderly man sitting in a wheelchair with a nurse standing behind him. Immediately, I felt compassion for the man and let go of Finn's hand to go to him. And you must be Finn's father, Richard. I took his hands which were the slightest bit warm. Thank you for raising such a unique man. He's always been a joy to me. I was thankful when we ran into each other last week and reconnected. Finn moved in close behind me but didn't touch me. Isn't she something? His father's eyes glistened and danced as he looked into my eyes. Yes, she certainly is something. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Cecile Walsh. Won't you come and join us for dinner? I would love to. My body felt a large jolt as Finn ran his hand around my waist. We'll be right behind you, Richard. He leaned in to whisper, he's enamored by you already, Anam Kara. I ran my hand over his cheek, whispering back, I can see where your charm and charisma come from, Mogare. Don't go falling in love with my father now, he teased quietly. Spoil sport, I teased back. You're not going to let me have any fun. I can see that now. Only with me. He pulled me close to his side. And how much fun we'll have too. Finn was so full of personality and passion that it had always been hard to look past that facade of fun and flagrancy to see the real man who lingered beyond it. But I could when I tried very hard. Finn was lonely deep down. He sought brief moments of companionship from whatever female caught his eye when he was out on the prowl. Long term wasn't something he'd ever even wanted. He found himself growing tired of the same old thing much more easily than most. But that was just who Finn was. There was no reason to dislike or hate him for being himself. I could accept Finn for the man he was. The playful man who loved having fun. I hoped he would remember that and not lean too heavily on the physical things we could do. After dinner, maybe we can play chess. The way his eyes lit up told me I'd stumbled upon something good. I would actually love that. It's been ages since I've played. And you were always a very challenging opponent. Plus it will keep us on opposite sides of the table, which is exactly where I need to be right now, out of his reach. Finn. Cecile looked at the burger that sat on the plate in front of her. This is a very large burger. She ran one fingertip along the edge of the plate. Even the dinner plates look expensive. They're Versace, I told her. And they are expensive. Picking up the burger, I squished it down to a size that would fit into my mouth. Do this, Cecile. Her small hands made the large burger appear even bigger than it actually was. Like this? She asked as she squeezed as hard as she could, bringing it down to an edible size. Just like that. I took a bite to show her that it was possible to get all that to fit into her mouth. She took a bite too, and then closed her eyes while she chewed. Swallowing the food, she asked, what is on this thing? I'm sure I've never tasted any burger like this before. 
and there are some textures I've never felt before either. Something even popped in my mouth, and there was a brief fishy taste. My father chuckled. In the center of the Wagyu beef patty, there's foie gras, which is made from goose liver. It's topped with lobster and caviar, hence the pop and fishy taste, and even truffles. A barbecue sauce made with kopi luwak is spread on the brioche buns. Kopi luwak is coffee. She took another small bite then nodded. Yes, I can taste the coffee now that you've pointed it out. This is the most complex burger, or food for that matter, that I've ever eaten. She put the burger down and picked up a fry as she looked at me. You said the side was something called palm frite. But these look like normal french fries to me. Take a bite, I urged her. Taking her hand, I moved it to dunk the fry into the sauce in the silver bowl next to her plate. You've got to try them with this dipping sauce. My father added, it's the same barbecue sauce that's in the burger. She did as I'd urged and nodded as she ate the dipped fry. Yummy. They don't taste like regular french fries. No wonder they're called something so fancy instead. As with any burger and fry meal, Finn and I picked out a beer to go along with it, my father said. Konokuro isn't just any old beer either. Coffee beans are used during the processing. It won't taste like any beer you've ever had either, Cecile. I can promise you that. My father and I watched Cecile as she picked up the glass. She sniffed it and wrinkled her nose. I've never smelled alcohol and coffee at the same time. It's odd. Pursing her red lips, she took a small sip, then put the glass down, picked up the water glass and took a long drink. An acquired taste, I do believe, but not completely horrible. It will grow on you, I said. You'll see. I'm sure it will. She took another bite of the burger. This is growing on me already. Cecile may not have ever had any of the finer things in life, but she took to them like a duck takes to water. I'm glad you're embracing my lifestyle, Anam Kara. I'm glad you invited me over for dinner, Moguer. What an unexpected trip you two have taken me on. I turned my gaze to my father and saw his eyes shimmering as he whispered, soul friend and my smile how sweet. I knew the cute terms would hit him right in the heart. We didn't want to use the same old terms of endearment other people use. So we came up with our own. She told me that I am her smile because I bring one to her face every time she sees me. I knew I was laying it on thick, but my dad didn't seem to care and she's the only woman I've ever been friends with, so I think of her as a soul friend. Like someone I've been friends with forever, like in past lives or something like that. The connection you two share is undeniable, he said as he gazed at Cecile. I am so happy that you two ran into each other again, after years of being apart. It's funny how life can throw two people back together at just the right moment in time. Cecile looked at me then took my hand, running her thumb over the back of it. It is funny how life can do that. I was in the library next door to the coffee shop you decided to visit at the same time. Meeting again after all this time is odd, don't you think, Finn? I moved my hand to cover hers then pulled it to my lips, leaving a soft kiss on top of it. Odd? No. Not odd at all. We were meant to be in the same place at the same time. That's what I believe. You are such a romantic, Moguer. She pulled her hand from mine then brushed it over her lips. Until we can share an actual kiss, this must do. My father looked at me with wide eyes then asked, And how are you doing with no kissing, Finn? I thought I would be dying inside without her lips on mine. But surprisingly, I am swimming in a lake of anticipation. I watched Cecile's already rosy cheeks go red as she ducked her head, trying to hide her arousal from me. She knew I wanted her. And I knew she wanted me too. But she was not going to give in to what either of us desired. I couldn't blame her. She distrusted me and my intentions. I thought Cecile was the most self-disciplined person I had ever known. The respect I had for her was unwavering. I was lucky to have her friendship and knew that without a doubt in my mind. I must say, Cecile, that you bring out the best in my son. I've never seen him this way. And I am loving what I'm seeing now. My father drew the glass of beer to his lips and took a drink. 
I hadn't seen him so relaxed and happy in years. The whole scene that lay before me had me doing something spontaneous. I think Cecile is the one, Richard. Jerking her head to stare at me with wide eyes, I could see I'd surprise Cecile. Finn, it's only been a week. My father quickly interjected, Cecile, please don't let Finn's hastiness to declare his feelings frighten you. He is his father's son, after all. We both have problems taking things slowly. But one thing we are not is liars. If he says that you are the one, then you can take him at his word. My heart slammed inside my chest at what he'd said. But I am lying to you right now. Cocking her head as she looked into my eyes, she asked, Is that so, Finn? Nodding slowly, I whispered, It is so, Cecile. It has only been a week, but I know that you are the only woman meant for me. I can see myself spending the rest of my life with you, and only you. Be careful, Finn, my father urged, don't rush her. Cecile squared her shoulders. Not to worry, Richard. I would never allow him to rush me into anything that I didn't want. My father looked back and forth at us then said, I am not well, Cecile. My one wish is to see my son happy and settle down with the right woman before I leave this world behind. I don't mean to rush you either, but time is limited. For me, it is, anyway. Am I understanding you both? She asked with wide eyes. Is a marriage being considered here? Slowly I nodded, and from the corner of my eye I saw my father nodding too. Cecile sighed heavily. I am not one to rush into anything. But I am glad you both are being honest with me. Honesty makes everything better. I should also admit that I find you both adorable and inexplicably charming. So I don't want either of you to worry. I understand the hastiness of the current situation. My father's smile was the brightest I had ever seen on him. Good. I'm glad to know that you are a compassionate and understanding young woman. I do try to be those things, Richard. She took my hand and moved our clasped hands under the table as she went on. As a person who can understand most people, I must ask you, Richard, why you think your son is capable of becoming a one-woman man. Now, I clearly understood why she'd taken my hand. She wanted to try and comfort me, as she asked my father things that I did not want to hear. Richard looked at the ceiling for a few moments before looking at her and answering, My son and I are very much alike. I too was just like him, thinking that the life I led, one of womanizing and philandering, was the best life for any man. But as I grew older, I began to realize that it was nothing but a lie. I didn't want to get hurt. That was the real reason why I never kept company with any woman who had the slightest chance of taking hold of my heart. You surrounded yourself with women who couldn't hold your attention on purpose, Cecile stated. Just as Finn has. Yes, my father agreed. There were women, good women, who came into my life only for me to quickly show them my shallow ways, turning their attraction to me into disgust. I would tell myself that I did that for their own good. I was never going to settle down with anyone, I told myself. But that wasn't the truth. I did that for my own good. So I would never have to feel the pain of rejection. So I would never feel the pain of being let down. So I would never suffer the pain of losing someone I loved. So I never fell in love with anyone. He looked at me. Well, except my son. I fell in love with him at first sight. And this is why I feel it is so important that he find love before I leave this world. I love him with my entire heart, since it has never belonged to anyone but Finn. I would do anything for him." Cecile looked at me with tears in her green eyes. And what about your heart, Finn? Does he hold your heart the way you hold his? I had no idea what to say. I had never thought much about that. I do love my father, I came up with. And when he is no longer here, I will miss him very much. But you do understand that your life will go on even once he's no longer here, right? She asked. I do. She looked at my father. Saving one's heart just so it never has to feel pain is not only a mistake, it's not even a possibility. We all have pain that we must suffer, but we all live through it. Even though at times it might feel like the pain might kill us, 
we eventually heal and keep on living, moving forward. The way we were meant to. I had to wonder where this information that she spouted had come from, since she'd never been in love. But I wasn't going to point that out, in front of my father. I was getting the impression that she was trying to get him to understand, that expecting me to change my core personality was insane. My father asked, Have you ever been in love, Cecile? I have not, she said, then looked at me. But I'm not afraid of love. She was lying and I knew that. Neither am I. Not anymore. Not since you came back into my life. Our eyes were glued to one another's as we exchanged our lies. Then the sound of my father clapping had us both looking at him. I was sure he'd found out that we were only acting and was applauding the scene we'd just performed. My heart is soaring right now. I am so happy for you both. Neither of you has ever found love until now. You two will go on this amazing journey for the first time together. It's so beautiful. Taking her by the chin, I moved her face away from my father and back to me. Are you ready to go on this journey with me, Anam Kara? Her lower lip quivered as her eyes turned from bright to gloss covered, and then one tear slipped down her red cheek. Only then did I feel the fear that moved through her like a raging river. And that made my heart ache for her. It's all just an act, after all. I must admit that the idea of falling in love and spending our lives together is rather intense. She ran both hands over my cheeks as her lips curved into a smile. But you are my smile, Finn. I think I can push away any fear I have about the future and accept that my heart won't belong only to me any longer. Not to worry, you'll own my heart too. If we can stop being afraid of pain. If we can stop hiding from the inevitable. Can we do that? I honestly don't know, she said, then looked at my father. I'm not the type of person who rushes. I am sorry about that, Richard. But I will consider the things you've said. That is all I ask, he said. You two might not see it yet, but I see it very clearly. Love is blossoming between you two already. It won't take long for you both to see that as well. I had to admit that I did feel things as I looked at Cecile, thing I hadn't felt before. But love didn't seem like the right thing to call it. Cecile and I had always been extremely comfortable together. That's what I thought I felt, really comfortable with her. The fact was that my mind was still very much on intimacy. And Cecile wasn't a viable candidate for that sort of thing. Shall we go find the chess set, Cecile? I had to find some way to get my mind off wanting to take the woman to my bed upstairs and make her feel the way no other man could. A slight nod gave me my answer. Chess it is then. Cecile. The third time my mother called, I answered, Mom, I told you that I'm trying to get ready to go over to Finn's for dinner tonight. I wore a green dress last time, but I want to look even better this. So, what the heck is so important that you keep calling? Cecile, I've been talking to your father about what you're doing and neither of us likes it. Lying to an old dying man is just not a good thing to do. Mom, I know that. But it's also not a good thing for him to try and change his son virtually overnight into something I don't think he can even become. I'd made the mistake of telling my parents the truth about what I was doing with Finn. If I could have gone back in time and told them the same thing that we were telling his father, I would have done it. Hindsight is most definitely 2020. Why you though, Cecile? she asked. That man could get anyone he wanted to go along with his marriage sham. So why did you go and volunteer yourself? Your father and I are just concerned about what might be going on in your life that made you make that decision. Not much is going on in my life, Mom. I've sworn off men for the next year or so. When Finn told me about what his father was doing to him, I thought, why not? That's just not good, Cecile. We think you should do one of two things. You could tell his father the truth. No way. I interrupted. Or, she said, you can tell Finn that you won't do this, then you two can fake a breakup instead of faking a marriage. Well, I think that the marriage will be real in the sense that it is going to be legal. 
Even worse, she shouted. I thought you said it was going to be a fake marriage. Fake in the sense that we're not going to be sleeping together or doing anything like that. Legally, it will be real. Just no feelings will be involved. And once his father has passed on, I'm sure Finn will go back to his old ways which will give us the proper excuse to use for the divorce. Wait, you said that Finn will go back to his old ways, she said. Does that mean that he's not currently fooling around with lots of women? That is what that means. He's trying to make his father believe that he's all in love with me. If he was out and about messing around with other women, his father would never believe him and he would end up being cut out of the will. Well that changes things, Cecile. What if you two actually end up falling in love? I mean, he's not going out with other women, so that could happen. I'm not about to fall in love with a man like Finn. He's not capable of long-term change. He can be good for now, since his father has him hanging by a thread. But once the man is no longer a threat, Finn will go back to his old ways. I toss some white pumps onto the bed. Mom, I'm having a very hard time figuring out what I'm going to wear tonight, so can I call you tomorrow? Just promise me that you will think about ending this charade. Sure, I'll think about it. But I can tell you right now that I'm the best person for this thing with Finn. I know him in ways no one else does. And I know what he is capable and incapable of doing. Being a faithful husband isn't a thing he can be. I know that. I mean, I really know that. Are you attracted to him? Mom. Come on. Gosh. He's adorable. He's charming. And when we're acting like we're all about each other, it's insane. But it's all an act. And I know that. But does he know that? Yes. Mom, of course he knows that. That's how comfortable we are with each other. We know that neither of us is going to actually fall in love with the other. I'm not going to let myself do that, and he's well aware of that fact. Besides, he's never going to really fall in love with anyone. Even if he forgets that about himself, I'll be there to remind him. We're just worried that one of you will get hurt. You never know. Mom, we're not kids. We're both over 30. We know ourselves very well. It would be nice if I could get his father to see that he shouldn't cut Finn off for being the man he raised him to be, but that doesn't seem like it will happen. So, we're going to have to go along with what he wants. Then, once he's gone, will work around the stipulation that he made to the will. That sounds so complicated, Cecile. It is complicated. And we're aware of that too. Mom, I really need to go. Finn's knocking at the door, and I'm not even dressed yet. I threw my robe on and tied it as I went to let him in. Bye, Mom. I'll call you tomorrow. Love you. Swiping the screen, I ended the call then shoved my phone into the pocket of the fluffy pink robe. As soon as I opened the door, I saw Finn looking me up and down as he whistled, look who's ready to take things to the next level. Give me a sec, and I'll get down to my underwear too so that we can begin on even ground. Ha ha. I turned and walked toward my bedroom. I'll be ready very soon. Make yourself at home. His hand on my shoulder stopped my progression, as he spun me around to face him. FYI, I'm going to propose tonight. Stunned I asked why so soon. My father had three episodes this week. His doctor came in yesterday and told me that things aren't looking great for Richard. So we have to speed things up, hence the proposal. With a huff, I turned around and went to find something worthy of a proposal. My gosh, the way things are going, we'll be married by next week. You say that like it's a bad thing. I turned to find his head hanging low, and immediately felt bad. Going back to him, I put my hands on his cheeks. Finn, it's just that this is all so rushed. I'm not that kind of person. This isn't easy for me. But I'll do whatever it takes. Just know that. Okay? You are too good for me. Nah. I'm just too smart for you is all, I teased before turning away, but then I felt his hand on mine spinning me back to face him. Maybe we should practice the kiss I'm going to give you after you accept my proposal. So, 
we're going to have to kiss? I asked, feeling butterflies swarming inside my stomach. He nodded, licking his lips. I'm afraid so. We might want to get our first kiss out of the way. That way we won't look awkward when we actually kiss in front of my father. No, I said as heat filled my body. It'll be best if our kiss was legitimately the first one that we share. At least that won't be a lie. Reluctantly, he released his hold on me. I guess you're right. You're very smart. Have I told you that before? Lots of time. You're very smart too, you know. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I did take you up on the marriage proposal you made to me. I think that proves how smart I am. And soon, I will take you up on the proposal that you'll do in front of your father. Tit for tat. I went into my bedroom and felt like my knees might melt, so I sat on the end of the bed to take a few deep breaths to try and calm myself. Okay, it's happening fast, but that's okay. Nothing is real anyway. I like you in white, he called out. I looked at the white shoes that lay on my bed. Then white it is. Finding a silky white dress that went down to just above my knees, I finally had my outfit picked out and was just about ready to leave when I checked my reflection. My hair cascaded over my shoulders down to my waist. The dress called for an updo instead of flowing locks. So I went into the bathroom and used some hairpins to pile it up on top of my head, allowing a few strands to spiral down from the messy bun I'd fashioned. When I walked out to him, his eyes took me all in. Oh damn. So you like? I spun around in a slow circle for him to see the rest of me. We'll stop at one place before we go home. He took my hand. Better than I even imagined. Much better. The stop he made was at the jewelry store, where we both got out of the car while his driver waited for us. Welcome to Stefano's, the clerk said. How can I help this beautiful couple this evening? I need an engagement ring, Finn said. And set her up with some earrings that will add depth to her hairstyle too. As soon as he finished his sentence, another clerk hurried out from the back room. Hi, I'm Stacy, the engagement specialist. I heard you two are looking for an engagement ring. Most couples like to go ahead and pick out the entire wedding set, so that the engagement ring matches the wedding ring. Yeah sure do that, Finn said. Cecile, you pick all that out. Well you should help, I said. No, you can do it. Whatever you want is fine. Don't even ask about the prices. If you like it, then get it. He placed a credit card on the counter, then walked back out to the car. The woman looked at me with wide eyes. Well, isn't he something? Yeah, he's something all right. It was obvious that something was bothering him. I had the idea that he was nervous, and maybe even upset about his father's poor health. His dad's sick. He really wanted to see us get married, before he passes on. I'm sure that's Finn's problem. Fifteen minutes later, I emerged from the jewelry store with diamonds dripping from my earlobes and a three-carat diamond solitaire with matching his and hers wedding bands in palladium. Wanna see them? I'll be surprised. He took the bag and put it on the seat next to him. I like the earrings. So do I, I ran my finger over one of them. I like the way they shimmer and shine and hang down all carefree. Speaking of carefree, you're not yourself this evening. Things must be really bad with your father. They are. But that's not all of it. I'm just feeling off. I was sure that his addictions were kicking in. Well, it has been some time since you've been with a woman. And you've been drinking very little and nothing at all on most days as far as liquor is concerned. No, it's neither of those things. He took my hand in his, holding it on the seat between us. This marriage thing. I know it's fake. I mean, it's going to be legal but it's still fake. But when he dies, will you be there for me? He looked at me with shining eyes, a slight frown on his caramel-colored lips. Nodding, I threw my arms around him, hugging him tightly. Finn, I will always be there for you, no matter what. Never think otherwise. We are true friends. And friends are there for each other in the darkest of times. You have me. A slight smile curved his lips. I do. You really do. 
that's good to know. He lifted my hands and kissed them both. Thank you. It's been a rough week. I know it has. I felt terrible that he'd had to endure all that alone. You know, I can maybe come over more often than just on Saturday nights. If you need me, just call and I'll come. You're important to me. I can hand off grading papers to the students if I need to. You really are great, you know, he said with a smile, then draped his arm around my shoulders. So are you. An hour later, we were finishing up dinner, a meal of roasted leg of lamb which I'd never had but found delicious and roasted root vegetables. Wiping my mouth with the white linen napkin, I looked at my empty plate. Once again, an outstanding meal. Thank you both for inviting me to dinner. You are very welcome, Richard said. We love having you. As a matter of fact, I wish we could see more of you. That may be something that can happen soon, Richard, Finn said as he stood up next to me. I have something important to ask my lady friend. He looked at his father, who sat at the other end of the table. And I am happy to be asking her this important question in front of you. My heart raced as I knew what was about to happen. Bracing myself for it, I inhaled and held the breath that felt like fire in my lungs. Richard gushed, oh my. Finn moved to one knee in front of me and pulled out the little white box I'd picked out at the jewelry store. I'd wanted the box to be white to match my dress. Cecile Lorraine Walsh, it would make me the happiest man alive if you would become my wife. He opened the lid of the box with his thumb, presenting it to me. He pulled the ring from the box then asked, Anam Kara, will you marry me? Gulping, I couldn't believe the wave of emotion that came over me. A sob came out of my mouth as I nodded, extending my left hand and spreading my fingers. Yes, Mogare, I will marry you. He slid the ring onto my finger then kissed it, before standing and pulling me up with him. Our eyes met. My body shook, knowing what was about to happen. You have made me happier than I knew possible, Cecile. And then his lips pressed against mine, taking me to a place I never knew existed. Holy cow! Finn Five days had gone by since I'd gotten engaged to Cecile. Five days since I had felt her lips on mine. Yet my lips still tingled every time I thought about that kiss. My heart had done flips inside my chest the moment our lips had touched. An inferno began, and it was still burning deep inside of me. I didn't want to admit it, nor could I say it out loud, but I had never felt anything like that in my entire life. And that scares the hell out of me. Warm rays of sunshine poured over me from the domed glass ceiling as I lounged in the sunroom. Along with the dozens of plants in the room, I too loved to take in the sunshine. It rejuvenated me, and God knew that I needed some rejuvenation. My life had changed drastically in the last few months, and it seemed that more and more changes were heading my way. But I wasn't accustomed to it, and I wasn't sure that I liked it at all. The only thing I did like was the time I got to spend with Cecile. The business side of things was a complete bore to me. But I suppose that was what my new life would be, boring. He's up in his room, doctor. I heard one of the maids say. Follow me. Jumping up, I knew that something must be wrong with my father and hurried after them. What's happened? He's not waking up, the maid informed me. I felt like the air had been sucked right out of my lungs and my knees instantly weakened. That's not good. Moments later, I stood at the foot of my father's bed as his doctor looked him over. His heart rate is low. Can you fix it? I asked. Drooping eyes met mine as the doctor said, he needs a pacemaker. Can he make it through surgery? I asked as worry set in. It's a simple surgery, done under local anesthetic. He might spend a night or two in the hospital, but that's about it. I'll do a leadless pacemaker because his skin is much too thin and fragile for the traditional one. So that is a bit more complicated, but still pretty non-invasive. How soon can you do that, Doc? I'm going to get an ambulance here in the next few minutes and take him straight to the hospital. Then we can get that done. Would you like to ride in the ambulance with your father? Yes, I said, 
then spun around to go grab some things to take along with me. I'll meet you out front. Walking into my bedroom, I found my phone charger and packed some clean clothes so that I could stay overnight with him in the hospital. I took my phone out to check the time and found that it was 10 in the morning. Cecile would be at school already, so I couldn't call her. I texted her instead, letting her know what was going on. Heading out, I was surprised when my phone rang. It was her. Finn, are you okay? Not really. I'm getting someone to take over for me. I'll meet you at the hospital. Which one are you going to? Let me ask the doctor. Relief began to spread through me, knowing that she'd be with me. I found the doctor outside as the ambulance pulled up. Where are you taking him, doc? Cedars, he said before leading the paramedics inside to get my father. I heard him, Cecile said. Try not to worry, Finn. I know he seems fragile, but your father is a lot stronger than he seems to be. My grandmother had a pacemaker put in a few years ago, and all her heart problems went away. This is probably the best thing for him. I hope you're right about that. I'll see you there, Cecile. And thanks. What are fiancés for? See you soon. The woman may have been my fake fiancé, but she was my true friend. My father didn't wake up the entire ride to the hospital, so I didn't get to say anything to him before he went into surgery. A nurse directed me to a waiting area nearby and told me that the doctor would talk to me once he was done. Pacing, I couldn't take the waiting. Anxiety filled me to the brim, and I couldn't stop worrying about him, thinking about him lying there helpless on a cold hard steel table. There you are, I heard Cecile say as she came into the waiting room. I turned around and suddenly her arms were around me, hugging me tightly. My body flushed with hers warmed, melting away the anxiety as she held me. I'm glad you're here. I put my arms around her too, holding her tightly. I've been so worried. I know. She swayed a little with me. I'm here now. You're not alone. Thank you, I said, then kissed the top of her head. I've been feeling quite alone. Moving her hands down my arms she took one hand and pulled me to sit down with her on a small sofa. Have you eaten anything? No. I hadn't even thought about eating. She looked at the vending machines in the room. How about a chocolate candy bar and some soda? The sugar will do you good. I'm sure you've been in shock with all this. Getting up she went and got me some snacks, then came back, popping open the soda. Here you go. Taking the cold can, I took a sip while she unwrapped the chocolate. You remembered that I like dark chocolate. Yes, I remembered. I was the one who bought that cake for your birthday that one year. Your best friend Sammy told me that it had to be dark chocolate. Oh yeah. You put those stupid candles on it that kept lighting back up after I'd blown them all out. It was funny. She handed me the bar of chocolate. It was like you'd never seen those things before. I had never seen them. It freaked me out a bit. I laughed, recalling that night when all my friends sang happy birthday to me. Then I tried to blow out those damn candles. I could tell. And it made me laugh even harder. She smiled, nodding. You really are my smile, Finn. And you really are my soul friend, Cecile. I wanted to kiss her. I wanted that more than I had ever wanted to do anything in my life. The softness of her lips, the taste of her sweet kiss, the sensations kissing her gave me were all so addicting. When she brushed her hair back from her face, I spotted the engagement ring on her finger. You wore that to work. Holding her hand out she looked at the ring. Yes, I wear it all the time. I like this ring. It's the most expensive thing I've ever put on. Have you told anyone that you're engaged? I've told everyone. My family included. She looked at me with a frown. My parents aren't happy about what I'm doing. I don't know who would be happy about us lying to your father. But they don't know you the way I do. My parents said that you could get just about any woman to do what I'm doing. Do you think that's true? Not at all. And my father adores you. He's never adored anyone. But I understand why they wouldn't agree with what we're doing. 
What I don't understand is why you told them the truth. You could have just told them that we're a real couple. Trust me, I'm regretting it now, I said wryly. But I'm not used to being dishonest. So it sort of just came out. But I've regretted it since the moment I said it. Why not tell them that it's real now? I asked. Like they would believe that. You could take me to meet them. We do have chemistry. Yeah. She looked away, then back at me. I don't really want to involve my family in this thing. You know, I don't want them to start liking you, and then when this whole thing is done, they lose you. Why would that happen? We're always going to be friends, Cecile. Yeah, but we won't be together. That might hurt them if they got close to you. That's just how things work when people are in real relationships. So it's best not to take you around them. I see. I didn't agree with her, but I wasn't going to argue about it. Have you ever thought that you might be as commitment-phobic as I am? Shrugging, she said, maybe I am. I know that I have always gone for the bad boys, and that's only gotten me hurt. I don't know why I'm not attracted to down-to-earth men, but I am just so not attracted to them. Maybe it's because you're down-to-earth, and having someone the same as you would be overwhelmingly boring. Not to say that you're boring, because you're not. I'm just saying that opposites attract. If that's true, then why are you attracted to women who want the same things as you, parties and intimacy with no attachments? That's not entirely true, Cecile. I am attracted to you. And you are none of those things. You're attracted to me only because you can't have me. At least not the way that you want. You think that's the only reason why? I was sure it wasn't. Of course, that's the only reason. If I ever slept with you, it would take no time at all before you had to get away from me. We can't have that now, can we? No, we can't have that. I knew she was right about me. At least, the me I used to be. I wasn't really that man anymore though. Not entirely. The sound of someone clearing their throat had me looking at the door. The doctor was standing there. We did some tests before doing the procedure, and found that your father has a blocked artery. So, we're going to put a stent in to deal with that, and wait on the pacemaker until we see if that clears things up. A blocked artery? That sounded really bad. What's a stent? Cecile took my hand as she looked at the doctor. I'll explain things to him. Go and do what you need to do, doctor. We'll be right here. I must warn you that with this procedure, things could go wrong. There's a 50% chance that the blockage could move into his heart, and that could be fatal. But if we do nothing, it will most certainly be fatal. We need your consent to do the procedure, Finn. I looked at Cecile. What should I do? You have to give him a chance to fight, Finn. You can't just leave him with a blocked artery. Like the doctor said, that will kill him. I looked at the doctor. Why can't you just put the pacemaker in? That could be fatal with the blockage, as the force that the machine would put on the heart to pump blood could also dislodge the blockage, sending it to his heart. Finn he needs the stent, Cecile said. There's nothing else they can do. Do what you have to, I told the doctor. I give my consent. I felt sick inside. Thank you, the doctor said. This is for the best, Finn. I'll be back as soon as I'm done to let you know how things went. He turned and left. The worry that had melted away was back now with a vengeance. You said a pacemaker would probably fix him, and now they're not going to do that. This other thing could kill him. Do you think he's going to be okay? I'm sure he'll be just fine. Many people have this done, Finn. Then why did he say that it could be fatal? because he has to let you know the possible outcomes. It's his responsibility to let you know things like that. But it's not the norm for people to die from this procedure. It's a risk but one worth taking. I leaned over to rest my head on her shoulder. I'm not ready to lose him. Lifting her hand she cradled my face, gently running her thumb over my cheek. Then let's pray for him, Finn. That's all we can do now. Closing my eyes, I silently asked God not to take my father yet. I needed him. 
I wanted to see him every day. I couldn't let him go, not yet. Slipping my arm around Cecile, I took solace in her, glad that I had someone with me who I could trust. He took me to my first day of school. I was so afraid and didn't want to go. But he held my hand and walked in with me. Then he pointed at the window and told me that he would be right outside, waiting for school to finish. He told me that I could look out of that window and see the car. He would be right there, and there was no need for me to be afraid. And I wasn't. He did that for a whole week, until I didn't need him to do it anymore. A devoted father, she said quietly. What else has he done for you that went above and beyond? Many things. Too many to count, really. I got quiet as I thought about how much my father had done for me in my life. I had no idea how much time passed as I swam in my memories, but when I heard the doctor, I jerked my head off Cecile's shoulder. He's awake if you'd like to come and see him in the recovery room. I got up, grabbed Cecile's hand and began walking toward the doctor. Yes, I want to see him. Moments later, we were in a tiny room where one nurse sat beside my father, who wore a smile. Seems like I've made it, son. A tear slipped down my cheek, and I sniffled as I wiped it away with the back of my hand. I'm glad you did. You have to get better now. I hope the procedure worked and you'll stop having episodes. Me too. He looked at Cecile. You came. I'm glad you did. You're going to be a very good wife, Cecile. Her cheeks turned red. Ah, thanks, Richard. I'm glad to see you looking so well. I'm sure you'll be fine in no time and you can count on me for anything you might need. Good. He looked at me and then at her. I would like it if you would move into our home. Holy shit. Cecile. No way, Finn. I cannot do that. I paced in the hallway of the hospital. I know it's a lot to ask. It's too much to ask. I couldn't live day to day with Finn and not eventually give in to the desire I had for him. And if I ever did that, I would lose him forever. And I didn't want that to happen. I can't do it, Finn. He walked right next to me, moving back and forth the same way I was. Can we just sit down and talk about this? I'm getting dizzy here with all this pacing. Stopping, I looked at him. There's nothing to talk about. I said no. I'm not about to move into your home. He took my hand and led me to an empty waiting room where he pulled me to sit down on a sofa with him. Cecile, you're making too much out of this. You'll have your own suite at our place. It will be even bigger than what you're living in now. I can't give up my apartment. Do you know how hard it is to find an affordable place to live in LA? Like nearly impossible. Keep it if you want. I think you'd be wasting money if you did that, but that's up to you. Your place would make my commute to work even longer than it already is. What takes me half an hour now would take over an hour with traffic. No worries, my driver can take you and pick you up. It would still take over an hour. I had to find every excuse I could to not move in with them. I just can't do it. You could do your hair and makeup in the car on the way there. Or grade papers. We do have a limo, you know. People would think I was some sort of rich snob if I showed up in a limo every day. That's way too much. He wasn't getting it. I could not live with him. So far, I'd only been hanging out with him on Saturday nights. And there had only been two of those. Already, we'd had to kiss. But that kiss had nearly done me in. If I was with him every single day, it would be too much to bear. His expression grim he sighed then said, I'll just have to tell him that it's too soon for that to happen. Yes, tell him that. I'm a good girl. Good girls don't go moving in with their boyfriends this soon. Well, I'm not your boyfriend. I'm your fiancé, and many people do move in together after they get engaged. So there's that. Finn, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's just that my father is different when you're around. He's more cheery and smiles a lot more. You're just really good for him. 
but I understand why you don't want to live with us. He paused and shook his head. No, that's not true. I don't understand why you don't want to leave your little apartment and move into a mansion where you'll have an enormous suite all to yourself. You do know that we're not talking about some simple bedroom, right? I know that. There's another room when you first walk in. Like a living room. And there's also a television there, so you can watch whatever you want. We've got every channel there is. And behind that room is the bedroom, which is huge. All the beds in the house are killer too. I mean they are the best. Top of the line. And then there's an attached bathroom. The closets are enormous too. Yes, I know your place is wonderful. That's not the problem. So what is the problem, Cecile? He asked with a frown. Be honest with me. I couldn't be honest with him. So I made something up. Look, I told you how my family wasn't happy with me doing this in the first place. If I move in with you, they're really gonna pitch a fit. Tell them it started out fake but now it's real. I can't do that. Why not? I can't lie to them. You care about me. That much is obvious. We get along great. You do like me, and I like you. And we are in a relationship. Neither of us is seeing anyone else. One day we'll get married too. But it won't be a real marriage. Who's to say? He shrugged. You don't know what will happen as time goes on. I do too. You'll get bored and go back to your old ways. You don't know that. Yes I do. And if you and I ever did end up in bed together, you'd get bored of me much faster. I'm not asking you to sleep with me, Cecile. I'm asking you to move into my home. Not into my bedroom, just into my home. There are eight other suites for you to choose from. You can be as far away from me as you like. That wouldn't matter. You know, I'm getting the idea that you can't trust yourself with me. Well that's not it at all. That was totally it, and I hated that he knew me that damn well. It's just too much to ask. After we're married, I know I'll have to move in but not before that. And what about after we're married? Don't you think my father would find it odd if you didn't sleep in my room with me then? You snore, I said. That will be my excuse. I can't sleep with you snoring all night, and as a teacher I need my rest. So I'll stay in another room. I smiled, happy with the idea I'd come up with on the fly. I don't snore. Your father doesn't know that. I don't see how we're ever going to pull this off. Maybe I should just tell him that I can't do this. He looked at me as he stood, then walked to the vending machine to get another soda. It's becoming clear to me that you aren't as comfortable with me as I am with you. And that's okay. I get it. I'm a womanizer who can't be trusted. You can't lose everything because of that, Finn. It's not fair to you. If your father could stop butting into your personal life, that would be great. He popped the top on the soda, turning to look at me. You know he's doing that for my own good, right? I mean, while I was thinking about all he's done for me, I began to realize that he's never done anything to hurt me. He'd only ever helped me. I had gone too far and knew it. Look, I know he only wants you to live a happy life. But are you happier now than you were when you were carousing around town, sleeping with any woman you wanted to, any time you wanted to? He took a drink of the soda then said, I'm happy now. I get up and don't have a headache from drinking and staying up all night. I wake to the smell of clean sheets, which I like very much. Sure, the business stuff is a real drag, but I can do it with ease now. I get that out of the way, and then the rest of the day is mine to do whatever I want. And what do you do with your days, Finn? Mostly nothing. But I want to change that. I've been thinking about something lately. What's that? Something that has to do with art. A few ideas have come to me. Like opening an art studio where we teach classes and also sell art. At least, that's one of my ideas. I like that idea. I think it would be good for you to have something to do each day. You know, 
something that would keep you entertained and make you feel like you're making a difference in people's lives. The way you do? He asked as he came back to sit next to me. I do like making a difference with the kids I teach. It's fulfilling. I think you would be great at anything concerning art. You have a real knack for it. You think you could let me do a little artwork class with the kids in your class? I'll have to talk to the principal to make sure, but I don't see why not. I was glad to be off the subject of moving in with him, and on to something else. The kids would love that too. I could help you figure out what to do with them. You know, let you in on what level they're at right now. Which would be novice. But also what interests kids in that age group. I think I'd like working with you, Cecile. He leaned close enough that our shoulders touched. If you lived with me, then we could get a lot of work done together. Oh, Finn, I thought we were off that subject. He was as tenacious as ever. I know my father brought it up, but I like the idea of getting to see you each day. This may sound stupid, but I find myself missing you. You do. I didn't know if I could believe that. Finn. You don't have to tell me things just because you think I want to hear them. I don't expect you to miss me, you know. So, you don't miss me at all during the week when we don't see each other? I had missed him plenty, but I didn't think that would be a good thing for him to know. Finn, this isn't real. I don't want to keep pointing that out, but I feel like I must. There's no reason to go acting like what's going on here will ever go any further than the friendship we already had. His face drooped as he frowned. So, you haven't missed me then? I didn't say that. I hated the sad look on his face. Of course I've missed you. He perked right up. Good. It's just that since we have to do this thing, we might as well enjoy it. At least, that's what I think. We have always enjoyed spending time together. I don't see why we should pretend that we don't like each other. Nor do I see why we can't move forward with the relationship we already had. Maybe you're right. I know that I'm right. And I know that moving in with us will make you happy. There will be basically no worries for you, Cecile. You'll have all your meals made for you by our chef. That's a real perk. The maids will clean up after you, do your laundry, make your bed. Except for going to work, you won't have any other chores to do at all. I do like the way your chef cooks. I chewed on my lower lip. And with all the money I'll save, I'll certainly be able to find somewhere to live once this is over. Who knows, Cecile, this could last for years now that my father's heart seems to be fixed up. You might as well make yourself at home with us. Let that apartment go. Sell your car. With all the money you save, you can easily buy another one if you want. Or you can let me buy you one. I am not letting you do that. But I shouldn't sell it. I'm not going to let your driver take me to school. We have so many cars that I've lost count. If you don't want to be driven, you can use any one of them to go wherever you want. Let that piece of junk go, Cecile. Let it all go. Am I really going to do this? Can I be honest with you about something, Finn? I hope you always feel that you can be honest with me. He took my left hand, rolling the engagement ring around my finger with his thumb. I wanted to tell him the truth. I wanted to let him know that I was afraid that I would fall head over heels in love with him. He was too dangerous for that, though. He was a risk. Too much of a risk. I couldn't tell him the truth about my fears about him, but I had to say something. What if your father finds out that we're lying to him? Blinking. He looked as if he'd never thought about that before. We can't let him find that out. No matter what we have to do. I can only go so far, Finn, and you know that. I had the idea that he was still trying to get me into his bed. If this is going to work, you have to stop trying to find ways to sleep with me. Where's the fun in that? He asked with a deep chuckle. If I'm going to live in your home, then you'll have to reel yourself in some. I can't go day to day under the pressure that you can put on a woman to give you what you want. A sensual grin moved his lips. What makes you think I want to sleep with you? Giving him a knowing look, I said, you can't fool me. 
You're a bad boy, and you always will be. His brows furrowed, and he got up. Cecile, it's not fair for you to label me. I don't keep telling you that you're a prude, and if you're not careful, your sexual organs will shrivel up and die. My eyes just about popped out of my head. So that's what you think of me? Sometimes. I hadn't realized he saw me that way. I didn't quite like it either. Well, think what you want about me. You and I cannot sleep together, or you'll want to be rid of me, and that could ruin this whole thing. You might not know that, but I do. I think you're wrong. I know that I am not wrong. You have been out of the partying scene for how long now, Finn? I don't know, a month or so. I don't really miss it all that much anymore. Not that much, huh? I had to laugh. Yeah, you're still very much the man you've always been. I don't agree with you. I'm changing, evolving. Once you're living with me, you'll see that. It didn't matter if I saw a change in him or not. Deep down I knew that men like him might be good for a bit, but it never lasted. And I wasn't going to give my heart to someone who would most definitely destroy it. With that at the forefront of my mind, I sighed. I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to give it a chance. You'll move in, he asked with wide eyes. Really? I hope this isn't a gigantic mistake. Finn I'm glad you're moving in today. Richard will be very pleased to see you here when he comes home today, Cecile. Extending my arm to gesture to all the bedroom suites she had to choose from, I went on, go check all the rooms and pick the one you like best. They're all decorated a little differently. Want me to show you the one I think you'll pick? No. If you tell me that, then I'll be predisposed to choosing it. She went to the first door on the left. You said the one at the end of the hallway is your father's. Yes? She went to the door closest to her and opened it, walking in with me right behind her. This is pretty masculine decor. Turning around she went back out, and I followed. Do you prefer showers or baths? I asked to help her decide. Both. I like showers for the mornings and long hot baths at night. She opened the next door and found that one much more suitable. Now this I like. She ran her hand over the white silk chaise lounge with a heart-shaped back and tiny red roses peppering the vibrant fabric. I can totally see myself lounging around in this living area. Her eyes went to the television mounted on the wall. I like the size of this TV. It's not huge but not little either. I took the remote control off the table by the door. This controls everything in here. The television, the window blinds, the gas fireplace, and the lighting. I dim the lights to show her. Nice. But turn the lights back up please. I want to see things clearly. She turned the knob on the door at the back of the room and walked into the bedroom. Wow, would you look at that bed. Hand-carved four posts and the comforter makes it look like something out of a hotel. She turned to smile at me. I love the use of white in here. I know white isn't usually a person's favorite color, but I sort of love it. And I love the red accents too. I think I've found my room. Let me check the bathroom to be sure though. I open the door to the walk-in closet. The closet is monster-sized too. She peered into the vastness of the well-equipped closet. Wow. That is really big. My things will definitely fit, with much room to spare. Don't worry. With all the money you'll be saving on rent and utility bills, you can spend some on clothes and shoes. Or better yet, you can let me buy some for you. Get real, Finn. I'm not letting you buy me clothes and shoes. She headed toward the bathroom, placing her hands on the handles of the red double doors. I can't wait to see what's behind these gorgeous doors. Pushing them open, she gasped. Oh my gosh. This is my dream bathroom. The spa bath is sunken so that you can simply step right into it. I went to the shower next. This shower has room for four if you ever decided to have a little fun in there with multiple people. I winked at her. Not me. She looked around the massive shower. How many places does the water come out of this thing? A hell of a lot. 
I turned on the water, and she smiled as she saw water coming from every direction. You will not leave this shower with one dirty inch of flesh, Cecile. That will save loads of time in the mornings. She walked around, admiring the vanity and the long mirror. The lighting in here is the best ever too. I don't see the toilet though. I went to the very back of the room and opened the door that led to the toilet. It's in its own little room for privacy. You know, if you were sharing the room with someone, say your fiancé or husband, then you might want the toilet to be separate from the rest of the bathroom. I like that. She put her hand on my shoulder. But I won't be sharing a room with either of those guys. I see. Come on, let me show you the other rooms. No. I want this one. I know this is the one for me. I found it odd that she would pick one without seeing the rest of them. Are you sure, Cecile? This one is perfect for me. I love it. She went back to the bedroom and sat on the bed. Oh, this bed. Will I ever be able to get up and out of it? I sat down on the bed next to her. I hope so. Her eyes closed, and she ran her hands back and forth over the comforter. I've never felt anything this soft in my life. Yeah, the fabrics around here are pretty soft. So, do you want to go and talk to the chef to tell him about any food allergies you have? Or things you like or dislike? I am food allergy-free, thank goodness. And I will eat anything he cooks. I don't want to interfere with the way this home usually runs. I want you to make yourself comfortable here, and I don't want you going without something just because you don't want to bother anyone, I let her know. The staff are well paid and extremely capable of doing any extra thing you might want or need them to. I've managed to take care of myself for this long, she said, sitting up. I think I can still do it. Well, let's go down and let the movers know where to bring your things. One of the maids will put your stuff away. I took her hand, leading her out of the room. I can put my things away, she protested. I know that you can do it, but it's much better to let the maid do it. That way, she will know where to put your clothes after they're laundered. It's the way we've always done it around here. And it's a perfect system. Let it work for you. Since the system is perfect, I will do just that then. She smiled as we went into the hallway. And where is your room? I pointed directly across the hall. Right there. She looked at me with narrowed eyes. And is the room that I picked the one you thought I would? No. I pointed at the one the furthest from mine. I thought you would take that one. Mostly just to be as far away from me as you could possibly get. But imagine my surprise when you picked the one closest to me. I couldn't help but grin at that. Yeah, that is surprising. Funny how you didn't mention that this was your room. I didn't want to interfere with your decision. I laughed as we went down the staircase. My father will be happy to see you. This is a surprise for him. I haven't said a word about you moving in. He's asked, but I said that you hadn't decided on his offer yet. Well, I hope he'll feel better with me around. He's a good man, Finn. He loves you so much. One of the maids approached us as we stepped off the last step. Have you made a decision, Miss Walsh? I have. The room directly across the hall from Finn's. The one with the white sofa with red roses on it. Please call me Cecile. And what may I call you? I am Phoebe Cecile. Anything you need, ask me, and I'll make sure you have it. Thank you, Phoebe. An hour later, Cecile's things had been brought in and put away. Then I took her to my favorite room in the house. Feel free to roam around and check the place out. I opened the double glass doors to the sunroom. This is my favorite spot. If you can't find me, I'll usually be in here, soaking up the sun. I closed the doors behind us to give us some privacy. Wandering over to where a couple of overstuffed recliners sat, she took a seat in one of them. Comfy. She pushed the button on the side to make the chair recline. Really comfy. All the furniture in this home is made for complete comfort. No wonder you've had a hard time finding anything else to do besides lounge around the house before going out on the town. 
This place is designed to keep people relaxed. I took the chair next to hers, reclining back too. Glad you understand me better now. I would chill all day long, then find myself bored and looking for more, so then I'd go out to find some trouble to get into. Turning her head, she looked at me. Speaking of finding things for you to do so that you won't be bored, we should start working on the art project you want to do with the kids. Principal Logan said that we just have to run a background check on you, before you volunteer your time. That takes about 24 hours to come back. Maybe you could come with me to work tomorrow, and I'll take you to the office so you can get that done. We can let your driver take us to the school, and then you guys can come back later to pick me up once school's out. You're serious? I had to ask, since she'd been dead set against having my driver take her to work. I'm serious. I've been doing some thinking, and realized that I should utilize your offer of letting the driver take me to work. It would just be a smart thing for me to do. I'm glad you feel that way. It would be safer too. There are car accidents every day out there. It would make me feel better to know that you're being driven by a trained professional. Reaching out she ran her hand over mine, which rested on the arm of the chair. Ah, listen to you, caring about my safety. That's something a fiancé would definitely do. So what a really good friend. I moved my hand to hold hers, leaving our clasped hands on the arm of my chair. So, we need to discuss how things will be around here. We have to make things look good for my father, plus the staff. They're loyal to me, but more loyal to my father. If he asks them anything about us, they'll tell him the truth. So, we're going to have to act like a couple in love and on the verge of marriage. We're going to have to plan a wedding. We should come up with a wedding date, for starters. Looking a bit panicked, she asked, Do you really think we need to start doing that already? I do. I was sure my father would try to rush our marriage along, now that he'd come so close to death. You've got to think about the state of mind my father must be in now. He'll be in a hurry to see me married. With a heavy sigh she agreed, Yes, I'm sure you're right. So we should pick a date that's not too far away, I suppose. My parents are going to be livid, but I guess that's just the way it has to be. They were already pissed that I was moving in here with you. Why don't you just tell them that things got real between us? I couldn't understand why she wouldn't say that to make things easier with her family. I might do that. I'm tired of them always being upset with me. Good. We can invite them over for dinner soon too. I lifted up her hand and kissed it. We need to get comfortable with showing our affection. Pure panic filled her green eyes as she leaned up. I don't think that's necessary. It is necessary. We'd only shared one kiss. But the reason why it had felt so damn good might have merely been because it had been so long since I'd had one. Come over here and climb onto my lap so we can cuddle a bit. That's not a good idea. I watched as her body went rigid. I can see how tense you just got. We need to do this, Cecile. We need to get used to kissing each other. We need to get used to holding each other. Nuzzling. All the stuff that real couples do, we have to get used to doing it until it becomes second nature to both of us. Oh my, this is really too much. Her cheeks turned red. I don't think I can do that. Why not? It was becoming clearer and clearer that she didn't trust herself with me. You can trust me not to go too far, Cecile. Sucking in her breath, she asked, Can I? You can. I knew it wouldn't be easy for me to hold back, since I'd never really had to do that before, but I knew that I had to if this was going to work. And it had to work if I wanted to keep living the life I'd always lived. Come on, come sit on my lap. I let go of her hand and moved the chair back to a sitting position. Okay then. She got up and came to me, looking at my lap as if it were a pit full of viperous snakes ready to strike. Taking her hands, I pulled her to me. Come on, I won't bite. Frightened eyes looked into mine. Promise? I promise. Pulling her down to sit on my lap, I ran my hands along her arms, then all the way around her, drawing her to me. Our faces moved closer and closer in slow motion, until our lips pressed together. 
Moving her arms around my neck, she kissed me, softly. Pulling. I didn't want to end the kiss, but I'd made a promise that I intended to keep. Pulling back, I sighed as I said, Okay, I've got to stop. Leaning her forehead against mine, she said, This affection thing isn't going to be easy. Sitting back, she touched her lips as she climbed off my lap. The way she glowed told me I'd affected her just as much as she'd affected me. This is not good at all. So see you. My lips tingled. Things had begun dancing around inside of my body with the second kiss we'd shared. How Finn's kiss affected me was a mystery. I'd never felt anything like it, so I had to wonder if he had some secret magical powers, and that was why women threw themselves at him. My eyes caught movement outside the glass walls of the solarium. Is that your father's car coming? Finn stood nodding. That's him. Come let's greet him. He's going to love hearing that you're all moved in already. He ran his arm around my shoulders, pulling me close to him and then kissing the side of my head. Things are going to be just fine. Not to worry, Anam Kara. I hope you're right, Mogare. My heated body told me that things weren't going to be just fine. It wanted the man that my brain told me I could never have. I knew my brain was right. It would end our friendship right along with Finn's lavish lifestyle when his father disinherited him. When they wheeled Richard into the house, he looked much better than I had ever seen him thus far. And when he saw me, he lit up like a Christmas tree. How nice to see you, Cecile. Finn gave me a little squeeze. She's not just here to visit either. Richard's white eyebrows rose as a surprised expression took over. You've decided to move in with us. I have. I'm already all moved in, thanks to your extremely helpful staff. Placing my hand on Finn's chest, I looked up at him, playing the part of a doting fiancé. My being here will give us a chance to get to know one another even better before we exchange our wedding vows and spend the rest of our lives as man and wife. Finn's smile looked real, though it had to have been fake. Forever, Anam Kara. His lips were suddenly on mine. The heat that flushed through my body only added to the heat that had still been simmering from the last kiss. Although brief, the kiss still left my head fuzzy. This is so bad. You both glow. See Finn, I told you that you needed to experience love. I must admit that I'm a bit jealous, that I never made myself find the same thing you two have found. Instead, I hid from it or pushed it away. Hindsight is 2020, they say, and they were right. It's nearly dinner time, Finn said, moving his hand up and down my arm as he kept it draped over my shoulders. Shall we adjourn to the dining room? The act only served to generate more heat inside my poor body, which had begun to ache and throb in all the right places. How am I going to do this? We shall. Richard led the way on his electric wheelchair. I've hired a new nurse. He'll be here in an hour. We walked alongside him, and I had to ask, were you unhappy with the nurse you had? I wasn't unhappy with her, but my doctor was. He said that she should have spotted the signs of my blocked artery, since she had nearly constant access to me. He found a male nurse he thought would be better suited for me. I suppose she should have noticed the signs. I'm glad your doctor looks out for you so well. Patting his shoulder as he came to a stop in the dining room, I felt genuine compassion for the man. Since I'll be around more now, I'll be sure to talk to your new nurse often to make sure he's keeping up with things where your health is concerned. Patting my hand which rested on his shoulder, he smiled up at me. Thank you my dear. That would be most appreciated. I would love nothing more than to live long enough to see a grandchild or two. Nervous laughter peeled from my lips without me meaning for it to. Oh my. Well, we'll have to see how that works out, won't we? Finn was quick to add, We're going to start working on a wedding date soon, Richard. The sooner, the better, Richard said. Spare no expense. He moved up to the table as Finn pulled out a chair for me. I should meet your family, Cecile. Talk to them about when they can come over for dinner and then tell the chef what to make for the occasion. Anything you want, my dear. Don't even think about the cost. 
Money is no object. Well, there certainly is a lot to do, isn't there? Feeling overwhelmed, my body began to shake, until Finn sat down beside me and took my hand in his. Then my body stopped shaking and warmth spread through it instead. How does he affect me so? I will be right there with you, helping all along the way. Not to worry. Honestly, what is it with this man's lips that they seem so damn special? The wait staff began bringing the food in on silver domed plates, placing one in front of each of us. We all removed the domes at the same time as the waiter said, The chef wishes me to tell you that he has replaced the normal menu with a heart healthy one. The chef presents to you salmon piccata, rich in omega 3, which has been shown to reduce platelet aggression and blood clots, is our main course. You will be served a powerful anti inflammatory main course of either salmon or mackerel, twice weekly. How considerate, Richard said. You must thank the chef for me, Dunstan. I will certainly convey your gratitude, sir. The salmon was cooked in extra virgin olive oil, as most of the foods he serves you will be. The side of avocado is also heart healthy, as is the lentil consume. Dessert will consist of fresh mixed berries, and the drink for this evening is green tea. Seems like we'll all be eating very good for our hearts and cardiovascular systems. I said as I smiled at Richard. We'll be here with you every step of the way. All of us will work to help keep you around for as long as possible. Thank you all. He looked at Finn. Especially you, Finn. You have made me a very happy father. I am trying. He looked at me. She's our angel, I think. I agree, Richard said. Ah, you guys. A blush warmed my cheeks. Come on now. Let's eat this delicious meal the chef and kitchen staff have worked so hard on for us. The meal was as scrumptious as any I'd ever eaten at the Murphy home. And once it was over, there was a lull in time, too soon to get ready for bed and too late to start any projects that could keep us busy. So, we adjourned to the theater to watch a movie that had just been released. I've been dying to see this movie, Cecile, Finn said as he held my hand leading me through the expansive mansion until we stopped in front of a set of double doors. He opened them, revealing a small theater with an enormous screen. You used to like horror movies. I hope that's still the case. The Secret of Newsome House is supposed to be the scariest film out this year. It's been ages since I've watched a scary movie. I was thankful that we would be out of sight from all the others in the home and be able to get some much-needed space between us for a while. I'd had about all I could take of his fire-inducing touches. He fired up the popcorn machine as I took a seat right in the middle of the back row. There were three rows of six reclining theater seats, meaning the room could host a fair number of people. As the corn popped, Finn began bagging it up in small red-striped bags and putting them onto a tray. The staff love theater nights. They do. I had no idea what he meant by that. I know it's not the norm in most homes, but since I was an only child and my father was out most nights, I started inviting some of them to the theater night I'd have once a week. It's become sort of a tradition. People began coming in, picking up a bag of popcorn, then grabbing drinks from the small fridge in the corner. And then it hit me that we would not be alone and there would be no space between us after all. Damn it. Hey guys, Finn said as more people came into the room. This is my fiance, Cecile. She moved in today. Make sure you introduce yourselves to her, please. Suddenly, I was surrounded by them all. I'm Todd, the groundskeeper. Nice to meet you, Todd. I'm Karen, the laundress. That means I do all the laundry around this place. Hello, Karen. I'm Lulu, Cecile. I'm in housekeeping. And not the glamorous side either. I do all the bathrooms. Good to know you, Lulu. Stan, the oldest person in the room, said, Maintenance? Nice to meet you, Stan. Finn slipped in next to me, handing me a bag of popcorn and a red cream soda. Okay, guys, let's get this movie started. They all took seats, and then I found people flanking both sides of us. Great. While I was glad that Finn was nice to the people who worked for him, I wasn't glad about being in such close contact with him for the next couple of hours. He rested his hand on my knee, 
smiling at me with those pearly white perfect teeth of his, eyes sparkling like usual, penetrating mine as he said, if you get too scared, you can always climb onto my lap and am Kara. Todd who sat next to Finn leaned over and asked, what does that mean? It means soul friend, Finn let him know. She calls me Mo Gare, which means my smile. See, I'm her smile and she's my soul friend. It sounds like you two have known each other a long time. But that can't be the case, Todd said, as he obviously knew Finn's character. We went to college together, Finn said. Some years came between us, but we ran into each other again and sparks flew. Todd looked confused as he looked around Finn, at me. Did you date him in college? God no. I said a little too quickly, and much too loudly. Finn looked at me with large eyes. Um, no, we didn't date. We were very good friends. Still are. Only now, we've found more about each other to like. Or love, I should say. He kissed my cheek. I love this woman right here. She is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So there I was, put on the spot to say that I loved him back. Well, same here. Ah, came the cumulative response to my not-so-sweet reply. The light suddenly dimmed and the screen lit up. I looked over my shoulder to find a small square of light coming from the wall at the back of the room. You have a real person back there running the film? Yes. Finn ran his arm around my shoulders, pulling me close as our chairs moved back to a reclining position. How's my chair moving? I asked. I'm moving them both with my other hand, silly. He pulled up the armrest to make sure there was no space between us. Let's cuddle, he cooed in my ear. I'd had no idea the seats could basically become a bed, and I hated it. I couldn't even pay attention to what was going on with the movie, as our bodies touched way too much. I wanted to touch him in ways I knew that I couldn't. But then he took my hand and put it on his chest to rest there as he stared at the screen. His rigid pectoral muscles begged me to run my hand over them. But I stubbornly refused to do that. I will not allow my body to rule me. Scanning the room, I saw that most of the people were coupled up, cuddling the same way we were. Except for Stan, who sat alone in the front, seat not reclined at all, stuffing popcorn into his mouth and seemingly not caring about his single state. That was supposed to have been what I was doing with my life at this point. Only, I'd volunteered myself for a mission that might break me. There was no doubt at all in my mind anymore. I am completely attracted to Finn Murphy. What was worse than that was that I'd begun having real feelings for him too. And that was just plain stupid of me. The thing was that I knew he was only acting. Finn didn't have it in him to have real feelings. He knew how to play, how to have fun. But real intense feelings? No he didn't have the capability for something that deep. I knew that I did. But unfortunately for me, I always picked bad boys over good ones every damn time. And this was still the case with Finn. My fingers moved back and forth over his chest, taking in the hills and valleys that hid beneath his soft, cotton t-shirt. My heart sped up as I kept moving my fingers a little lower and a little lower until I found his sculpted muscles. Slowly my head moved, looking up at him. His lips caught mine, and that was it for me. I couldn't recall all that had happened, as I'd gone drunk on the man as we made out in the dark theater. The next thing I knew, I was in my new bedroom, trying to wash the warm feeling I had off my body with cold water spilling from a thousand showerheads. It wasn't working. What would Finn do if I went to his bedroom? Grabbing the soap bottle, I poured some on a pink puff, and vigorously scrubbed it all over my body while quietly chanting to myself, I will not go to his room. I will not go to his room. I won't go, right? Finn. Was that real? I couldn't be sure. I didn't know if what had happened between us was real or just an act on Cecile's part. There we were, surrounded by people who worked in the house, people who would tell my father if Cecile and I were faking or not. Did she initiate the make-out session just to make the staff think we're a real couple? Cecile had been the one to start things up. I'd been watching the movie fairly intensely, 
when she'd looked up at me with pure desire in her eyes. I wasn't sure who kissed who first, but the way she sort of attacked me told me that she was into it. But was it only an act? If it was an act, then I couldn't possibly let her know what she'd done to me. My body was on fire for that woman. I had it bad for her. But I wasn't going to hand her my heart on a silver platter, only for her to tell me that she didn't want it. She'd done me a favor, volunteering to be my fake fiancé and my soon-to-be fake wife. She'd been honest with me too. At least, mostly honest. I knew she wanted me. But then again, most women did. Only Cecile seemed genuinely afraid of her desire for me. It was as if I could really hurt her if she let herself go with me. Not that I would intentionally hurt her. But she was right. That had always been my way. Did I think I would grow bored of her? No way. But what if I was wrong? What if Cecile knew me even better than I knew myself? What if I had some sort of self-destructive streak within me that I couldn't even see? Getting out of the cold shower I'd taken to try to dull the ache in my body, I knew I wasn't out of the woods yet. I need her. She'd been the one to start the fire in my loins. And only she could put it out. But is that what she wants? There was only one way to find out. Wrapping the towel around my waist, I set out to go to her to see what she wanted. Was it me? Or was all that making out only for the staff to witness and secure the status of our fake relationship? I got only a couple of steps outside my door when I heard my father calling out from down the hall. Don't do it. Looking his way, I saw him coming toward me on his electric wheelchair. Why not? I asked. We are engaged. He stopped in front of me. She's too special for you to be sneaking into her room on the very first night she's moved in. It would be different if you two were already having sleeping together. But you're not. Right? Nodding, I saw no reason to lie to him any more than I had to. No, we haven't done that. When you two do, it should be special. Not something as seedy as you slipping into her room where she might feel she has no recourse but to give in to you. You don't want that, right? No, I don't want her to feel that she has to do that. I really didn't. And I knew he was right. I'll go back to my room. And thanks. I needed to hear that. I turned to walk back into my room, then stopped and looked over my shoulder at him. You're turning into a wise old man somehow, Richard. It was bound to happen eventually, what with my age climbing so rapidly. Good night, son. You have sweet dreams. Going back into my room, I slipped under the sheets then picked up my phone from the nightstand. I felt like Cecile and I needed to talk after what had happened. I'd never thought about talking to a woman after having any sort of Fiscal activity between us. But now, I knew that I needed to talk to Cecile about what had happened. Finn, she asked as she answered my call. Who else would it be? No, I knew it was you. I just can't imagine why you're calling me. After what just happened, you can't imagine why I'm calling you. I asked with surprise. I mean what just happened, Cecile? It was the hardest thing that I had ever needed to force out of my mouth, but it needed to be said. Was that real or fake? Um well you tell me, she countered. Now I knew she'd meant it. Or I thought that was the case, because she might have been trying to show me how great an actress she could be. Whatever it was, I'm sure it made the staff think we're for real. Yeah, and that's what's important, she said. Well yeah, but still, did you mean any of it? Finn, we can't get into a physical relationship, and you know that. You need me to stick around, remember? You need me to marry you. You need to be able to stick with me. We both know that won't happen if things become physical between us. So you faked it. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. I hated the way I felt. It was like rejection or something. And it was horrible. Good night. I shouldn't have called her. Finn wait. You sound upset. No I'm fine. You are not. I can hear it in your voice. 
She sighed, sounding a little bit exasperated. I couldn't tell if it was with herself or with me. So, I'll tell you the truth, even though I had begun to think that doing so wasn't the best idea. Finn, it wasn't some idea I had to start making out with you in front of the staff. It just happened. Perking up a little, I asked, so you wanted me? A heavy sigh met my ear. Well yes. It's just that we've kind of been really touching a lot today. And then in the theater, it was sort of like we were lying in bed, all touching and stuff, and my body got turned on. And that's when I looked up at you, and sort of begged you to kiss me with my eyes. It wasn't an act, is what I'm trying to say. It was real. And it was probably a mistake. I don't think so. Well, you wouldn't now, would you? Cecile, do you think I've got some sort of self-destructive thing going on? In a way, yes. Do you think I can take control over it? I'm not sure. I do think you're brilliant and intelligent, but you've been this way your whole life. That's exactly why I volunteered to do this with you. I don't think a leopard can change its spots. And I don't think it's fair of anyone to ask it to even try. You think I'm incapable of change, I said, knowing the answer. That hurt. I knew she didn't mean for it to hurt me, but it still did, even though that's what I'd started off telling my dad when he'd first brought up his stipulation. That's not entirely true, Finn. My heart leapt. It's not. I think you can change if that's something you truly want. I just don't think you truly want to do that. Not for me anyway. What if you're wrong? I doubt that I am. If you wanted me for more than a one-night stand, then you would have begun making changes before I volunteered to be your fake wife. Well, what if I didn't know that I wanted you that way until we began spending so much time together? In reality, we've spent a couple of evenings together and one day together at the hospital. That's not much time for anyone to realize what they really want. This engagement, the upcoming marriage, it's all a sham, Finn. We don't love each other. We're only doing this so that you don't become disinherited. What I'm saying is that real love doesn't come on this fast. You're probably right. I'd never experienced real love before, so how was I supposed to know how long it took to grow? But then again, neither had she. Cecile, you do realize that you've got no more experience with love than I do, right? What if you're wrong? I don't think I am, Finn. Love takes time. We have a mutual attraction and a great friendship, but that's all we have. So she doesn't love me. I would have to deal with that. For all I knew, I didn't love her either. But I did think of her like 90% of the time. And I did like to see her smile. I loved making her happy. And I loved the fact that she'd moved into our home. At least we have something. That's more than I've had with any other woman in my life. What about your mother, Finn? You never talk about her. Well, there's not a lot to talk about where she's concerned. My father raised me. He had nannies care for me when I was young. My mother Priscilla came around on most holidays and on my birthday, but after I turned 18, that all stopped. If I wanted to see her, I had to go to her. She didn't come to the mansion anymore. And my visits to her have been infrequent. Maybe the lack of a mother's presence in your life made such an impact on you that you don't fully believe that women are capable of loving anyone that much. Maybe. I'd never thought about that before. I do think that you have a great capacity for caring for others, Cecile. You haven't known my father for long at all, but you already care for him. Yeah, you two Murphy men are something special to me. Why? I do not know. But you're both special to me. Thank you for admitting that to me. I like knowing that I'm special to you. You know that you're special to me too, right? I do know that. I am the only woman you've let be around you this much. Yeah, you are. Cecile wasn't like any woman I'd ever known. That was great in many ways, but bad in some. I love being your friend. And I love being your friend too, Finn. I truly do. I am attracted to you. Who wouldn't be? You're built like a Roman god with the looks of a movie star. 
but I love our friendship, and that means so much more to me than a few rolls in the hay before you decide that you have to get away from me, before you fall in love, or something horrible like that. Falling in love with Cecile didn't sound as horrifying as I'd long imagined something like that would be. Ah, it's not that bad, Cecile. I'm not so sure about that, Finn. People seem to be in love one moment, and then the next time you see them, they've broken up. I don't pretend to understand how love works. I just know that I'm drawn to men like you. The difference between you and the other men I've been with is that I actually enjoy your company and feel a sort of kinship between us. I don't know why that is so don't ask me. That's just the way it's always been. I feel comfortable with you. But the touching, kissing, making out, that needs to be controlled a bit more. I'm only human, you know. As am I, Cecile. Do you think your touch doesn't do things to me? Do you think your kiss doesn't ignite a passion in me that I've never experienced before? You'd be wrong if you thought that way. I've been considering why that is, Finn. I think it's only because you and I haven't been getting affection anywhere else. That's why the sparks between us are so hot. But I think that's the only reason. So, you think that if we were with other people, then it wouldn't seem so good when we kissed or touched? Yes, that's what I'm saying. We could test that theory if you want. I was baiting her to see if there was any jealousy on her end. I could go out tomorrow night and find some girl to do those things with, then come back here to you and see what happens when we kiss. The hell you could, she shouted. So there is jealousy. Why is that? If anyone saw you, it would be the end of your airship, Finn. Don't be dumb. She was right about that. What about you then? Why don't you find some guy to do those things with, and then come back to me and see what happens to our kiss? My gut twisted with my words, and I felt sick inside with just the thought of her doing anything with some other guy. Scratch that. I'm sure that would end my airship too, as my father would surely figure us out if you did something like that and he ever got wind of it. I wouldn't do that anyway. If you'll recall, I've sworn off men for at least a year. And now that we're going to get married, it seems like that time frame will be extended indefinitely. The idea of neither of us having intimacy for years sounded like hell to me. Cecile, we're going to have to come to some agreement on the intimacy thing. I mean you said it yourself, we are only human. Humans need to intimacy. No they don't. Um yeah, they absolutely do. I think what happened in the theater proves that. You needed me. You know you did. Don't try to lie. I felt it. I felt the heat coming off you. And I would bet a million dollars that you had to do something to try to stop all that passion we drew up in each other. A cold shower. Me too. It didn't do much to help either. Ditto. But you and I can never sleep together. So I'm thinking that we will have no choice but to. I interrupted her, sleep together. No. See, there is more than one way to skin a cat. We can take care of our needs ourselves. You take care of yours and I'll take care of mine. Can we at least watch each other do that? I teased, knowing she would never go for that. That's gross. Right. You know, we need to make this look good, Finn. I've pulled out my laptop here and am looking up things tips on what makes a healthy couple. You should learn how to treat a woman the right way. I know how to treat a woman, Cecile. No, I mean treat her like someone you want to keep around, Finn. For starters, you should greet your partner with a chaste kiss on the cheek and pull her chair out for her, open doors for her, stroke her hair away from her face, and gaze upon her with love in your eyes. Think you can pull that stuff off? Do all that and not fall in love with you. Impossible. Cecile. A little over a week had passed since I'd moved into Finn's home. We'd agreed to keep the affection to a minimum. It just seemed best for us both if we kept all arousal out of our relationship. Being Saturday morning, we all met at the breakfast table to begin enjoying the weekend. Finn pulled the chair out for me as soon as I entered the breakfast room. Allow me my sweet. 
Pecking his cheek chastely I replied, thank you my dear. Richard's eyes on us he asked, how are things going with you two? Other than dinner in the evenings, I've spent no time with the two of you. Well she works Richard, Finn reminded him. Yes I know that. And I thought you said that you two were going to work together. Something about you volunteering to teach her students art, or something along those lines. We had intended to do that, but with the knowledge that we were getting to each other physically, and knowing that we had to do something serious to put the brakes on it, we decided that now wasn't a good time for that sort of thing. So I came up with a plausible excuse. Finn's background check hasn't come back yet. He can't work with the students until the principal has that in his files. Otherwise, the school can be sued. I haven't noticed you two working on the project. You'll need to be ready when the paperwork comes back. But it seems that after dinner, you both just go to your separate bedrooms. Well, I've always got lots of papers to grade, I said, which was true. And I've been working on the projects I want to do with the kids on my own, Finn said, which wasn't true. I had no idea what he did in his room, but I knew it wasn't that. We'd put space between us on purpose. We had to do that, or it would been a catastrophe. As we were being served the domed covered plates, Richard said, I would like to see you both in my office directly after breakfast, please. Looking at Finn as his face went pale, I knew this wasn't good. Of course, Richard. We ate the egg white omelets in silence, the atmosphere growing heavier with each bite we took. I followed Finn's lead, eating very slowly, taking up time before we had to go to his father's office. I really had no idea what could be so bad about being asked to go to his office, but Finn's vibe told me I wasn't going to like whatever his father had to say. When we'd all finished eating, Richard went off in his electric wheelchair, leading the way to his office while Finn and I walked behind him. Finn took my hand, pulling me close to whisper in my ear, whatever he has to say, please don't let it be a deal breaker. I'll try to find ways to go around anything he puts out there. I've got a bad feeling about this. With no wedding date coming in the last week, I began to think that we were moving too slow for Richard's tastes. Maybe we should tell him a wedding date. You might be right about that. How does next month sound to you? It sounded way too soon. But I could see now that Richard was going to demand things be rushed. Next month sounds good to me. Pick any Saturday. The second one. Panic shot through me. That was only a couple of weeks away. But I said, sounds good. In two weeks, I'll be a married woman. The thought horrified me. Even though it wasn't going to be a real marriage in terms of our relationship, it was still scary as hell. Richard's office was massive and ominous. Power seemed to radiate from every corner. Highly polished wood and dark leathers made the room reek of masculinity. On his desk, a box of cigars could be smelled from the moment we walked through the door. Two high-backed matching leather chairs sat in front of his desk, and I noticed a file lying on the desk. Please sit down, he said as he moved behind the desk. Finn and I sat down, and then waited as Richard pulled the file toward him, placing his hands on it. Finn sighed, why does this feel uncomfortable, Richard? Probably, because I am about to issue some orders. Finn's shoulders slumped. He had already been given more than enough orders for inheriting his father's fortune. I hated to see Finn that way. So I sat up tall and straight hoping to get him to see that he needed to do a little standing up to his well-meaning but overstepping father. I'm not sure what orders you feel necessary, but we will listen to what you want, Richard. In this folder, there's a policy and a contract that goes along with it that I want you two to read and then sign. But only if you agree to do the things outlined within the policy. If you feel that you don't wish to comply, that is fine. But I must tell you that if you do not comply, then I'll move the stipulation to the present date, Finn. Gasping Finn asked Richard why. Thus far, my knowledge of the stipulation of Richard's will was something I wasn't supposed to know about. So I asked, what is this stipulation you're talking about, Richard? He looked at his son. You haven't told her of the stipulation? Finn looked at me with wide eyes as he shook his head. No, I haven't. Well, then I shall. Please do 
I said as I reached over, taking Finn's hand to try to bring him some comfort in the extremely uncomfortable situation. Since you knew my son in his college days, you are well aware of his prowess with the women. I am aware of his past. Yes? In an effort to prevent him from ending up a lonely old man like myself, I added a stipulation to my will. If Finn is to inherit everything that is mine, then he must fall in love and marry a woman. I looked at Finn with speculation, acting as if this was the first I'd heard of this. Finn is this true? Nodding he answered, it is true but it's not why I fell in love with you Cecile. His act seemed convincing enough to me. So I nodded my head then looked at Richard. I do believe that he loves me Richard. And I love him. I didn't agree to marry him for any other reason than love. It was a lie but I felt that I pulled it off. That is good to hear, Richard said. I haven't been the best role model for my son. That said, I hired a professional marriage counselor to draw up this policy. Since I have no idea what a good and healthy relationship consists of, let alone a lifelong marriage, I went to an expert. I want to give you both the best possible chance of having not only a lasting marriage, but a happy one as well. That's nice of you, I said. Isn't that nice of him, Finn? Well, it would be if he wasn't calling it an order. An order it must be. I've little time, you know. But I want to see this marriage come to fruition before my time here is done. Since I have no idea when that will be, I must issue this as an order. Can I ask what sort of things this policy demands? I asked. I haven't read it. I'm leaving that up to the two of you. I'm not the one who has to do these things and I felt that it would be an invasion of your relationship if I knew the intimate details that must be in something of this nature. Intimate? I hated the sound of that. As in the sense that there are intimate things that we must do in that policy. I'm sure there are. This is a marriage we're talking about, after all. Intimacy is inherent to a healthy marriage. Even I know that, Richard said. Finn looked at me with pure fear in his eyes, as he knew I would never consent to anything more intimate than what we'd already done. And I wouldn't consent to doing those things very often. She's a good woman, Richard. What if she's uncomfortable with some of the things outlined in the policy? Can we make changes if that's the case? No, he spoke his answer softly but as stern as answers come. The policy will stand as it has been written. Agree to all of it, or none of it. But accept the consequences of your actions. I felt that he had to understand what sort of pressure he was putting on me. I must tell you, Richard, that I am feeling an unfair amount of pressure to agree to this policy before even reading it, only because I don't want to be the one to turn Finn Murphy into a penniless man. A thing you will learn as you age is that the word fair has no place in our language. Life is not fair. You will learn to deal with that, he let me know. Finn squeezed my hand. I don't want you to feel pressured into anything, Cecile. If you can't agree to anything in that policy, then so be it. I will accept the consequences. If I'm not going to inherit my father's fortune, then I might as well begin dealing with that now. If that's the way things have to be. I had no idea if Finn actually meant what he'd said, or had just spoken the words to sound heroic. But I like that he'd said it nonetheless. Thank you for understanding, Finn. I love that about you. His eyes softened. I love how understanding you are too, Anam Kara. Caressing his cheek, I couldn't help the way my heart melted inside my chest. Mo Gare, I'm sure there is nothing within that policy that I will take offense to. Let's not worry over things that probably won't happen. Spending my life with you is all I want to do. We should tell your father about the decision we made about the wedding date. Finn looked at his father. We'd like to try to get married on the second Saturday of next month. We know that's too soon to have anything really extravagant, but I'm sure something can be thrown together. Read the policy and see if that's something you can do. I'm not sure what's in it. All I know is that someone with years of experience counseling married couples 
has come up with a guideline of what you'll need to help build a solid foundation for a marriage. So, we might not be able to get married in two weeks? I asked, with a fair amount of hope in my heart. I wasn't trying to rush any of this. I have no idea, Richard said. If the policy says there should be a number of days before a couple marries, then you must follow that. I could tell that he was definitely going to be rigid about the damn policy thing. But he'd said that he hadn't read the policy and wasn't going to due to its private nature. So, how would he know if we did or didn't do the things in it anyway? Finn asked, you said that you haven't read the policy, right? I have not read it. If you haven't read it, then how will you know if we're following it? I squeezed his hand tightly as I looked at him with wide eyes. You just screwed this up, goof. We had one thing going for us, and Finn had just given it all up. I wasn't sure if he'd done it on purpose or not. But he'd done it, and now it was obvious. You're right, Richard said as he opened the file and began reading over the papers inside. We sat there for a half hour as he read over the whole thing before closing the folder again. I read nothing in there that's bad. Everything in the policy seems like a great idea to me. And I pray that you both see them that way too. I really wish I would have had this sort of information available to me during my younger years. It might have stoked me to let someone into my heart and not just into my bed. There are nothing but good things in here. He tapped the file, smiling away at us as if we should be overjoyed with the news. But it wasn't up to Richard or anyone else to decide what they thought would be good for us. I'm glad that you like what's written there, Richard. And I understand that you feel like you must do this for Finn to have something that you have never had. But how can you sit there and act as if what you're doing is anything less than extortion? Finn gave my hand a hard squeeze. Let's not go there, Cecile. Extortion? Richard asked. Yes. You want Finn to do something, or you'll take everything away. That's extortion. I wasn't going to sit there and take whatever Richard decided to dish out. See it any way you wish, Cecile, Richard said. This is inevitably between my son and myself, and that is all. Of course, he needs you to agree to this or he'll lose everything this very day but that really has nothing to do with you. If you truly love my son, you'll marry him whether he has money or not. Isn't that right? A part of me wanted to grab Finn and marry him that very minute. I had never felt so much empathy for anyone in my life. What his father was doing to him was unconscionable. I will marry Finn no matter what. At that very moment, I meant it. No wonder Finn has the issues he has, with parents like Richard and Priscilla. I would hope so, Richard said. You have also never been in love, Cecile. This will help you to understand what a healthy relationship is about, too. Think of this as my gift to your marriage and future family. How can he be so cold and calculating, and yet charming at the very same time? Finn we took the file to the place I found the most comfort in, the sunroom. Sitting cross-legged on the floor in front of each other, I read the policies to Cecile. Be kind to each other above all else. She nodded. Aren't we all ready? I think so. That was only the first of the rules of a good marriage that we had to adhere to. Argue constructively, without using harsh language or speaking above a normal voice level. I mean we don't really argue, she said. Ah, but that time I asked you about me going out to find someone to hook up with so that we could test your theory of why our sparks are so hot, you shouted, I reminded her. Well that's just me. How am I supposed to control the level of my voice at all times, she asked with a frown. That's going to be impossible. Looking the rule over I pointed out, it doesn't say that we have to always speak that way. Only when having an argument. And that wasn't really an argument. I was baiting you to see if you would get jealous. Her brow furrowed. You were? Yes I was. And you were. I grinned cheekily. Anyway, let's move on. 
The next one says that mutual respect must be maintained. I respect you. And I respect you too. So that one will also be easy. I scan the page, finding nothing bad on it. Most of the things here are common sense. Respect each other. Listen to each other. Give both parties their turn to speak. Be as courteous to your spouse as you would be with a stranger. Simple things really. Is it bad that I'm just super opposed to this on a human level? She asked. Like you are a grown man Finn. No one should be telling you what to do. At least not to this extent. I know he means well, but this isn't healthy. And he seems to be all about having healthy relationships. It's not that I disagree with you, but what can I do about it other than walk away from all this? I open my arms to gesture to the place around us. The money, the house, the cars, even the work. How can I walk away and leave all this behind? Really tell me because I don't know how I can do that. She looked down, seemingly contemplating my very serious question. Finally, after a few minutes she looked up saying, I can't imagine what this has done to you Finn. It breaks my heart, in a way. To have it all, then suddenly have nothing, would scare the shit out of even the bravest person. So, you don't have any ideas either, is what I'm getting from you. Her hand on mine had me looking at it. The only thing I want you to know, is that I won't turn my back on you. If something happens and he disinherits you, then you and I will figure things out together. I have some money saved, thanks to you letting me live here. We could get a place together, and I could cover the bills until you got a paying job, and could contribute. You can trust me, Finn. If you decide that you just don't want to do this fake marriage thing any longer, all you have to do is say the word and we'll let him know. Then you and I will leave together. You're not alone, and as long as I'm alive, you never will be. Thank you, Cecile. I truly appreciate you saying that. Tears clouded my eyes as my heart swelled. I had no idea what to say to her. And then I saw something on the paper in my hands. Loyalty to each other is as important as air is to your lungs. Her smile lit me up. We've got that going on, don't we? We do have that, Anamkara. Cecile and I had more going for us than I'd even realized. Seems like the things this marriage counselor thinks are important in a lasting relationship are things we have naturally. Not much faking going on there, huh? We do get along well, she agreed. I've always felt that you and I have had a healthy friendship. What else does it say? She leaned over to look at the page that I held. It's like we're scoring 100% so far. I'm all into making good grades. We've aced the first part but now let's check out the second part. I read on. Setting boundaries is important. You are good at that, I teased her. I am good at that. What are your boundaries though, she asked with a knowing grin. I draw the line at tickling. But that's about it. We laughed as she took the paper away from me and read the next part. Speaking openly about what you want in the future is important. The number of children you would like to have, or if you don't wish to have children at all, Whatever it is, you must listen to each other and be able to come to a mutual agreement. I've never thought about having kids, I said. Well, I know I want them. I mean, I'm not opposed to kids. I haven't spent like any time with them though. Well, our marriage won't be real, so I would say that there would be no way we'd be bringing children into it since it will eventually end. She huffed. See, this thing isn't going to be easy for us to sign. We cannot have kids. Then we'll just agree not to have kids, Cecile. This will still work. But it's not true. I do want children. Well, we can say that we want them, and when none come, we say it's a fertility issue. It was a good idea. And when your father says that we must adopt, then what, she asked. Okay, we'll just say we don't want kids. You can lie about that. You're lying about so many other things, so what's one more lie? I asked. Pinching the bridge of her nose, she seemed irritated. One more lie is a lot when you have a list of them that gets longer each day. You're exaggerating. The list doesn't grow longer each day. We're telling a handful of them, is all. 
and one more can't hurt. So we're agreed, no kids. She looked at the paper. Well, at least if we agree not to have kids, we can skip a bunch of these things. We won't have to worry about what kind of education we want our children to have. We won't have to agree on the doctors we want our children to see. How to discipline the kids won't be something we have to figure out either. So, we'd be getting rid of a lot by getting rid of the kids. A tiny stabbing pain shot through my heart. Yeah, but we'd make some adorable kids, wouldn't we? Cocking her head, she looked at me with a deadpan expression. Do you honestly think you've got it in you to be a good father? I don't know. You hate commitments, Finn. Becoming a parent is even more of a commitment than getting married. You can divorce your spouse, but you can't get rid of your kid. Yeah, I know. But I'm just saying that the thought of seeing a little version of the two of us does something to me. I can't explain it. It's just like, you know, it's interesting to me. Well, it's not going to happen. She ran her finger down the page then stopped. Pets are next. It says that they must be discussed and agreed upon before either party brings one home. She looked at me. So, are you a dog guy? I am a no pets kind of guy. We've never had any, so it's not like I know how to take care of one. But if you want one, I guess the staff would see to it. I'll leave that up to you. Well, I'm not sure if that means we've agreed on that or not. I'm not exactly a pet person either. But I would like to keep that option open. I agree to keep that option open and discuss with you if I ever get a hankering for a pet. Okay, me too. She moved her finger down the sheet then said, It says that 50-50 relationships last longer than when one has more power than the other. Presenting a united front in all cases is key to becoming a powerful couple. Everyone's strengths will be brought to the surface when each partner uplifts the other and combines their skills, using them as one. I believe in 50-50, I suppose. I've never thought about it, but that sounds fair to me. Unlike my father, I believe there is fairness in the world. Maybe it can't be fair all the time, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for it. I agree with you on that. So far so good Finn. She raised her hand for a high five, and I gave her one. Money issues are common with any couple, and disagreements will come up, but how you deal with them is key. Both parties must agree on expenditures of anything over $100, which may sound like a low amount, but it is not. We could get into hot water with that one, I said. I've never thought about the price of anything. Well, if you do lose your inheritance and end up living with me in a tiny apartment, sharing my old car and living on a strict budget, you will need to adhere to this very important rule. You're right, I agreed. Another one we agree on. I will always consult with you on purchases over 100 bucks. And I will do the same with you. She ran her hand over my cheek as she gazed at me. I really do mean what I said, Finn. If you lose it all, you'll still have me. Taking her hand, I held it to my face. I believe you, Cecile. Good. Her smile did things to my heart. It made it feel as if it were flying around inside my chest, the way an eagle soars through the vast blue sky. So let's get back to this thing. So far, it seems that we'll be able to comply with all of it. The smile she wore quickly disappeared as she read the next part. I took the paper from her, reading it myself. Sleeping together, as well as physical intimacy between married couples, is extremely important. If there are problems with intimacy, the marriage may be doomed. It's important to know whether you are compatible with the person you want to marry. While a couple may have loads of things in common and agree about most things, the relationship will fracture, and problems will arise if they have incompatibilities in the bedroom. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that any couple thinking about marriage begin to assess whether they are physically compatible. If there are problems in the bedroom, ditch the marriage idea and accept that you are better off as friends. Oh damn, she whispered. Yeah. Oh damn, I agreed. This is too much to ask of you. Yeah, it is. We can't sign this. It began to resonate within me that I was going to lose my life that day. 
nothing would ever be the same for me again. I didn't blame Cecile for that, either. I couldn't blame her. She was right about not wanting to sleep with me. She knew her weaknesses, and bad boys were one of them. I had to try something, though. Cecile, what if I wasn't a womanizer anymore? What would you think of me then? That would take years to find out, Finn. She huffed and threw her hands into the air. And for all I know, if you turned into some good guy, I probably wouldn't even be attracted to you anymore. Well then accept that about yourself and accept me for who I am. I do accept you for who you are, Finn. I always have. That's why we get along so well. I have never expected you to change. But what if I did change? Then what? I needed to know. I felt different with Cecile. I felt like I was changing. How can I know that for sure, she asked. All I know is that right now, I don't trust you not to hurt me. I adore you. I always will. I love you as a person. I love many things about you. And I can feel you in my heart in ways I can't feel anyone in the entire world. But there is this thing, like a truth in my mind about you. The fact that I will end up hurting you if you let yourself have real feelings for me. I knew what she meant. And what about me, Cecile? Do you think that I'm not catching real feelings for you? If you are, I would beg you to stop catching those feelings, because I will not return them. I'm being honest with you. I can't trust you with my heart. Nodding, I understood where she was coming from. She'd seen me in action for years, after all. She would be an idiot, to think I was capable of changing my behavior entirely. Sure, I could go a few months without finding some random woman to take care of my needs. But how much longer could I hold out? You're right. You agree? Why wouldn't I agree with you, Cecile? I have shown you my true colors. I'm not a man that can be trusted. Looking at me with a frown, she sighed. Look, we don't have to talk about this. We'll just lie and say that we're sleeping together. We'll just lie about the things we have to. Unless you decide that you don't want to lie anymore. That's up to you. I love that you'll help me out, until I can help myself if I decide I want to tell my father the truth. But right now the truth is this, I adore you, but I don't want to marry you. Not for real. Because the woman I will really marry one day, will not only love me, but be able to trust me as well. I wish that for you Finn. I truly do. Her hand on my cheek left me smoldering for her. Not that I was going to tell her that. Who knows who that woman will be. I know she'll be special, she whispered. Yeah, I know that too. Taking her hand off my cheek, I held it up to my lips then kissed it. So, we'll just have to make things seem as real as we can. And I've got an idea that should make my father and everyone else around us think that we're seeing how compatible we are. And believe me when I say that we are going to be extremely compatible. Her lower lip quivered as she asked, and how are we going to do all that? Sadly, not the way I really want to at all. So see you. In the end, we signed the policy that would have us not only being intimate, but also sleeping together to make sure we were compatible sleepers. I don't know how we're going to do this, I said to myself, as I pulled a nightgown and a fresh pair of underwear from the drawer before going to shower. We'd given Finn's father the signed contract, and told him that we were going to follow all the guidelines and the policy he'd given to us. While I wouldn't be moving into Finn's bedroom yet, we would be spending at least a couple of nights a week either in his room or in mine. For our first night together, we'd chosen to spend it in Finn's room. I wasn't sure what his plan was for us to make everyone think we were being intimate, but the thoughts that came to me were pretty bad ones. After showering, I dressed in my nightgown, then put on a robe and slippers before going across the hall to his room. Finn was coming out of his door, wearing nothing but pajama bottoms, just as I was about to knock. Oh, I was coming to get you, Cecile. A soft creaking sound had us both looking down the hall toward his father's room and we found him closing the door. 
it was as if he'd been waiting there to make sure we did what we told him we would do. Finn sighed and pulled me inside. That's annoying. Agreed. I pulled the robe tighter around my body. If you want to tell him the truth right now, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. We could go get a hotel room for the night. He laughed. That we would be sharing anyway. So why not spend the night here instead since telling him the truth wouldn't change much, except that I'd be broke. You're right. I had to stop getting so offended by the insane things his father was doing. But honestly Finn, you can't let him do this to you. For now, I'll go along with it. I mean, this will affect you too at this point. We'll both be out on the street. We'll be fine. But I didn't need to make that decision for him. I will let you handle this thing with your father. Unlike him, I do believe that you have the mental capacity to make your own decisions. Thank you very much. He leaned back on the door so hard that it made a thumping sound. I looked at him with a quizzical expression. Was that on purpose? He made a couple more bumps to the door. I'm making it sound like I'm slamming your body up against the door, and then you're spinning around and shoving me against it as you are all up on me. Oh, I said as my cheeks heated. Nice. Right? He moved to the bed then threw himself onto it making the mattress squeak a little. Sitting up, he patted the bed next to him. Come on let's make some noise. Follow my lead. He made some noises. Yeah girl. That's the spot. I wasn't as into it as he seemed to be. He had to cover his mouth as he laughed. What the hell? I looked at him with wide eyes and whispered, I don't know how to do this. You've done it before, Cecile. Yeah, but never faked it. I feel stupid. Well, you sounded stupid. Come on, just bounce and keep doing that kind of thing. I'll try. I did as he told me. I kept wanting to laugh, then having to roll onto my stomach to try and muffle the sounds when I couldn't stop myself. Oh my, I said into the blanket. This is so ridiculous. Yeah, he shouted, but it wasn't like he was agreeing with me. He patted me on the chest. Pant. That was really awkward. Leaning up on his elbow, he said. We could try it for real if you want. Getting up I walked toward the bathroom. I'm going to go throw up. He ran up behind me. No one really heard all that, you know. These walls are thick as hell. I just thought it would be funny. Slamming my fist into his muscular bicep I screeched, you jerk. Hey, no shouting when we argue remember? Wrapping his arms around me, he picked me up, letting my feet dangle in midair. We're not arguing. And what may I ask are you doing carrying me around? I don't know. He held me there for a moment, our faces much too close. So this sleeping together thing. Yeah. I nodded. Probably gonna be sort of rough. Placing my feet back on the floor, he let me go. So we can do it like this. I'll sleep on the sofa in the living area, and you take the bed. Great idea. I headed back toward the bed. Do you think you can run into my room and grab the book I've got on the table in there? Or he jumped on the bed beside me. You and I can find something on television to watch while we cuddle on the sofa. Or you can just get my book, and I'll read here in the bedroom while you watch television in the living area of your suite. You still have your robe on, Cecile, he pointed out. You can't sleep like that. Pulling it closed I said, I think that I can. Or maybe I'll take it off after you leave the room. I've seen you in a two-piece bathing suit. Remember the weekly water park visits we'd make when it opened in May each year? He leaned his head on the palm of his hand, resting his weight on his elbow. Yes. What I don't know is what that has to do with anything. I've basically seen you in your underwear. So lose the robe. He gestured to his bare chest. I'm not being overly weird about this, and neither should you. Weird? I asked. Overly weird. Look, it's obvious that you enjoy showing off your body. But I'm a lot more modest than I used to be when I was super fit and in my early twenties. You're still fit. 
I just think that being in a state of undress while I'm this close to you is sort of dangerous. Like you're afraid that I'll pounce on you and steal all your yummy kisses. He laughed and leaned in closer. Exactly. I put my hand on his chest, keeping him at bay. Down boy. Turning away from me, he lay on his back, hands behind his head. Wanna run your hands over my muscles? Wanna stop trying to tempt me? I got out of bed to get my book. He sat up quickly. Don't go. I'm coming right back. I'm just going to get my book. I left his suite and went to mine. When I came back out, I saw Richard's new nurse coming up the stairs. Oh Hans, I said. How are you doing this evening? I pulled the neck of my robe tight to be sure nothing was exposed. I am doing well, thank you for asking. Just going in to check Mr. Murphy's vitals. He looked at the door I was about to go into, then back at me. You know, Mr. Murphy worries about his son very much. That's not good for his heart. Yes, I'm sure it's not. But maybe Richard shouldn't worry so much about Finn. It's not healthy. Perhaps you can make him understand that trying to live vicariously through Finn is a bad idea. The control he's exercising where Finn's life is concerned is off the charts and concerning. Furrowed brows showed me that he was concerned with what I'd said. What are you talking about? He crossed his arms over his massive chest. The man resembled a bodybuilder more than a nurse. He's holding Finn's inheritance over his head. Before we started dating, Richard put a stipulation in his will saying that if Finn didn't find someone and fall in love and get married within like two years, then he'd get nothing at all and end up penniless with nowhere to live. He did what? And there's more. He's just added this policy thingy that Finn and I had to sign, or he was going to disinherit Finn this very day. I mean, we signed it and all, but don't you think this is a lot for a man with heart problems to be doing and thinking about? I certainly do. But more than that, this speaks of his mental health. I will deal with this. I'll set up an appointment with a neurologist. This could be a sign of dementia or Alzheimer's. Do you happen to know if he's ever been controlling with his son in the past? I don't think so. I mean, he's let him be as free as a bird his whole life. And now that he's old and alone, he seems like he'll do anything and everything he can to make Finn find someone who won't end up that way. Of course, I don't want to see Finn end up that way either, but he shouldn't be forced to do anything. So, you don't want to marry Finn? No, I do want to marry him. I couldn't let anyone think otherwise, or Finn could end up broke. I just don't think this extortion thing is good for either of them, is all I'm saying. Richard shouldn't be thinking up ways to make Finn jump through hoops to live a life he's missed out on. That's really what's happening here. Richard wants to see his son live a life he never allowed himself to lead. I will see what I can do about determining his state of mind. If he's deemed incompetent, then whatever this stipulation to the will was can be revoked. That would be the best thing to happen. I know Richard loves his son and only wants what's best for him. But making him marry someone, even someone he is in love with, isn't the right thing to do. We need to be able to move at a pace that works for us. Richard just wants to see his son married, and probably with a grandchild or two before he passes away. And it's okay that he would like to see those things. But what's not okay, is that he's using such tremendous threats to make sure that happens. You're right. Thank you for telling me. I will keep our discussion confidential. Will you? Of course I will. I'm not telling a soul what I just told you. And thanks for understanding the importance of keeping this between us. Don't even tell Finn I told you. I would never do that. Thank you. I heard the door to Finn's room open, and he looked out at us. I was wondering what was taking you so long. But I see you found Sven. Hans, he corrected him. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to mess your name up, Hans. Finn reached around Hans and took my hand. Sometimes it takes me a while to get a name down. No offense. None taken. Good night. I went into the room with Finn as Hans walked away, and I wondered if I'd done the right thing. Guilt, 
had already begun to grow inside of me over the secret I knew I had to keep. Finn pulled me along with him to the bed. So I fixed up the bed so that we can both sleep in it without doing much touching at all. He had put a sleeping bag on one side of the bed. I'll sleep in that. Or you can. Either way, one of us will be wrapped up tighter than a pea in a pod, while the other is safely tucked away under the blankets. That sounds good to me. I wasn't going to argue with him over that. Not when I'd said so much to his father's nurse. I didn't want Finn to be railroaded into anything, but he didn't seem capable of standing up to his father. I hope I haven't screwed anything up. Finn I'd expected Cecile to balk at my sleeping in the same bed as her, but surprisingly, she readily agreed to it. Well, that was easy. Pulling off her robe, she tossed it onto a nearby chair before climbing under the blankets, book in hand. She settled back on the mound of pillows, preparing to read. Night, Finn. I was not sleepy. So I moved to lie right next to her. What's this book about? I leaned my head on her shoulder. It's a mystery thriller about government cover-ups and the space program. Sounds interesting. You want to read along with me? Sure. Okay, I'm a fast reader, so you let me know when you've gotten to the end of the page, and then I'll turn. Opening the book, she flipped through the first few pages to get to the first chapter. I read the first line out loud. Agent Duran sped through the red light at the intersection, narrowly avoiding a school bus full of children, as he followed the lights above that no one else seemed to be able to see. Her hair tickled my nose, so I pushed it to the side. I think this guy is delusional. What's your take on him? I think I'll read a few more pages before I go casting doubt on the hero of the story. See, you've got depth. I tend to make quick judgments. You're right, though. Let's give this guy a little more time before we go making assumptions about him. Maybe he's some sort of wizard who can see things others can't. Nuzzling her neck, I inhaled her scent. Um, I like the smell of the shampoo you're using. What is it? The store brand, Almond Vanilla. And thanks. She wiggled a little as I took another sniff. Finn stopped doing that. What? I nuzzled her neck, breathing the warm air behind her ear. This shouldn't bother you. Well it is bothering me, so quit. Okay I'll stop. Trailing my fingertips along her arm, I looked at the next sentence. When the engine to Duran's car suddenly shut off, he was left skidding along the roadway, as the lights disappeared into the morning sky. Damn he said Cecile took over. Not again. So this guy keeps seeing these lights, then his car shuts off and the lights disappear, I said. I'm still going to go with him being delusional. Main characters aren't usually simply delusional, Finn. Think about it. Why would this writer be telling a story about a man who has gone crazy, when he could be telling a story about this being a special man who saves the world? So, you think this guy who chases after lights in the sky with a car can actually save the world? I laughed. He can't. Not if he's going to use a car to chase something in the sky. He needs a plane, at the very least, if he's going to have a chance in hell of accomplishing that feat. Maybe he gets one later in the story. We'll never find out if we don't keep reading, right? She looked at my hand, which was still moving up and down her arm. Will you stop doing that? How is this bothering you? I asked with a grin. It should just feel comforting. Unless you have the hots for me the way I do for you. Finn, it does not feel comforting at all. I continued to lightly trail my fingertips along her arm. What does it feel like then? I pressed my lips against her neck. She inhaled deeply as goosebumps rose on her flesh. Finn, you're making me crazy. Yeah, I know. I wanted her. I needed her. And I was done playing this game of cat and mouse. Cecile, I can't wait any longer. Finn, stop. Do you really want me to stop? We can't do this. You know that. Cecile, where am I going? I've been right here. I'm going to marry you. This doesn't have to be fake. 
I'm ready to make this real. You would say anything you can think of to get me to do what you want, she whispered with fear threading through her voice. You don't want this. I knew she did. She wanted it as much as I did. Your heart is pounding so hard I can practically hear it. Your skin is on fire, and your breathing is different too. I am only human, Finn. I'm not going to leave you or try to get rid of you. You can trust me. I want you around. I love having you here with me like this. I don't want it to end. I'm tired of fighting this thing we have going on between us. Aren't you? You don't have to lie to me. I had never been more honest about anything in my life. Cecile, I am not lying. Let's make this real. Let's make this work. I don't want to be alone anymore. I want you. I want you forever. Just words, Finn. She turned her face toward mine, and I saw the fear in her eyes. What about my actions? I've been right here. I haven't gone out at all. I wait all week for you to have time for me. I sit here and wait for you to come home just to be able to spend an hour or so with you until you go to your room. What more can I do to prove to you that I'll be faithful? I won't hurt you. Don't act like you're doing that for me, when you know that you're only doing it to stay in your father's good graces. If you fall out of them, you'll lose everything. That's the reason why you sit home. It's not for me. You're wrong. I kissed her forehead. It started out that way, but it's been about you for the last couple of weeks. All about you, Cecile. I'm afraid. I know you are. You don't need to be afraid of me. You can trust me. We can be whatever we want to be. What is it that you want us to be, Cecile? I'm not sure. Well, I am sure that I want to be with you and only you. I've never been more certain of anything. Let's make this real. My world had only just begun. The past grew more and more distant with each embrace, each kiss. The faces of all those who had come before her faded quickly away, leaving only Cecile's face in my mind and memory. Our time had finally come, and now that it had, it was going to last forever. I knew that without any doubt. The man she had thought incapable of change, had done the unimaginable. This leopard has changed his spots. You have all the right moves. Taking her sweet mouth, I knew that I could spend the rest of my life with her now. I knew that we were meant for each other. Neither of us might have known that when we first saw each other all those years ago, but at least I knew it now. Wrenching my mouth away from hers, I kissed my way to her ear then whispered, I love you. I had never told any woman those three little words before. When she didn't say them right back, I pulled back to look at her. Her eyes rapidly moved back and forth as fear filled them. Do you really mean that? I have never said those words to any woman, Cecile. So you tell me what you think. I want to believe you. You should believe me because I'm telling you the truth. I love you. For the longest time she just stared into my eyes before saying, My gosh, Finn. I love you too. Breathing a sigh of relief, I said, I thought you were going to leave me hanging there for a while. And you were the one who was afraid that I would rip your heart to shreds. I'm acutely aware of what you've been talking about now. If you had rejected me, I think I would have just rolled off you and died. You're more fragile than I thought you were. She laughed as she took my face in her hands. Kiss me. Quick to do as she demanded, I kissed her, feeling elated for the very first time in my life. With not a care in the world save caring for her, I finally knew what life was meant to be. Life was meant to be shared with someone. Life was meant to teach us how to give ourselves to someone else and to allow them into our hearts. My heart had never felt freer than at that moment. Weightless, no worries, thinking of nothing more than sharing myself with her, I made love to the only woman I had ever loved. The woman who was sure to change my life in so many ways, it was nearly unimaginable to me. I had never been happier with my father. If it weren't for his archaic demands, then I wouldn't have ever found this thing called love. I would still be in the clubs, searching for Ms. Wright now and thinking nothing of Mrs. Wright. Cecile was my Mrs. Wright. 
and soon I would legally make her just that. She had already taken me for richer or poorer. She'd already been there for me during dark times. And now she would be there with me through all the rest of what life threw at us. And I would be there for her as well. You will want for nothing, I whispered in her ear. I will give you the moon if that's what you desire. I will shower you with gifts the likes of which you have never known. I will spoil you and pamper you and love you more than you knew you could ever be loved. I just want you, Finn. Nothing else. Just you. Wrapping her arms around me, she held me tight. Only you. Her lips found mine and she kissed me with the taste of salty tears. I knew the tears were joyous ones. She'd found love for the first time too. Even I wanted to cry. But men don't cry, so I kept the tears of happiness at bay. When our bodies could take no more, only then did I feel the need for sleep. But I didn't want to let her go, so I held her tight as she lay on my chest. This is only the beginning for us, Cecile. I hope you're right. I am right. Kissing the top of her head, I knew she was still having doubts about me. I'm going to prove that to you each and every day. Soft snores met my ears as she'd already drifted off to sleep. Holding her that way, listening to her breath as it moved in a steady rhythm, I felt whole. I hadn't even known that I had been feeling hollow, but now I knew that's how I'd felt before. I'd never understood the term making love until that night with her. My hopes were that we would be making love for the rest of our lives. Making love, making memories, and making each other happy. It was all I could think about as I began falling under slumber's spell. Just as my eyes closed, I thought about something we'd talked about earlier that day. Having children. Now I knew I wanted to have them. What's happened to me? I thought as I drifted to sleep with a smile on my face. Cecile a warm form lay behind mine, spooning my body. A brief smile moved my lips until I remembered what I had done. Why did I do that? I'd had slept with Finn Murphy, a lifelong bad boy. What's wrong with me? Easing out of bed, I crept toward my nightgown that lay in a heap on the floor. I'd made the biggest mistake of my life and had ruined everything. I told Finn that I loved him. Which wasn't a lie but it was sure to run him off like a wildfire was chasing him. How could I not have fallen in love with the man? I cared for him so deeply that it hurt. And when he inevitably ended things with me, it would break me in ways he couldn't even begin to understand. I called my mother, knowing that I had to get out of Finn's home and to some place where he couldn't find me. It's very early, Cecile, she said as she answered the phone. Are you okay? Not really. I've done something very stupid, and I need to get out of here. Finally. I'm glad you've made the right decision. Pack your things and come here. You can stay with us until you find yourself another apartment. I told you not to let go of the one you had, but you had to be stubborn about it. So, what happened to make you come to your senses? I don't want to talk about it. I moved around as fast as I could gathering my things and packing them up in the suitcases I'd brought them over in. And why is that, she asked. Did his father figure you two out, or what? No, he didn't figure us out. I suppose he will with my leaving, though. Stopping as I thought about Finn losing everything, I felt like I might faint. Mom, Finn will be homeless with no money if I leave. He's probably got money stashed away that his father doesn't know about. He's not an idiot, from what you've told me. Just a ruthless womanizer, but not a fool. I'm sure he's got friends he can go and stay with. She had to be right about that. I guess you're right. But I'd promised Finn that he and I would leave there together if his father went through with disinheriting him. Now I was going to leave, which meant that might well happen to him. But I wouldn't be there for him after all. I am right, Mom said. Mom, I made Finn a promise, though. Who cares? Mom, you're so mean. He's not a bad guy. He's not. Oh, so lying to one's father is not grounds for being a bad guy? I beg to differ. 
Sure, Finn should have stood up to his father right from the start. But lying to the man who was extorting him wasn't such a bad thing. Mom, what about what his father is doing to him? That's bad too. Yes, they're both very bad men, and you should want nothing to do with either of them. Well, Richard isn't doing it to be mean. He really cares about Finn. He wants to see him happy. I mean, is he going about it the wrong way? Yes, of course. But maybe he's not mentally stable right now, and that might be the reason why he's gone to such drastic measures to make Finn do what he thinks is best for him. Whatever his reasons are, it's none of your concern. They are not your family, Cecile. No, I know that, Mom. But I did talk to Richard's new nurse and told him about what he's doing to Finn. His nurse is going to take him to see a neurologist to see if he's having any problems with his brain that would have him doing something so out of character. And if that's the case, then the stipulations he's made to his will are void. You're talking like this is something that concerns you. None of that should matter to you anyway. The relationship you have with Finn is a sham. A lie, Cecile. He's using you to keep his money, and nothing more than that. Well, I did volunteer to do this. He didn't ask me to do it. So technically? Technically nothing, she interrupted sharply. You should know that your father and I have been discussing this a lot. We have decided that if you won't come to your senses on your own and stop this nonsense, then we will tell Richard Murphy what you and his son have been doing. No, Mom. I had never regretted telling my parents the truth about what Finn and I were doing more than I did at that very moment. This has nothing to do with you. You and Dad need to mind your own business. You are scamming an old man, and that is not how I raised you. Mom, you cannot tell him anything. Finn will lose it all if you do that. I can't be responsible for that happening to him. Then come home. Stop worrying about those two and just come home. If you do that, nothing will be your fault when whatever happens happens. I didn't like being blackmailed and let her know. Look, I'm not about to just let you tell me what to do. Can't you see that you're doing the same damn thing Richard is doing? You're blackmailing me into leaving Finn. Leave him or you'll ruin his life. That's not cool in any way. I never thought in a million years that you and Dad would stoop to something this low. Well, we're worried about you. We don't want to see you get hurt, is all. And then it all clicked into place. My mother had been a helicopter mom, and my father had been there to enforce her parenting practice. If I'd ever strayed away from the path, mom would be there, arms in my bubble, ushering me back onto the path as my father would say, Cecile, you must stay on the sidewalk or something bad might happen to you. Mom, you and Dad are the reason why I've sought out bad boys my entire life. The hell we are, she screeched at me. Cecile, you have always been a tenacious child, and you grew into an even more tenacious adult. I would give you one rule, and you would inevitably go against it. Do you remember all those times I would take you to the park and tell you that you couldn't get your clothes dirty? You could swing but not play on the slide, because you might fly off it and land on your bottom and get the back of your shorts all dirty. Still, you would try your best to get to that damn slide. It took me being constantly right next to you to make sure you didn't get on it and... And do what? I interrupted. Get my clothes dirty? Wow. My clothes can't be washed, Mom. You held me back so much that it made me afraid of everything while yearning for danger in my life. Every life needs a little danger in it. It makes things interesting. Danger is a bad word, Cecile. Putting yourself in danger is a stupid thing to do. And I didn't just worry about you getting dirty if you fell off the slide. I worried about you getting hurt too. One time, when you were two, we were walking down the sidewalk and you took off running for no reason whatsoever. You fell and skinned both of your knees. I had to take you straight home to clean and bandage you up. I hated hearing you cry like that. And that's when I decided that you had to be watched much more closely. I'm not going to argue with you, Mom. You think you did all the right things. But the thing is that what you did made me who I am today. A woman who seeks out danger 
but once I find it, I'm so afraid of it that I never test the waters. Finn told me that he loves me, Mom. I haven't wanted to believe him, but now I have to wonder if I should believe him. Have you gone insane? Has spending so much time with a man like Finn done something to your brain? She shouted at me. Mom, we haven't even spent that much time together. We spent more time together in college than we have recently. He's not the same guy the first knew back then though. He's, well he's better than he was back then. He's a man now. And he's hurting. His father is putting such intense pressure on him. Plus his father's health isn't the best, and that's getting to him too. He's only using you to get through all this. Can't you see that? He's using you to be able to keep his money. He's using you for comfort, so that he can get through this time with his father's poor health. He will keep using you as long as you let him, Cecile. He uses people. That is what he does. I wanted to tell her that she was wrong, dead wrong. But the thing was that Finn had never done a damn thing for himself. He had been born into wealth. He had lived the life of a rich kid. His father had footed the bill for anything and everything Finn had ever needed or wanted, not to mention the things his father decided he wanted him to have. The college education wasn't even something Finn had wished for. His father had wanted that for him. If Finn hadn't had the near-genius brain God had given him, I highly doubted that he would have agreed to go to college at all. Those days were nothing for him. Other students had had it much harder. He'd had fun. He'd had no worries. He'd had no problems with his classes. Finn was probably the epitome of a spoiled rich kid. But the thing about Finn was that he was more than that. If you gave him a chance to be. Mom, do you honestly believe that he's only using me? I mean, you need to think about this. Dad's mom died. He leaned on you hard and heavy during all that. He needed you. He was so distraught that you had to make all the funeral arrangements while he sat silent in his chair. And you kept bringing him food that he ate a bite or two of. You did that because you love and care about him and knew that he was going through a hard time. We love each other, she emphasized. I think that we love each other too, I whispered, finally saying it out loud. You are making this harder than it has to be. She sighed heavily before going on. Look, the thing is that you've always had poor judgment where the male gender is concerned. If you were just some money-grubbing hussy, I would say go for it. Get all you can from this rich boy. Marry him. Then when the shit hits the fan, leave him and take most of everything he owns. You're not that type of person though. I do love you. I don't want to see you hurt. He. Will. Hurt. You. Mark my word, Cecile. This will only end with your heart breaking. He will be more than fine. Don't do this. Don't make us tell his father what you two have been doing. My mother had never really listened to me. I had no idea why I thought that she would now. And I had no idea what I was going to do now that I knew what she was prepared to do. I couldn't let Finn lose it all just because I'd had the bad judgment of telling my parents the truth in the first place. I wasn't even sure if the truth would work now, but I had to try. Mom, I love him. No, you don't. I do. Cecile, think about this. He's charismatic. He's great looking. He is well built. What he is not is marriage material. He is a ladies' man. He is a rogue. He is what we used to call a good time Charlie. He is no one you want to be connected to or have children with. I thought about what Finn had said when we were reading the policy his father had made us read. He'd said that our kids would be adorable. And I had to agree on that point. Our kids would be cute. And in the end, your kids would only have a mother to care for them and a father who pays child support. Is that the life you want for your babies? She'd taken the wind out of my sails. I'd called her to ask if I could go stay with her and dad, to get away from the mistake I'd made by making love to Finn. And all she'd done was shove down my throat all that was wrong with us. No, I don't want that at all. Come home, Cecile. Let mama take care of you. 
everything will be all right. But only if you come home. Looking at the window, I watch the sun's glow begin to fill in the bottom of the pale pink curtain. A new day. A new start. And I had to pick which way this Sunday would go. Stay with Finn or go home to Mama and Daddy. Could I trust myself enough to know if Finn was being honest with me? Could I trust myself to know if he was the one I should spend the rest of my life with? Or was he only using me to help him keep the only life he'd ever known? And if I stay? I asked, as I looked around the room that had begun to glow with the sun's light as it rose higher and higher into the sky. Then you will seal your fate as well as Finn's. Your father and I will come to the Murphy Mansion by noon today to tell Richard Murphy what you two have been up to. I was no child. I'd made something of myself. I loved my parents. But the time had come to break the propellers of the helicopter that they had always used to push me back onto the path they thought I had to take. You won't have to do that. I'm going to get dressed, walk down the hall, and tell Richard that myself. I'm staying right where I am. I'm staying with the man who loves me and who I love right back. I love you, Mom. Goodbye. I hope to God that Finn really loves me as much as I love him. Finn Waking to an empty bed was a disappointment. But a smile still found its way to my lips as memories of the night came crashing into my brain. Oh yeah. That was amazing. Figuring that Cecile had gone to her bedroom to shower and get ready for the day, I slipped on my pajama bottoms, rubbing the sleep from my eyes as I went to hopefully join her in the shower. What I walked in on confused me. Why are your suitcases on the bed? Her head jerked as she hadn't realized I was in the room. Oh Finn. I'm putting my clothes away. But they were already put away. You must have packed them. Why would you do that? It felt as if the air was slowly leaking out of my lungs. Were you planning to leave me? Her deer in the headlights expression said it all. I spun around and sprinted out of her room, feeling like I was going to throw up. She ran behind me. Finn, no. I'm not leaving you. I stopped in the middle of the hallway, turning to glare at her. I am not stupid, Cecile. No, I know you're not. It was just that when I woke up this morning, I got scared. She still had on her silky nightgown, but it didn't distract me from the way her shoulders slumped or the frown on her face. I'm sorry. You got scared. I couldn't believe her. And you were going to run away. Instead of talking to me. It's hard for me to know if I can believe a word you've said so far, Cecile. Nodding, she looked at the floor. I know. Slowly her head rose until our eyes met. Do you still love me in the light of day, Finn? What does that even matter when you'll flee any time you think the opposite? I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to lose her, but I also didn't want to wake up one morning to find she'd left just because she doubted my feelings for her. I didn't lie to you last night. Did you lie to me? Shaking her head she whispered, I love you Finn. I just got scared. And to be honest, I've done something that might make you upset with me. A chill ran through me. What did you do? I told your father's new nurse about what he's doing to you, making you get married. He is going to take him to a doctor to see if he's got anything going on with his brain, since this is out of character for your father. You did that without talking to me about it. I wasn't sure how to feel about that, but there was some anger beginning to bubble inside me. Cecile, he's my father. You should have talked to me about that before you said a thing to his nurse. Do you know what can happen if my father takes this the wrong way? He can throw me out any time he wants. Finn, we can't go through with the marriage only to please him and so that you can keep your inheritance. It's not right for you or me. So now you don't want to marry me. The anger began growing by leaps and bounds. Now that we've made love, you don't want to marry me? Damn it, Cecile. Here you were thinking that I would be the one trying to end things after we slept together, and it turns out to be you doing that. That's not it at all, she said, taking my hands. Finn, 
I only want to marry you if that's what we both really want. I don't want either of us to be forced into a marriage. I had to wonder if she clearly understood what we would be giving up if we didn't do what my father wanted. You honestly don't care about the money, do you? I never have. I'll admit that I was afraid of you not wanting anything to do with me, since we've already been intimate together. I don't want you to think that I have ever done that with anyone else, other than with you. I love you. But we can't have this fear coming between us. I agree. After talking to my mother this morning, I figured some things out about myself. And now that I can see things a lot more clearly, I can honestly say that I'm no longer afraid. I'm willing to take a chance on you because I think you not only deserve it, but so do I. If she was willing to take a chance on me, then I needed to step up so that I could be deserving of her love. I've got to go get dressed. There's something I have to do. Go back to your room and finish putting your things away, but only if you're sure that's what you want. I don't want to make you do anything. I only want you to stay with me if that's what you want. I want to stay with you, Finn. She moved closer, taking my hands. She held and ran them around her body, then kissed me softly. I am sorry for letting fear rule me this morning. It will never happen again. I swear that to you. Good. I don't want this to end. I really do love you. I kissed her on the forehead. Go tend to your business, and I'll go tend to mine. Come to my room when you're done doing whatever it is you need to do. I'll be waiting for you. She moved out of my arms and went back into her room, and then I went to shower and dress. A half hour later, I stood in the living area of my father's suite. I was absolutely terrified of what he might say when I told him what I'd gone there to say. But I was willing to take whatever consequences came from my honesty. It was time to step up and become the man Cecile deserved. Knocking on his door I asked, Are you awake? Come in Finn, my father said. Upon entering the room, I found his nurse taking his blood pressure. Hans, can we have some privacy please? Of course. He took the blood pressure cuff off and left the room. My father looked at me with an odd expression. What is so important that you dismissed my nurse? Taking a deep breath, I prepared myself to do something I never thought I'd do. So here it goes. I love Cecile. That's obvious. And she loves me too. Yes, I can tell. But it wasn't always that way. I know that. Did you know that we began this thing as a ruse? Not really. But do go on. We did run into each other at a coffee shop. That part is true. I told her what you'd done with your will, and she volunteered to marry me. Well, she asked me to marry her. And I said yes. But it was all a sham at that point, meant to keep me living the same lifestyle I've always lived. He wore a grim expression. I see. But we've actually fallen in love now. And I know now that she needs me to be a better man than I've been this far. So that's why I'm here now. See, I do want to marry her. I want us to have babies, make a real family. But I don't want to feel forced into that by you or anyone. What I will not allow is for Cecile to feel forced. I want her to marry me because that's what she truly wants. I want her to have my babies because she wants that. I don't want her to have to do anything just because you demand it and will take everything away from me if I don't comply. She doesn't care about the money. And suddenly, I don't either. If you decide to cut me out of my inheritance, then you should know that she and I will leave this place together and make our own way, together. My father's eyes were glued to one spot in front of him, not looking at me, not blinking, nothing. He didn't say a word for a few minutes before looking up at me. You have become more than I ever expected. You have grown substantially in such a small amount of time. And you have done all of that because of love. Yes, it is because of love. He was responsible for me finding love though. I couldn't take credit for that. I do want to thank you for waking me up with the threat of losing everything. Maybe that's exactly what was needed. God knows that I wasn't going to stop my behavior 
on my own. I even want to thank you for giving us that policy to read. We can't follow every little thing in it, but it will serve as a great way to build the platform that our future will be built on. What will you two do for money, Finn? She's got a job, and I can find one. She's got a car, which we can share until I can buy one of my own. She saved up a little money, since she didn't have to pay bills for this month. We'll be okay. Are you sure that this is what you want? He asked with shining eyes. I want to be with her, Richard. Wherever she is, that is where my home will be. We will come to see you often, if you'll allow that. I don't want to lose you. You don't. I do love you. You've always been the best father you could be for me. If you feel you have to take away everything, then I would suppose you have good reason to do that. But please don't take yourself away from me. That would hurt far more than anything else. I love you too, son. I'm glad we can finally say those words to each other. And I pray that you'll live to see your grandchildren someday. Whenever Cecile and I are ready to have them. Me too. His actions told me that he was still going to go through with disinheriting me, so I turned to leave. I'm going to tell Cecile to pack her things, and I'll pack mine. We'll leave within the next few hours. All you have to do is call me whenever you want to see me. Bye, I said, turning to look at him as I added, Dad. I didn't say it to try and manipulate him in any way. I said it only because I wanted to call him by that name. And then I walked out of his room. Slowly, I made my way down the long hallway, then went into Cecile's room to find that she'd put all her things away and was waiting for me in the living area, dressed for the day. Taking her hands, I pulled her up then hugged her tightly, rocking with her. I did it. I told him the truth. And I told him that you and I will be leaving here together today. She looked at me with wide eyes. He said he's still going to cut you out of the will? He didn't say it out loud, but his actions told me that he is. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I've got you, and that's all I really need. Wow. I didn't think you would go through with it. You really have changed, Finn. You helped me find the man who's been hiding inside of me, an Amkara. Mogare, you found the woman who's been hiding inside me as well. I'm glad we ran into each other after all these years. We're going to be fine. You believe that, right? As long as I have you, I will be more than fine. I kissed her softly before letting her go. So, let's get packed up, then we'll get into your little car and go find our places in this world, together. Nothing has ever sounded better than that, Finn. Nothing at all. The next couple of hours were spent packing my things into the luggage I had only ever used to pack for vacations. I thought about life and love, and how unimaginable all of it was. Calling the valet, I asked him to bring Cecile's car around front. It was small, and I had no idea how we would fit all our luggage inside it, but we would try our best anyway. I met her in the hallway, and we carried our things, walking side by side down the stairs, smiling at each other. We can stay a few nights in a cheap hotel, she said. I called my neighbor at my old apartment, and she said that no one's rented out my apartment yet. She'll talk to the landlord about me getting back in there when he opens the office in the morning. Sounds good to me. I knew I would be okay anywhere, as long as we were together. I'll start looking for a job first thing in the morning. We're going to be better than just okay. It will take some time but we will get there. Just as we took the last step off the stairs, James the butler came out to meet us. Your father wishes to speak with you both in his office. Well we were on our way out, I said. Then I looked at Cecile. You think we should go talk to him? What do you think, Finn? I guess it can't hurt. I don't want any hard feelings between any of us. I don't want any hard feelings either. Maybe we should go and let him know that. Yes, I said as we put our things down by the door then went to my father's office. It's funny. I used to get butterflies in my stomach any time he wanted to see me in his office. But there are none this time. It feels good to be a man. I bet it does. She took my hand as we went into the office together. Hello Richard. 
It's a beautiful morning, don't you agree? I do agree. He sat behind his desk as we took the seats in front of it. We're packed and ready to leave. Cecile's car has been pulled up front for us. If we can't fit all the luggage in, we'll come back for the rest after we find a cheap hotel where we can stay. Cecile can most likely get her old apartment back, so we'll move into that as soon as we can. Sounds like you figured things out, my father said. We're working on it. I couldn't believe how good I felt about things. I'm going to begin my job search in the morning. About that, he said. I've decided that I need to retire. My mind isn't nearly as sharp as it once was. You deserve not to worry about things, Dad. Cecile looked at me with wide eyes, and I could see that my calling him that had surprised her. Yes, Richard, you deserve to be able to rest. Well, I'm glad you both agree with me. I know you'll have plenty of spare time, even with this new job that you'll find, Finn. Well, I would assume that I would have plenty of spare time. Yes, you will need it so that you can take over for me. I trained you, and you're actually much more efficient at taking care of things than I've ever been. What takes me nearly all day takes you a couple of hours. You want me to take over for you? I asked with surprise. Yes. That's why I've been training you. Of course, it would be much easier for you to do what needs to be done here, before you head off to whatever new job you find if you continued living here. What are you saying, Dad? I'm saying that I called my lawyer, and the stipulation has been taken out of my will. And as of tomorrow morning, when he comes over, you will be named the owner of Murphy Enterprises, and I will take my much-needed retirement. As long as you agree. You threw out the stipulation. Cecile asked. May I ask you what made you change your mind about all that? Love. Simple, undeniable love, my dear girl. I love my son. And I adore you. I would like to apologize for what I did to you both but in hindsight, I'm glad that I did it. You have both overcome your fears of love and commitment. For that, I do not apologize. I looked at Cecile. So, what do you think? Go back upstairs, unpack, and continue to live here. Or load up, go to a hotel, and move into your old apartment. Well, the food is pretty great here, she said with a smile, then looked at my father. And this wonderful man lives here. If we stay, then we can see him all we want. I would miss eating our meals together as a family. Maybe we should stay. I would love it if you would stay, my father said. Under your own terms, of course. Then we'll stay and see where things go. We stare at each with a silly grin on both of our faces, certain that things would only go up from here. So see you. Two years later. Finn, have you seen that folder I brought home from school yesterday? I had looked everywhere and still hadn't found it. It's got the papers I graded last night in it. I've got to take it back with me this morning. Coming into the bedroom from the bathroom, he held a little stick in his hand. Um, what's this, Cecile? Oh, that's a pregnancy test. I took it this morning because I'm late but it was negative. I think you made a mistake. It's got two lines. Yeah, I said. Two lines is a negative. No. He came to me, handing me the paper that came with the test. Two lines means positive. Cecile, we're going to have a baby. Shaking my head, I couldn't believe that. No, I couldn't have read that wrong. I took the paper from him and found out that he was right. I had made a mistake. Finn. Oh my gosh. We're having a baby. Dad's going to love this. Let's go tell him. My heart pounded like a jackhammer in my chest, as Finn hugged me tightly. I can't believe I read that wrong. Me neither. But I'm so happy that I can barely think. Meeting Richard at the breakfast table, neither Finn nor I could wipe the smiles off our faces. Well, you two look happy this morning. Finn pulled out a chair for me, and I sat down. Then he sat beside me. Dad, we have some news. I have some too. Let me go first. Okay, I said. 
You go first. You know how I've been going to the senior center most days? Yes, Finn said. Well, I found a woman there who I have a lot in common with. You have? I asked. Yes. She's younger than me, only in her eighties. But I love her. And I've asked her to marry me. What? Finn said as he gasped. You're getting married? I am. Stunned, I sat there without knowing what to say. But then it came to me. Well, congratulations, Richard. I'm sure you two will be very happy together. I do too. He sighed, and the smile he wore showed no signs of fading anytime soon. Now what is your news? Finn cleared his throat before saying, You're going to be a grandfather. Staring blankly straight ahead, Richard didn't say a word. I began to get worried, as an entire minute went by with him sitting there stone still, not uttering a word. Richard, are you okay? He looked at me then nodded. This is like a dream come true for me. You have no idea. I found a woman I love, and I'm going to be a grandfather. It's like I have died and gone to heaven. I was wondering if I was still alive. But it seems that I am. Oh dad, Finn said as he laughed. What a day, huh? Yeah, what a day indeed, his father agreed. A week later, we had a small wedding for Richard and Della at the mansion. The woman was as sweet as they come, and both Finn and I could tell that she made Richard the happiest he'd ever been. That night as we lay in our bed, Finn asked, Do you want to marry me yet, Cecile? We do have those wedding bands, don't we? We hadn't talked about getting married yet. It was sort of this unspoken thing between us that neither wanted to put pressure on the other about but I didn't feel any pressure anymore. I think becoming your wife would feel very good. And it would be good for our child to have a mother and father who are married. So, we're going to get married then, he said. Finally. Finally. He rolled over and kissed me softly. Mrs. Murphy. I like the way that sounds. Well, Della beat me to that title. But I'll settle for second place. Kissing him right back, I knew where all this kissing would lead, and I was happy to be going there. A few months later, we found out that we were having a son. And we found out more than that, as the doctor showed us the ultrasound pictures. So here is your son. He ran a pencil that he held in his hand around the blurry object on the screen. And over here is your daughter. What? I asked, as I saw nothing more than scratchy-looking blobs on the screen. We're having twins? Finn asked as he held my hand. A boy and a girl. No way. You are having twins, the doctor confirmed. I was still in denial. There's no way. Medically speaking, the doctor said, there is most definitely a way, Mrs. Murphy. So, get ready to bring two babies home from the hospital in approximately four months. Are we ready for two babies, Finn? I asked as we left the doctor's office. Ready or not, here they come. He opened the car door and I got inside. Moving in next to me he closed the door then said to the driver, take us to Monty's Steakhouse. We've got some celebrating to do. He took out his phone and swiped the screen. I'm inviting your parents to join us, so that we can tell them the good news. We're having twins, I said to myself. A boy and a girl. I don't know how we're going to do this. You seem worried, Cecile, Finn said. My mother answered his call, hello, Finn. Hey there, Mom. Load up, Pop, and you two meet us at Monty's in an hour. We've got big news. We'll be there. See you soon, son. Finn had won over my parents in no time at all. His charm worked on almost everyone. And that included the people who came to his art studio where he sold tons of art on behalf of the students attending UCLA. We were well on our way to finding our happily ever after. Finn Holding my tiny little twins an hour after they were born, I couldn't believe they were here and they were ours. So, how about Cameron and Tamarin? I asked the sleeping babies. We can call you Cammy and Tammy. No, came Cecile's sleepy voice. 
I thought you were out like a light. I was, until you said those dreadful names you've been trying to get me to like. Let those names go, Finn. So, you still want their names to be Fred and Ethel. I hated those names. You know those characters were a married couple, right? I've just been teasing you with those names. She opened her eyes and looked at me. You can hold them both at the same time? Yeah. They're so little right now that I can easily hold them both. The sound of the door opening drew our attention, and my father buzzed in with his electric wheelchair. There they are. How are Bonnie and Clyde doing? Dad, I told you we're not naming them after a couple of gangsters, I let him know. Why not, he asked as he peered at them. They've already stolen my heart. Thieves they are. Della came in behind him, moving slower since she used a walker to get around. Where are my grandbabies, Pete and Linda? We had no idea why she kept calling the twins by those names. Hello, Della. The babies are right here, in my arms. The door opened again, and in came Cecile's mother. Are Leo and Leah ready to meet their grandmummy? Cecile's father wasn't far behind. Grandpappy is here, ready to meet Jack and Jill. I watched Cecile roll her eyes. Really, you guys? Do any of you honestly think that any of those names are going to stick? All of them spoke at once, letting their opinions be known. And all I could do was smile at my wife. See what happens when you refuse to settle on names, Anam Kara. She put one finger on her nose. You've hit upon something there, Finn. And what have I hit upon? The sweet terms of endearment we came up for each other. You know how they're Irish. So, you've chosen some Irish names for our babies? I asked. Her mother was quick to say, I think it would be horrible to saddle these poor babies with weird and hard-to-pronounce names. I agree, Della said. Give them simple names. And make sure no kids can come up with nicknames that would embarrass them. When I was a kid, the other kids teased me relentlessly, calling me Della Bella. That's not so bad, my father said. The kids called me names. I hated that. Kids can be mean, Cecile's father agreed. But some parents can be mean too. I was in trouble so much when I was young that I thought my name was Dammit because my father would always say, Dammit boy, look what you've done now. Cecile laughed a little, and I could tell she was exhausted from the 20 hour labor and birthing process she'd just gone through. And that's when I decided to exercise my right as a husband and father. Okay, all of you, time to go. Mommy needs her rest. She's been through a lot. Cecile raised one finger. Hang on. I want to tell you all something before you go. I love each and every one of you. These babies are coming into a very warm and loving family. We've all got our quirks, but we all love each other very much. I'm proud to share these children with you all. I'm proud to be both a Walsh and a Murphy. I would like to echo my wife's words. I love you all too. And I'm thankful for all the support and guidance you've shared with us. Cecile and I wouldn't be who we are without you all. My father smiled at me. Thanks, son. We've tried to lend you some of our vast knowledge without forcing it on you. And we appreciate that, Dad. We had all come a long way from the days when our relationship had begun. Cecile and I had both had to learn to stand up to our parents while not alienating them. Cecile added, we truly appreciate you all. And we know that you all did your very best raising us. Finn and I have found bravery. But neither of us had that before finding each other. We could blame the people who raised us for that. But what good does that do for anyone? Her mother ducked her head. I am sorry, Cecile. Mom, don't be sorry for doing what you thought was best for me. I'm not trying to put blame on anyone. Finn and I were what we were, and that's that. Together, we became what we were always meant to be. Brave. I liked that idea. You did make me brave. And you made me brave too. Standing up for you was the first step I took, and soon after, I was able to stand up for myself as well. Same I said. You and I are supposed to be together. It's a wonder I didn't see that when we first met and became such close friends. Shrugging, she said, 
Who are we to second-guess timing? The thing that really matters is that we eventually found what we both had hidden down, deep inside of us. Fear had been covering up all that until we set the fear free and embraced bravery. And that is why I came up with the names for our firstborn children. Being brave changed our lives, Finn. I wholeheartedly agree with you, Anam Kara. Mogare, I am glad that you agree. And I think you will agree on the names I've chosen for our babies. Our son will be named Briandon, which means brave. Our daughter will be named Kachi, which also means brave. We will instill bravery in our children, and we will be the best parents we can be, the same way our parents were for us. My heart soared as I looked into the eyes of my forever, and she looked right back into mine. We found more than I ever knew we could, Cecile. We found our happily ever after. The End Sneak peek for his secret baby, a small town second chance romance, accidental love 4. Chapter 1 Jag Population 2,192 people. With wide eyes, I stared out the window of my RV as the driver pulled into the small town of Shiner, Texas. Home of the brewery that I hope to take to the next level. Miss Petty, my assistant and an old friend of my late mother's, chimed in. If you manage to talk the owners into letting you invest, this will make your 50th investment. How proud your mother would have been, Jag. Only 35, and you reached billionaire status at the tender age of 30. If your mother could only see you now. Mum sees me, Miss Petty. I know she does. As for my father, I'd never known the man. Mum had been a super independent woman using a donor and in vitro to produce me, her only child. I had expected my strong and independent mother to be with me forever. Only, cancer doesn't care what anyone expects. It took her away from me when I was 20. And at that moment, I had made a promise to my dead mother that I would find a way to do the best I could from then on. And I'd done precisely that. Investing came easy to me. Mum had a killer life insurance policy that left me with over a hundred thousand dollars. So I did what came naturally to me and invested it in stocks, then bonds, and then I went for more. I just kept growing that money she'd left me, expanding my areas of investment. And after a while, I found myself at the top of my game. Now, I was taking it to small towns. China, Texas was the first in this new series of investments. They had a brewery that produced a Texas staple. A dark lager beer, styled for the American palate but produced in the traditional German way. It was a success in Texas, but I'd also found there were exceptional sales in almost every state in the US. I wanted more though. I wanted to take this thing right back to where its roots had grown deep and gnarly. Germany. A tough market for sure, but I had my bets on the tasty brew making it big in the beer capital of the world. All I had to do was talk the owners into letting me spend some money, trying to do that by becoming an investor. They didn't have any investors thus far, and from what I'd heard, they had no interest in finding any. They didn't trade on the stock market either. So, I had my work cut out for me, but only if I decided the business was worth my time and money. First, I wanted to see what kind of place this brewery was. Would it be able to handle all the extra orders that would come its way? if I was successful at marketing in Germany? I needed to know the quality of the staff. Would they work overtime, if necessary? Would the management be up to snuff when the big orders came in? Would they hire more people, if it meant production would have to go into 24-7 shifts? I needed to know if the people behind the beer had it in them to step up, or this thing could never be taken to the next level. Not liking to fail. Most successful people try to avoid that at all costs, I'd do my research before I would put my money on the line. Podunk, the driver text called out. We have arrived boss. The old man I'd hired to drive my new, extremely tricked out, 40-foot class a recreational vehicle was a necessity. The thing was a behemoth that I wasn't about to even try to drive on my own. Please don't call every small town Podunk, Miss Petty chastised him. I don't mean no disrespect. It's just what I call these small, look-alike towns, Miss Petty. 
He drove down the main street. All the buildings in these little towns look the same to me. Old, brick and painted in different colors to help each little business try to stand out a bit. The buildings, built in the early 20th century, lined both sides of the main thoroughfare of China. I'd spent the first years of my life in a small town. Wyoming, New York, looked like pictures on Christmas cards in the winter months. I still remembered the cold winters and the way they chilled me to the bone. When I was 11, Mum moved us away from there, all the way across the country to California. The small town was left behind. Modesto became our home for the next nine years until she was no longer with me, and I had to go it on my own. Of course, Miss Petty was there with me through all the cancer treatments and then the funeral. She had worked with my mother at the courthouse. Both had been court reporters. Miss Petty only left her job when it became necessary for me to hire an assistant to take care of my expanding business. She insisted on helping me as much as she could. The RV park I've booked is near the high school. Take a right here, Tex, Miss Petty directed the driver. It says on the website that the majority of the citizens are of German or Czech heritage. Smiling, I recalled the lively dances the locals in my own small hometown of Wyoming had held on special occasions. I wonder if there will be any polka dances going on while we're here. Peering at me over her horn-rimmed glasses, Miss Petty said, we're not going to be here for any longer than three days. Less, if you can make that happen. You do have the meeting in Fredericksburg on Monday. And after that, we have to get to New York for the christening of your friend's baby. A godfather is a big responsibility, you know. Why my friend from high school had asked me to go to New York to become the godfather of his newborn son, I did not know. I figured he assumed I would shower the child with gifts his whole life. But I wasn't into babies, or kids for that matter. I was into me and all things associated with me. I'm not about to take any responsibility for Jason's kid, I let her know. I'll do the little ceremony thingy and be the kid's godfather. But honestly, that's all I'll do. Her furrowed brow told me she didn't understand something about what I'd said. Then why agree to do it at all, Jag? I don't know why I agreed. He'd called, asked me if I'd be his kid's godfather, and I had just said yes without thinking about it at all. Impulse, I guess. I mean, who wouldn't want to be called a godfather? Maybe that's why I said yes. Anyway, we'll go to New York, and I'll do the thing. So keep me on track, Miss Petty. Do what you do best, keep things moving and me getting to the next place, like you've done for the last 10 years. I will do as I have always done for you, Jag. I made a promise to your mother that I'll never break. Her smile told me she really cared about my success. Thanks, Miss Petty. Jag, I've told you a thousand times to call me Samantha. My mum would rip me a new one if I ever did that, Miss Petty. I was never allowed to call any grown-up by their first name. You know that. Jag, you are a grown-up now. I'm only 15 years older than you. I think we can put those childish ideas of yours to rest. Nope. I can't do it, Miss Petty. It's ingrained in me now. Looking out the window, I saw something that interested me. Look, a diner. I bet they've got killer chicken fried steak in there. I can't eat anything like that, Miss Petty said as she ran her hands over her slim hips. I've got to watch everything that goes into my mouth. I wasn't blessed with a thin frame, so I must work to keep myself fit and trim. I never could figure out why the woman felt that she had to look as close to perfect as she could get. She didn't even date anyone. But I never asked or commented. My mother had raised me better than that. Well, I'm going to walk over there while you guys set up camp. You do that, Jag. She sat on the sofa, seatbelt buckled, eyes on the road in front of us. I'll make sure Tex sets everything up. I watched the old man's shoulders slump and knew he wasn't super keen on her making sure he did things to her expectations, which would mean everything had to be perfect. Miss Petty made sure things were always perfect for me. She thought that was her main job. It made life easy for me, so I didn't ask her to do things any differently. You do that. I'm gonna stroll down Main Street. I think it will give me a clearer picture of the way the people in this town think. Are they movers and shakers, ready to make some serious cash? 
Or are they lackluster and lazy and care nothing for money? Tex laughed. You won't find many movers and shakers in small town Texas or any small town anywhere for that matter. Folks from small towns are there for a reason. They don't care for the hustle and bustle of big cities. Money ain't the be-all and end-all for them. I came from a small town and then I lived in a big one. I like the hustle and bustle as well as serenity at other times. You never know how people are until you find that out for yourself. You can't go around making assumptions that all people who live in small towns don't care about making money. I'll go with my gut on this, he said as he pulled into the RV park. You want me to stop in front of the office, Samantha, so that you can go inside and see where they want us? Yes please Tex. She looked at me, pulling off her glasses. Want to come with me Jag? Why? I asked with bewilderment. Never mind. With a sigh, she nodded. Okay, I'll sign in by myself then. It was her job. Okay. She left the RV, and Tex turned his chair around to face me. So, you gonna load up on some of that beer for us to sample this evening? I'll fire up the barbecue, and we can drink the night away. Hanging out with a couple of old people sounded like a nightmare to me. But I could provide the beer for their evening without me in it. I'll have some beer delivered in an ice chest for you guys. I'm going to hit the town to get a taste of it. But you two enjoy your time here in whichever way you want. Thanks boss. He'd driven the better part of the day, bringing me here from my home in Dallas. I knew he was ready to relax. I had homes in Los Angeles, New York, Dallas and Miami. Well, I had given the Miami home to Miss Petty. But it had been one of my original homes. I had to give her something so she could spend time away from work, she wouldn't take a vacation for anything. So, I gave her the gift of the Miami home and the cars that I'd bought while there. She'd taken a week off to spend it there when I first gave it to her. But she'd only gone back a handful of times since I'd given it to her, five years ago. Miss Petty was devoted to her job. I guessed I was lucky that she was that way. I could have gone through many assistants, like most people I knew in my tax bracket. With her, I knew I wouldn't have to look for someone else to take her place for many years until she was ready to retire. Miss Petty wore a frown when she came back into the RV. What is it? I asked. Shaking her head, she looked at Tex. It's the last space on the left. Her eyes turned to me. If the staff here is anything like the rest of the town, you won't find the brewery worthy of your investment or time. And why do you say that? Well, the lady at the desk couldn't bring herself to get up off her ample behind to do her job of taking the credit card and swiping it to get the payment for the lot rent. I had to walk over to her and hand it to her. And then she pointed out a rack of pamphlets, letting me know that if I wanted to do any sightseeing, I could pick as many of them as I wanted. I assured her that I had no interest in seeing the sights and that we were in town on business. What did she say to that? She didn't say anything to that. She just pointed at a filthy fridge and told me that we could buy ice from the office before five when she closes the office for the night. I told her that we have an ice maker in the RV and wouldn't be needing any. So she's a little on the lazy side, I said. That doesn't mean everyone in this town is. You can't judge an entire population by one person. I'm sure she's just bored with her job. Who wouldn't be? Sitting there, waiting for people to come in, and then having minimal time to say anything to them sounds insanely boring to me. Yes, I'm sure it's a dull job. But she could put some pep into it. Her jaw set, she mumbled. I told you this was going to be a waste of time. Yes, I know you did. But she wasn't always right. I came from a small town. She jerked her head, looking at me with her mouth open as if she was shocked by what I'd said. Jag, you come from Modesto, California. That is no small town. Originally, I came from Wyoming, New York, and that was a small town. And I want to give back to small town America. I've made something out of myself, and I want to give back to the places and people who are the heart of our country. I'm just afraid that you're going to be disappointed in the people that you want to help. You're not like them, Jag. You're, well, you're better than them. 
I wasn't sure how to respond to that. I knew that I was an exceptional man. I had a drive that not many people had. I knew my strengths and my weaknesses, which were few. But that didn't mean that I was better than anyone. Not really. It only meant that I'd found my way in life. I'd found what worked best for me. And if I could help anyone else find that, then I would. So, Tex is going to make a barbecue, Miss Petty. And I'm going to have some of that beer sent over here for you too. Enjoy the night. I'll be out and about. You don't want me to come with you, she asked. I wasn't about to take her with me. I want to meet people on my own. If I have someone with me, it won't really work out. So, you guys enjoy your night and I'll see you when I see you. Now to see what this little town has to offer. Chapter 2 Lily How long do you think that thing is? Rachel asked as we all looked through the large window of the diner where we'd all worked for forever. I'm not that good a judge of things like that, but I think it's like 20 feet or so, Laurie said. It's longer than that, I said as I watched the huge RV cruise slowly down the main street. And you know that thing must have cost the owner tons of money. It's brand new I bet, Rachel said as she wiped a table down while looking out the window. It sure looks like it, Laurie said. She leaned on the handle of the broom she'd been using to clean up after the lunch rush. Who do you think that is anyway? A country singing star? They have their names on the things they ride in, I said. And they ride in buses, not RVs. It has to be someone with money though. But other than someone in the music biz, who would come here? We got beer and polka dancing but not much else, Rachel mused. Maybe it's a polka band coming to play at Benny's tonight. Not in that, I said. It's got to be someone big. Way bigger than any polka band. I laughed as I thought about something. We don't even know if that thing is gonna stop here. I doubt it will. Why would it? What does Shina have to offer whoever is in that gorgeous mansion on wheels? Laurie laughed too. Yeah, like whoever is in there is gonna come here. What would their reason be? Come to see if our chicken fried steak is better than the last tiny towns? Well, it is better than anything else you can get around here. Yoakum ain't got shit on us where chicken fried steak is concerned, Rachel said with a smirk. It's a bigger town than ours, Rachel, I reminded her. So it does have shit on us. This town is famous, Laurie said. Yoakum ain't famous. They were getting way off topic, as usual. So I brought the conversation back to where it had been before they threw it off track. I haven't even ever been inside something that nice. Have any of y'all? Hell no, Laurie said. Ain't none of us been inside anything that nice. Never will either. Things like that, well, we ain't supposed to know about any of it. Why not? I asked. Why not us? Cause we're small town people, Millie, Rachel stated. People like us don't get to even see the inside of something like that. Hey, it's turning toward the high school, Laurie said. The cook, Freddie, came out from the kitchen. What are y'all gawking out the window at? He wiped his hands on his greasy white apron as he came to find out what we were doing. Ain't y'all got a mess to clean up after that lunch rush? You gals shouldn't have time to stare out the window. Suddenly, his eyes caught what had taken our attention. Oh shit. Would you look at that? What a beauty she is. Why do men call all things mechanical she? I asked. I don't get it. Girls ain't meant to get it, he said with a grin, revealing his missing front tooth. You ever seen anything like that in China before, Freddy? Laurie asked, her eyes glued to the majestic thing. Hell no. Shit like that doesn't come around these parts, girl. It looks like it's headed to the school, though. Maybe the governor is in there. Maybe he's gonna speak at the school. You're an idiot, Rachel said with a smirk. If the governor was coming here, then there would be reporters everywhere. Haven't you ever watched the news? That's how things like that work. He doesn't miss a chance to get the media to record whatever he does. It's got to be someone else. 
The RV did not stop. Instead it drove past the school, giving us an excellent view of its back. Which was still pretty amazing. It's leaving town. I looked away and walked toward the back, where I still had things to do. We might as well get back to work. What would a life like that be like? Laurie asked as she moved the broom to sweep up the crumbs left by our guests. Who the hell out of us would know Laurie? Freddie asked as he opened the door and stepped outside. Hey, it's turning into the RV park over there. I can barely see it from here, but it sure looks like that to me. Going back to the front, I walked outside with the rest of them, craning my neck and squinting my eyes to see if what Freddie had said was actually true. No way. There's no way anyone who has a thing like that would stay here. Hey, what about the people who own the brewery? Laurie asked. Maybe it's them. They got loads of money. They also have a home here. So it's not them, I pointed out. But who the heck could it be? They've stopped, Freddie said. In front of the office. I bet they're just asking for directions is all. You know that thing must have GPS, I said. But there's no way they're gonna stay there. That place is a shithole. It's the best this town has to offer, Rachel said, moving up to her tiptoes. I can barely see it. What's going on? Are they parking it or pulling back out of there? Like, what could they be doing over there? It's still parked, I said. But I knew they wouldn't be staying. No one driving a thing that nice would have anything to do here. I still think it's a country singer. Maybe not someone from Nashville, but someone from here in Texas, Laurie said. You know, one of Texas' own. We would know if anyone worth a hoot was playing at the bar tonight, Rachel said. Freddie nodded in agreement. Tonight, my cousin Louie is the DJ down there. Which reminds me that we all should go down there tonight. I'm off tomorrow, I said, looking at Rachel, who was also off the following day. Wanna go together? Who's gonna watch my kids, Millie? She had two of them, and they were as rowdy as a box full of puppies. Maybe I can talk my little sister into watching them, I offered. What you gonna pay? All I've got is a twenty for that. Shaking her head, she said, I doubt she'll do it for that. Mama's had them all day, so I know she won't watch them. And you know how we get, girl. We'll be out all night. There's no way your sister will take 20 to watch them all night long. Who knows? I said. She might. I'll ask her if you want. If she agrees then sure, she said. I'll be your date, Millie. I'll let you know later about what she says. I don't want to go alone. I'll be there, Freddie said, then winked. I'll be your date, Millie. There was no way that was going to happen. Um, thanks Freddie, but I don't want anyone in this town to get the wrong idea. Rumors could spread like wildfire. That's okay with me, he said, then blew me a kiss. And that's exactly why I can't go with you. Anyway, Rachel said to break the awkwardness. If she says she'll do it, I'll come by and pick her up and take her to my place to watch them, then I'll bring her back home in the morning. I'll let her know and see if she'll do it. The RV began moving and I found my mouth hanging open. No way. Are they pulling in? Laurie asked. Are they gonna stay the night here in China? I think they must be staying, I whispered. Who knows? They might even come over here to eat. They were sure going slow when they went past here. You girls better get this place spick and span then, Freddie said. And the manager is gonna be here soon too. All this lollygagging around needs to stop. You too, Freddy, I said as I walked back inside, feeling butterflies moving around in my stomach with the excitement of what might happen if the people who were in that fancy RV did come to our diner. That kitchen is a greasy mess. Get it cleaned up. I can smell the old grease you've been using. Go pour it out and put some new oil in the fryers. We need to make this place sparkle if they're gonna show up here. What if they're famous or something, and they talk about our place being a filthy dump? We might all lose our jobs. Laurie shouted as she got to work sweeping the floor. I've got the floors. I've got the tables, Rachel said. And I'll make sure the checkout counter is clean too. 
I'll tackle the bathrooms, I said. Let's make this place shine. It ain't often that we have guests of their stature in here. It might even be some bloggers, for all we know. This could be something. This could land our little diner and the town of Shiner on the map, if we all work hard to make their experience a great one. We are already on the map, Millie, Rachel said. The brewery, remember? Yeah. I did remember the brewery. But the town could use more. The lunch rush had consisted of two older couples who always ate lunch here on Tuesdays and Fridays. There had been quite a few workers from the brewery too. All locals. No out-of-towners come to see our famous brewery. Only the locals kept the diner open. I'd worked at the diner since I was 16. It had been around for years before that too. We were a mainstay for the locals. But they gave lousy tips, and us waitresses only made a few dollars an hour. There was no way any of us girls were going to get rich or even close to being in the middle class with the job. But it was our home, our town. And we didn't want to leave it behind. So we made it work. They probably won't come here, Laurie said as she looked at all of us. But if they do, who will get to wait on them? Rachel and I exchanged glances as Laurie bit her lower lip. Whoever waited on their table was sure to get a good tip. Maybe even a great one. Hey, I said as an idea came to me. How about we all help out with them? One of us can be the main waitress, but the other two can help in other ways too. I can help Freddie in the back to make sure the plates not only taste great but look great too. Rachel looked at me with discriminating eyes. Yeah, your hair is a mess right now. Plus, you've got a gravy stain on the front of your shirt. I looked down and found a brown patch right in the middle of my white shirt. Dang it. I didn't even see that there. Running my hands through my hair, I felt the tangles. Out of you two, I'm going to have to say that Laurie looks the best. So she should wait on them. Rachel, you can help out by making their drinks and getting their appetizers ready so that they won't have to wait long at all. They'll give me the tip, Laurie said. And then I'll split it three ways between all of us. Through the kitchen window, Freddie shouted, What about me? What do I get out of this? You get paid more than we do is what you get, I shouted right back at him. We don't even get minimum wage. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. I'll shut up. So let's get busy, I said, then went to clean the restrooms. We all worked hard for the next half hour. Luckily, no other customers came in while we were working so hard. Just as I came out of the women's bathroom, cleaners in both hands and sweat dripping off my forehead, I saw a tall figure walking down the sidewalk. Someone's coming. Freddie looked out of the kitchen window. I saw someone walking out of the entrance to the RV park. I didn't say anything because I didn't want you girls to freak out. Damn it, Freddy. Rachel shouted as she pulled the rubber band from her disarrayed ponytail and redid it. You should have warned us. Laurie looked into the mirror behind the counter, fixing her hair and practicing her best smile. Welcome to the Shiner Diner, y'all. It's just the one guy, Freddy called out from the kitchen. Oh okay then, Laurie said. Welcome to the Shiner Diner, you. Just say the first part and leave the other out, Rachel said. I ran around the corner to the kitchen, the door swinging shut behind me. Just then the bell rang as the door opened. The silence stunned me as Laurie didn't say a thing and neither did Rachel. What the heck guys? You work here? The deep voice of a man asked. I ran my hand over my face with agitation spreading through me. She's gonna mess this whole thing up, I whispered. Um ha. Huh. Laurie asked. You have on a uniform of sorts, the man said. So do you work here? I'm sure, she said. The sound of something crashing to the floor made me flinch as Rachel screamed, damn it. You okay back there, the man asked. Um yes, Rachel said. Laurie seat him. Oh yeah, she said as if she'd forgotten what her job was. You want to, you know, sit? Holy shit. What's going on out there? I was going to want to sit down and eat, but I'm not sure now. This place is clean and all, but you got a shit show going on here. 
Is the cook as dingy as you girls are? Laurie didn't say a thing. Neither did Rachel. I couldn't believe what was happening. But then Laurie finally spoke, you from that fancy RV we saw come into town? Do you always ask your customers personal questions, he asked. What's wrong with you? Who the hell is in charge here? Anyone at all? Look, I wanted to try your chicken fried steak, but you and your little dish-breaking cohort back there don't seem to be very good at anything so far. Think you can pull yourselves out of whatever you two are in, so that I can have some food? Or do I need to go elsewhere? There's no need to be rude. End of sneak peek for his secret baby, a small town second chance romance accidental love for. Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio copyright 2024 BFA Publishing. Please like and subscribe to support this channel. It helps more than you know.